Audiobook title, She Becomes a Passive Villainous Knot. Completed, by Halloween Godspell Part 01. This work belongs to author, Halloween Godspell. Prologue, The Mad Queen. At the Capitol. The Mad Queen stared at the hell she created from the highest vantage point in the Capitol the church's bell tower. The fiery glow of the burnt city reflected against her cold ashen eyes that were void of any emotions. No anger, sorrow, pain or anything. Just emptiness. She stood there against the cold night wind with her white dress, dyed with the red of her enemies, and ash-like hair flapping harshly. Everything would end tonight. All the heartaches. All the sorrow. All the happiness. All the memories. Everything. Everything will be wiped clean. Adira. A masculine voice hatefully called for her attention. It used to sound so wonderful to her ears. It used to fill her with warmth. It used to drown her with overflowing love. But no. Now, all it had was hate. It only grates her ears like a hateful cacophony like an ending requiem. It only douses her with nipping coldness seeping through her very core. It only drowns her, verbally wishing she was dead. That should be Queen Adira for you. She casted a cold glare towards the man who was mounted on his own dragon and watch him visibly flinch under her stern gaze. She wasn't like this. She was never like this. But they pushed her pushed her to the utmost of her limits and made her who she was now. So who could the people blame upon this tragedy that befell upon them? Certainly not her. It could only be themselves. If I am nothing but a monster in your eyes, let me be the most hideous monster then, was her silent vow as they pushed her to the edge of her sanity, robbing her of what she used to be before this insanity, touching the scales of the black dragon perched on the church's roof by her side, the dragon, that was already growling in warning to the uninvited guest, gradually accumulated a breath of fire from his chest. I will burn everything down and cleanse this world. I will build it anew free from hate, sorrow, and unhappiness. I will build a new world. Madness shone in the queen's eyes. The dragon only needed her instruction a slight gesture or touch or word to openly incinerate this hateful person to ash. Not leaving a corpse for the spiteful other woman to even grieve on. Hi sir. There she was cut off when something sharp suddenly pierced through her body from her shoulders down to her heart, along with a body that fell from the skies above her. The last that she saw, before falling down from the tower's peak, was pink locks dancing against the night wind and Heiser, her dragon, burning the church down, out of hurt for his mother that was struck down by her vicious nemesis, while diving down to hopefully catch her. Ah, in the end, you didn't choose me. You never once chose me. You'd rather watch me die than your beloved dying in my hands. Falling into the fiery hell she created must have been the perfect way for her to die. The other woman would then become the heroine that saved the townspeople from the mad queen that burnt half of the population down and the duke turned prince would become the hero that protected the heroine. They would then be wed and have little children. They would live happily in the new world that they would create after vanquishing the evil queen. They would then lead the people onto a prosperous era of peace. Just. Where? Where did I go wrong? If I had another chance at life, would I still be the same? If you, fickle God, gave me another chance at life, I hope to live my life simply and away from them. So please, when I am reborn, will you please give me a simple life? A tear escaped from her closed eyes and a final roar from Heiser before everything vanished. A child. At the estate, east wing, the sun streamed into the windows and casted an ethereal glow into the otherwise gloomy room of the lady of the manor. It was hot and bright. In other words, it was annoying. Slowly peeling her fluttering eyes open, with butterfly-like black eyelashes and cold ash-like orbs with a chilling glint as the sun illuminated her figure beyond the drawn crimson canopy. A girl, dressed in servant clothes noticed the slight stirring of the lady and hurriedly scuttled to her bedside with a worried face. My lady, are you okay? How do you feel? Lady, what is this woman talking about? The girl groaned softly as she pushed herself up to inspect her surroundings. Did I survive the fall? Or the stab? My lady, do you need anything? The maid continued to fuss over her. Ah. Water. 
Do you want water? Yes, water. First things first, I'm thirsty. She slowly nodded her head with great effort. She was feeling sluggish, like she hadn't been up and about for a few days. The maid that waited on her saw her gesture of assent and flew over to the flagon and fetched her lady water before hurriedly flying back to her side to offer the girl something to quench her parched throat. After downing it under her throat and clearing it a few times, she croaked, Where, am I? You're in the manor, my lady. You fell off your horse and suffered a high fever right after. Please hold on. Your mother and father's been worried sick about you. I shall go and call them. She rattled before vanishing behind the big white doors with silver trimmings and silver knob. The owner must have a penchant for silver. She thought before adjusting herself so she was reclining on the bed. She studied her surroundings that oddly felt familiar to her. What is this? Why does this look so much like my old room? Did that bastard pervert redecorate the room? She continued to roam her gaze and was suddenly brought back by a loud bang as her doors flew open. A woman, who might be in her late twenties, and a man, who seemed to be in his early thirties, rushed in and they immediately flocked to her bedside. The woman was a black haired with a slight tinge of ash beauty, while the man had warm deep chocolate locks and cold grey orbs. But you couldn't see the coldness that was supposed to be there, there was only worry, anxiety relief and gladness. Oh my dear sweet child, are you okay? Are you hurting anywhere? Please tell mother. Baby, how are you? Do you need anything? They asked her in rapid succession. The girl just sat there, flabbergasted. They were supposed to be dead. They died trying to protect her. They forfeited their lives in exchange for hers, to prove her innocence. Why? Why are you here? She muttered in a low and soft voice that they almost couldn't hear it. She was perplexed. What was happening? Why were her parents in front of her, alive and well? Am I dreaming? Did I really die? Um. Am I in heaven? She continued to ask when they didn't answer her, confused her with sudden question. Baby, you're here. With us. Alive and well. Her mother answered her first after briefly glancing at her husband. That's right. You just fell off your horse, nothing serious. The doctor said you only had a minor sprain. Her father reassured her, gently caressing her hair, the same way she remembered all those years ago. Yes, but you suddenly had a high fever and we were worried. You were asleep for three days. We were very, very worried about you. Her mother reached out her hand to feel for her temperature before sighing in relief to feel her condition had gone back to normal. Horse. Fever. Three days? She repeated to herself. That couldn't be. She was at the capital, last she remembered. She also didn't fall off a horse but from the bell's tower after she was struck down. After remembering her being impaled from her shoulders, she immediately turned to her left shoulder and pulled down the hem of her nightgown to find no wound. Not even a slight scratch. What's more, her shoulder seemed too small in her eyes. Even her hands and fingers, they were too small and slightly chubby. She pulled on a few strands of her locks and brought it forward for her to see properly and it was shorter than she remembered. Finally, she whisked the blanket that covered her revealing a pair of short and slightly stout legs. What the hell? Am I? Am I? A child? And with her sudden discovery, she, once again, was visited with that high fever, tossing the manor into chaos again like a jinx. So let's sort things out first. I am back to when I was still a little six-year-old girl. Nothing big has happened during this time yet, right? If my memory doesn't fail me, during the next few days, my parents will accept an engagement proposal from that monster's family. Adira thought to herself while she sipped on her favorite chamomile tea with a twist a special blend made by her favorite maid, Lifa. Because of being disoriented, after dying from such a tragic death, it took her a bit of time to adjust and recognize life especially when it should have been easy since she was always a worrywart and easily flustered. My lady, do you like the chamomile? She asked sweetly while placing another batch of sweets in front of Adira. Adira looked up from her tea and smiled kindly and brightly a hundred of light years away from the Adira of a week ago. 
It had been a week since Adira woke up from her second life and a few days from her second high fever. She's been sorting out loads of informations in her head and mentally arranging the timelines to try and prepare for a counter and solution for the problems that started. From this fateful engagement, the servants of the Silverous Manor were all perplexed at the sudden change in temperament of their little mistress. She just suddenly, changed, as if the person inside her was swapped entirely for someone else someone who was more merciful and angelic than their demonic little mistress. A week ago, she used to whip the servants at the slightest error that they made, or made them do unreasonable things for her entertainment plus all the various tortures her little evil brain could conjure. She also used to verbally abuse the servants every chance she gets. But now, she was calm, kind, and sweet. The air around her exuded the serene kind of maturity. She smiles at the servants often now, greets them every time, thanks them and even apologizes to them. Did the fever tweak the screws in the little demoness head? A servant, terrified with the sudden change in their little mistress, whispered as softly as she could to her fellow servant. Sure, we never know when she might revert to her demon side. It's best we keep our guard up. The servant replied while clasping both of her hands tightly in a silent prayer that their little mistress would stay the way she is now. Adira gave them a glance and they both stiffened before they scurried away in different directions escaping before the demoness seals their fates. Life as Face, who also turned to them, crumpled after seeing their guilty actions before redirecting a worried gaze towards her indifferent and unruffled lady, who wordlessly resumed to enjoying her tea. My lady, don't mind them please. My lady is the best lady in the whole world. I swear it on my life. Lifa exaggerated as she balled her fists and lightly knocked it over her chest for more emphasis. Adira giggled at her undying loyalty whether it was the past life or now she always and faithfully remained at her side. Even when everyone else were condemning Adira, even when the whole world turned against her mistress, she trusted her with all her heart. I know, Lifa. Thank you. She expressed her deep gratitude in words. Even though it wasn't enough to convey the deepness of her gratitude for her loyalty and love, she hoped that her feelings would somehow reach Lifa. Lifa watched the warm sincerity shining in her glittering lady's eyes and felt her auburn eyes burn and sting. Tears were threatening to spill out of her orbs that she had to look up to the painted ceilings in an attempt to halt them from dropping and be an embarrassing mess in front of her mistress. My loyalty will forever remain with you, my lady. She suddenly pledged that made Adira smile sweetly at her to lighten the heavy and serious mood of her maid. Lifa didn't change after all. That was a load off her shoulders then. It was a quiet afternoon like all the previous days and Adira loved it. This piece was one of the few things she missed from her past life, all because of her foolishness and stubbornness, and, this time, she'll do anything to keep her hold on this piece. When, like a jinx, an excited smile on the servant that came barging into her room. Her destruction flag was also promptly raised as she announced to the quiet Adira and life of the news that started everything, my lady, the Duke of Dalriada. At the mere mention of that family name, Adira froze with her teacup just a few inches from her moist cherry lips before she squeezed her eyes shut and took a few, calming breaths and a brief sip of the tea hoping its sedating corollary will take effect soon. She slowly and gracefully rose from her seat, steeling herself to brave and take this flag down. It was now or never. With Lifa, Adira strode out of the refuge of her personal greenhouse and followed the lady servant to the lounge to meet the Dalriada representative. If things went according to how it went in her past life, then the Dalriada's head butler should be representing the Duke due to unforeseen circumstances that barred them from being present themselves. However, Adira knew they were just excuses. This engagement, from the very start, was never blessed by the gods nor the spirits. This was doomed even before it began. Since the family refuses to face me and my family, we shall do the same. I won't let my esteemed father and mother receive them. I, alone, should be enough. A little six-year-old girl. Pushing the heavy doors for Adira, Lifa, and the rest of her growing entourage stepped aside to let her enter first. 
She raised her head high and carried herself confidently and elegantly, void of the natural childish atmosphere she should have despite her cute childish charm. Good afternoon. I am Adira Ramiria Ear Silveris. A pleasure to meet you. She curtsied with perfect grace, way above a mere six-year-old could hold herself, yet it didn't seem forced or awkward at all. Her gracefulness, elegance, and confidence flowed out of her naturally, like a true-born queen. A pleasure to meet you as well, Lady Adira. A childish and a bit high-pitched boy's voice answered her and she momentarily stiffened before her eyes shot open while holding her bowed head and curtsied position. She didn't dare raise her head from the time she entered the room to this moment when the voice answered her. It should not be possible but it was happening. The monster had graced her his presence. He came down himself. Please, raise your head, my lady. He added when he noticed Adira's unmoving figure. The latter could only follow the suggestion to avoid being suspicious but still tried to desperately avoid his gaze. She was afraid. Afraid that if she saw him again then everything will go down the same way as her previous life. That if she gazed into his eyes again then she'll push through everything forcefully and repeat all of her mistakes again. She took a deep breath while repeatedly reminding herself that everything was gonna change from now on. That she, herself, was gonna make it happen and that she wasn't the past Adira anymore. She's already exhausted all of her love from her previous life, so she should be fine now. Raising her gaze to meet his startling clear aqua eyes, she saw the kindness that captivated her heart over and over again and blinded her entirely despite the transgressions and the betrayal she suffered while she loyally, stubbornly and madly remained by his side, loving him unconditionally. Hello, Lady Adira. I am Triton Aurelian Gil Dalriada, firstborn son of the Duke Dalriada, here to personally ask for your and your parents' permission to be engaged to you. He smiled. Why, are you here? Fragrant and sweet, my lady. My lady. Lifer gently nudged the frozen Adira, who suddenly turned pale upon laying eyes on this boy. She remembered that he was the son of the Duke Dalriada, the kingdom's prime minister, and was groomed to one day succeed him. If she remembered things right, this boy was the one her little mistress fancied, right? This wasn't their first meeting, was it? So, why is she turning pale? Oh. Forgive us, Lord Dalriada, you traveled so far but unfortunately my parents are away as of the moment and won't be able to accommodate you. She fluidly lied through her teeth, that if the servants did not see their master and mistress at their respective workplaces they would believe their little lady. While curtsying once again to express an apology, her entourage, as well as Lifa, all stared at her confounded with her blatant lie. The castle was big, sure, but wouldn't it cause trouble if this boy finds out she lied? Wouldn't that drive a wedge between the families? What is the little mistress doing? Is she reverting to her evil side? Please, so long as you follow after me, everything will be fine. Just keep your mouth shut. Adira silently pleaded in her heart. Is that so? That is a pity, indeed. I was told that the Duke Silveris would probably be home since we caught wind of your accident. He smiled dejectedly. Ah, you cannot fool me like that again. A thought suddenly came to him, after being prompted with the word accident, and his expression suddenly turned worried as he asked, By the way, are you okay? Lady Adira, I heard it was quite the fall. Yes, please don't concern yourself. It was only a minor sprain and I'm perfectly healthy. She answered, distant and civil. A well-trained lady in their social circle where the strong preys on the weak and the gullible gets stabbed on the back. That is the most wonderful news. He breathed a sigh of relief before he regained his perfect smile, seeming delighted with the news. Well, since the Duke Silveris isn't around, I shall withdraw for today. I would greatly appreciate it if the Lady Adira spends time thinking about this proposal and that I might hear good news the next time I come. He immediately gestured for his butler to come forward and took the box from his hands before offering it to Adira. I don't know what would be an appropriate gift to present to a fiancé, but I heard the lady loves her tea. This is a little something from me. Please, take it. Adira turned to Lifer, who was waiting for her instructions, and nodded softly. 
The latter took a step forward and took the box to present it to her little mistress. Adira checked the so-called gift and saw different varieties of tea except her favorite chamomile. She let out a silent and hidden scoff before quickly wiping it off her face and smiled at Triton. Thank you very much for these, my lord. I appreciate it. Please take care in your journey. Lifer, please escort them out. Triton, pleased with Adira's smile, bowed before following Lifer out the manor. While Adira, who was left at the lounge, turned to one of the lady servants part of her entourage. She gestured for her to come closer which made the poor servant tremble in fear. Ye yes, my lady, she answered. All she wanted then was to prostrate and beg for forgiveness for whatever than receive one of the little Miss Violent Fits. As softly and gently as she could, Adira asked her, Kyrena, right? Can I call you Rena? Out of surprise from her little mistress remembering her name, the little servant jolted, ye yes. Of course, my lady, take these and share them with the other servants. Adira adjured her as she passed the box of teas to the maid. But, my lady, didn't the young lord give these to you? She inquired carefully. It is not appropriate to give away something you received from someone else. Even giving it away the moment he left, smiling, with a hint of mockery for the man who refused to know her both past and present, she answered, you should know me better. I don't like these kinds. Shamamal suits me best. The servant, still confused, decided to just shut up and took the box gratefully. All the tea were exquisite and hard to acquire, truly something that displayed their family's power and influence. But her mistress would rather choose the common chamomile than these. Do you like life as original blend that much, my lady? Curious why her mistress would rather choose the chamomile than these re-church teas, she dared to ask. Adira suddenly giggled, akin to little bells tinkling in the servant's ears, while looking like a little angel before nodding her head. I love each of your original blends best. An. An angel. The little mistress is an angel. All the servants stared at her slack-jawed and with glittering, adoring eyes as they felt love-struck, now with a renewed image of their little miss in their hearts. Then we shall refine it more so the mistress can enjoy it more, Rena beamed. We'll also make new blends that'll satisfy the lady's taste. A different maid chimed in that sparked a new discussion among them as they threw suggestions after suggestions among themselves. While feeling hyped from the prospect of making a novel blend, Rena turned to Adira to ask if she had a specific taste she preferred. The latter, who was watching them enjoying themselves, struck a thinking pose after being asked. Truthfully, in her previous life, she stopped caring for tea when Triton said he loved coffee. So, despite not liking bitter things or the strong smell of coffee, she had to grin and bear it for the sake of impressing him and adjusting to his likes. I like something fragrant and sweet. Their eyes twinkled at her very normal and ladylike request as ideas surged through each of their heads and resumed to discussing amongst themselves again while Adira relished watching their comical expressions. She should have given them more of her attention and love. Then they wouldn't have suffered terribly under her. Her family wouldn't have suffered because of her. My lady. Lifa, who had just returned after escorting the Dalriada representatives out, called her attention while watching the noisy servants and her smiling little mistress. She was having fun, just like how a normal child should, watching as Adira turned her head towards her, after successfully seizing her attention away from the ruckus, she asked, why did you lie about the master and mistress not being home? Hmm. Because, I don't plan to tie myself to him again. Again, is something wrong with Lord Dalriada? Didn't you fancy him? Adira finally stood up from her seat and exited the room, leaving the rowdy impromptu meeting of the servants, with Lifer following her and answered in a soft voice that sounded like an incoherent mumble to Lifer's ears, I'm done. This thing between us is evil. I hope not to face and deal with it this time around. An awkward gaping duck. A series of knocks, not too loud yet not too soft either, filled a certain silver and crimson dyed room. The sun had risen up for a while now, yet no one had seen this lady come out of her room yet after being knocked on her door for an hour now. Finally, 
worried about what happened to her and partly running out of patience, Lifer pushed the doors open while gently announcing her presence, I'm coming in, my lady. She first pulled the drawn curtains open to allow the light to seep in and illuminate the dull room before walking closer to the bed and, slightly pulling to canopy to wake her little lady, she let out a horrifying shrill scream. 7 a.m. at the Thief's Plaza Square. A hooded figure dressed in plain clothes, wandered around the shops as they browsed through different goods. Checking out the sweets corner of one of the shops, she drooled at the sights of them whilst not knowing how she threw the whole castle of Silverus in complete chaos. That made them mobilize their personal night order. She continued to stroll out on the streets with one major problem. I didn't bring any money with me. Ah, uh, how idiotic of me. Adira grumbled to herself while hearing her stomach start to growl in hunger. She flushed red when the man, who owned the bakery she happened to pass by, turned to her upon hearing her stomach's angry growl. Little lady, have you not eaten yet? He asked as kindly as he could, so he doesn't scare the little girl. He was, after all, as humongous as a bear and all children were afraid of him the moment they lay their little eyes at him. It eventually became his weakness. Adira, still feeling shy at her blunder, shook her head softly, like a cute little animal shying away from a human. The baker smiled at her cuteness, clutching his chest as if he were healed with this unparalleled cuteness, before thinking about her answer, that's weird. This thief barely has any beggars on the streets and though dressed plainly, you don't look like one. Barely has beggars. Why is that mister? Adira looked up to him with cute upturned puppy eyes that struck another arrow into the poor baker's heart. He smiled at her and crouched low to gently pat her little hooded head, as he could no longer stop himself, before answering her, Are you not from around here? It's impossible to not know how the Duke Silverus takes care of us diligently. He set up orphanages for homeless children and gave jobs for those able-bodied former beggars desperate to change their fates. Of course there are scuffles here and there and scums who refuse to follow him but everything's manageable. We are very much thankful for the Duke. Wow. How nice of the Duke. Her little eyes sparkled in adulation for the silly father that cried buckets of tears plus snots after seeing Adira faint from her high fever again. Her wonderful, adorable, doting father. Right? He's very cool too. How about I take you to the orphanage to see if they can accommodate you after you eat breakfast? You came at the right time, my wife cooked her special omelettes today and you're gonna love it. The proud baker boasted about his wife's cooking and invited Adira in. Although she found them too trusting to strangers that it was too alien for her, she was thankful nonetheless. Cause if he hadn't invited her, she'd be crawling back to the manor with an empty stomach. The little wife, a woman with jet black shiny hair, small delicate face and pinkish lips, looked towards them and was really shocked with the little visitor before her visage warmed up and she smiled. Hello little one. Were you lost? Did this big scary man frighten you? Don't be scared to tell this sister. I'm stronger. She winked at Adira which earned her a sweet and amused smile from the latter. Hello, sister. The big brother did not frighten me at all. In fact, he offered to help me solve my starvation. Please, do pardon my intrusion. Adira, with the force of habit, slipped and used a formal and noble tone before she twitched from forcing herself to not curtsy right after she said the words. The baker and his wife were briefly floored at her refined mannerisms and turned to each other before warmly looking down at her like proud parents. My, do you like the way those nobles present themselves? You got their manners hands down. It almost made me think that maybe you're one of them. The wife beamed happily, gently coaxing the child, and patted Adira's hooded head, elated with the latter's small show. Well, I really am one of them though. What made the couple think otherwise was because no noble child would purposely don on a plain commoner's clothes and roam around their thief's plaza square, right? Which noble in their right mind would do that? Partly, also, they heard their little lady Silverus was the little demoness. Surely this cute little angel cannot be that demoness, right? This is a far cry from that demonic little beast. Do you wanna eat with us before going with this big scary man to find your parents? Hey hiya! 
Stop saying big scary man this, big scary man that. She really will be scared of me at this rate. The baker, her husband, protested and pouted. My, dotes on the wife too much and now can't fight back, eh? Ha ha. My bad, darling. Well, shall we eat before the food turns cold? Hyacinth asked and turned to both Adira and her husband, Peter, before leading them to the dining table. During the meal, Adira got to know them a little bit better. Apparently, Hyacinth and Peter were newlyweds and weren't blessed with a child yet. And well, Peter, if possible, wanted a child like Adira, cute, beautiful and angelic. Heck, he even wanted to just go ahead and adopt the girl herself. However, that needs to wait before they confirm if Adira's an orphan. If she is, they would love to have her be part of their simple little family. Just a few little minutes after their meal, after saying their thanks and cleaning the table, a ruckus could be heard outside. Adira, now with her hood off and showcasing her dark ash-like wavy locks and silverish orbs, turned her gaze outside. What's happening? Why is it noisy outside? Along the line of Adira's thoughts, Hyacinth voiced hers. I wonder what's wrong. It's a little too noisy outside. There's too much unrest this morning. Shall we go out and ask someone? Peter asked and walked first while Hyacinth wiped her hands with her apron and Adira wore her hood again, for safety purposes. A large group of knights, bearing the crest of the silver crescent moon, which was clearly just a fraction of a much larger group of knights roamed around. Some were atop their horses for faster mobility and better vantage point and some were marching heavily as if marching towards a war. The anxiety and unrest were flowing out them in waves that the townspeople couldn't help but be infected with it. What's wrong? Why are the silver knights here? I don't know. They seem to be looking for someone. Could it be a spy? Good lord, are we in danger then? The antsy townspeople started to discuss among themselves while Adira could only pull her hood down to cover her more and retreated a few steps to make her presence as less as possible and slipped out of the crowd when she saw an opportunity. Little one, looks like we'll have to postpone going to her. Where is she? Peter turned to his wife, who could only shrug and shake her head before each of their expressions morphed into one of worry. Adira ran and ran, back to the place she snuck out of back to her home. She sped and turned past various alleys trying to find the shortest possible route. Oh God! I didn't know it would cause this huge mess. Why did they mobilize the family's nights? Oh. It's really my fault. I shouldn't have snuck out. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. Turning into another alley, back to the open streets but with visibly lesser people, since a lot of them were gathered at the square, she mistakenly bumped into someone. Seeing as she was much smaller, and a girl for goodness sake, she fell down on her but with her hood flying off her head. Adira groaned and endured the brief pain. She opened her eyes to the sight of a silvery white-haired boy with fine, porcelain-like skin and a beautiful face almost beating a girl at her own field crumpled with worry with his hands offered to her before asking, Are you fine? I'm sorry. I wasn't looking where I was going. Adira, sitting there like an awkward gaping duck in front of this beautiful, white swan, opened and closed her mouth a few times. She didn't know what to say. His beauty robbed her of her tirade of complaints. His beautiful glistening platinum eyes were like the cream of the crop amongst the finest jewels in the kingdom. And oh, his plump cherry red childish lips. Adira. That's a child. Stop. Um. Ah. Uh. Weird sounds were coming out of Adira's lips and she could barely notice her embarrassment herself. Her mind was full of this beautiful person's profile. Wait. Did I not know this person from my previous life? Why do I not know him? A person as beautiful as this slipped past my senses. How preposterous. You. You don't belong here. Right? I'll overlook it. You. You don't belong here. Right? The beautiful boy visibly froze at Adira's question. Knew it. I would remember him if he was from around here. Yes. I was just um, planning to visit a, friend. He answered and almost whispered the last word, barely audible. Adira continued to stare at his appearance. It was incredibly, 
superbly, magnificently, very pleasing to the eyes. She could stare at him all day and she would still not have enough of it. Feeling the pretty little girl's stare on him, he shifted on his spot uncomfortably while his arm was gradually getting weary from still staying on its awkward position. Finally noticing the little boy's weariness, Adira jolted and hurriedly grabbed the little arm, not to seem too eager. Great, before he could even retract it. Th thank you, um, oh. I'm cossy, he left an awkward hanging tone. Like there should have been something else there but he forcefully stopped. Whatever. He's handsome so I'll overlook it. Thank you, Casey Star. I may. My lady. Oh my god. My lady. The lady's over here. My lady. What sort of clothes are you wearing? Adira didn't get to introduce herself properly when the servants, who were also dispatched, or more like begged to be dispatched as well, finally found her and immediately crowded over her, checking her for injuries or anything out of the ordinary. In this life, it wasn't only Lifer anymore who fussed over her. She successfully gained a horde of worry warts as her entourage. I am fine. She answered as she scanned everyone's worried faces that seemed to age faster. This little stunt was not a good idea at all. My lady, you need to hurry home. The master and mistress are dying from extreme perturbation. Please hurry home. They all pleaded her in behalf of their master and mistress, who had to remain back at the castle. If the duke's state of mind could only be trusted then they would not dare stop him from searching for the lady, himself. He is her father, after all, and they were aware of how much the duke doted on and loved his only daughter. But they feared that the duke, himself, would also be in danger instead of only the lady and then the duchess wouldn't be able to take it. Then they'd worry to death for this troublesome family of three. What will become of the silverous territories? Oh okay. I am very sorry. Adira quickly apologized before remembering the forgotten beautiful boy and turned to him planning to thank him again and apologize, when he was not in his spot anymore. He's gone. The large crowd must have scared him. Ah, this day is too unfortunate. She sighed before following the servants back to the carriage and to the manor. She was trembling so bad with every step she took towards the lounge where her parents were waiting for her return. What do I do? Should I fall down to my knees and beg for forgiveness immediately before they can even scold me? Will that work? Maybe father. But I doubt it'd work on mother. Then should I wait and weather the storm? It'll only last a couple of hours at most, right? Ha. Ha ha. Ha. Ark. Godamit Adira. O oh gods and goddesses, whoever can hear me, please save me. Adira ranted inside her head while pursing her lips awfully tight she was turning pale. She felt like she was being escorted to the guillotine to serve her sentence. As soon as the double doors opened and she stepped in, the Duke and Duchess immediately flew to her side and caught her in a tight bear hug. My daughter. My sweet, sweet baby. Where were you? Her mother's shivering voice managed to speak first. And as if being urged on by his wife's voice, the Duke followed with, Baby angel, dear, are you hurt? What happened? Where were you? Did someone take you? Tell daddy, okay. Daddy won't get mad. Daddy will punish the bad person for you. I, shocked with the complete opposite of what she expected, Adira's words trailed off. She looked at her parents' anxious and worried eyes looking down at her, waiting for her to continue, before she forced her voice to answer, I, I went out on my own. Surprised, the Duke and Duchess stiffened for a while before asking, why, baby? She looked down to her fingers twisting each other as she fidgeted with guilt. I... I simply wanted to go out. I'm sorry for not telling you before doing it. I didn't know it would cause such a huge mess. I am very sorry. I will accept whatever punishment. Oh, sweetie. Her mother once again took her into her arms. Did you get bored inside the castle? We're sorry, sweet angel. We just don't want you to get hurt. The outside world is dangerous. We do not know the dark elements hiding in every corner waiting to pounce at us the moment we let our guard down. I hope you'll understand father and mother. We do not mean to trap you within the castle walls. 
The Duke tried to patiently let his words sink in his baby daughter's mind while also gently coaxing her. It must have frightened her when she saw the knights and servants dispatched to look for her. It may seem too much but I cannot be lax about it. Adira's still young so I understand that she's just curious about the world, but once she is introduced to society, she'll likely be targeted at every turn. The Duke thought and shivered at the dark and gruesome thoughts that gnawed at him. He was willing to do anything to protect his family, no matter what it took. Even if it meant caging his own daughter in so she doesn't fly too far to a place where they cannot reach. Still wallowing in her guilt, Adira softly nodded her head. She didn't really mean to worry them that much. She only wanted to take a good look at their domain. To know the people she ignored and pushed to their deaths while blindly pursuing love. She wanted to see how they went about their everyday life. She wanted her own eyes to see the people she should have protected with all her might. On an inconspicuous carriage traveling across provinces back to the capital, a certain silvery almost white-haired boy leaned against the window, his mind returning back to a few hours ago when he met a certain young lady. If his guess was right and it always was, that little girl was the Lady Silverus. Adira Silverus. What was she doing outside? In commoner's clothes even. He thought to himself and tried to think a plausible reason from various viewpoints but none suited the lady's character at all. He was, after all, a good judge of character. One look was all it took him to know a person's character and categorize him as a person that harbored ill will or a trusted aid. However, this particular lady seems too unique for her own good. She was interesting. A small smile quietly made way into his cold and indifferent face. A genuine one. If only his guard aide would dare turn to him, he'd have witnessed a rare miracle. They probably didn't know she went out judging from their extreme reaction. How cute. She doesn't know how to be discreet at all. All throughout the ride back to the capital, all he thought about was Adira. It may have been an accident, but at least he fulfilled his purpose of visiting the Silverous territory. He was sent there to see the little lady herself. Since the Duke Silverus hurriedly went home a week ago, when they received word that there was an emergency back at their castle, that something happened to the little lady. His father, a good friend of the Duke, sent him to greet them and wish the Silverus family good health while also investigating about this emergency and why the Duke was neglecting his job for so long. However, when he arrived, the place was swarming with the Silver Crescent Moon Knight Order as the place was turned upside down all because the Lady Silverus was missing from early morning. He proceeded to the Duke's castle yet decided against it at the last minute due to the current state of the fief. Surely, even the Duke, himself, would not be able to properly receive him with the current state of affairs. He turned and was about to retreat for a while and return a few days later, when things calmed down, when a figure suddenly popped out of an alley and crashed into him. The person was smaller than him and considerably weaker as she fell down hard with a cute little yelp and the hood flew off revealing a dark ash-like hair with slight waves. The little girl's groan snapped him out of being astounded with her stunning appearance and immediately offered his hand for assistance. She then opened her cute and lovely eyes, with her butterfly-like eyelashes adorably batting at him, and stared at him for a long time. He didn't know if it was on purpose or was she just naturally adorable. Are you okay? I'm sorry. I wasn't looking where I was going. No, it should have been her who wasn't looking properly, right? And running around so haphazardly. Of course, she'll bump into someone. Lucky, it's only me. What? Lucky? Your Highness, Prince Kasimi. We have arrived. He was snapped out of his reverie before nodding his head and quickly changed his aura. He was now the Prince Kasimi. The cold and black-hearted first prince of the Vasilis Empire. Hem. I would love to see her again someday. Notes. Asterisk the Casey here is because Adira only heard the first two syllables of Kasimi's name. I. He's a jerk. My lady, you look absolutely beautiful. Our lady is the most beautiful in the empire. Indeed. No one can match up to her gorgeousness. You've grown beautifully and splendidly. My lady. Lypha and the other maids gushed as they stood a few feet away from their little lady, who was not so little anymore. 
feeling like proud mother hens. It had been ten years since that time the Silverus territory was turned upside down because of the missing lady. Ten years since Triton tried to get engaged to Adira and was shot down by the lady herself. Also, ten years since her father engaged her to someone else. She didn't really care at that point since it was normal for noble children to be engaged early and for her. As long as it wasn't Triton then she was fine with whomever. What she didn't expect was for her to actually be engaged to the first prince of the empire. She hasn't even seen him. Not once. What a mysterious fiancé this man is. The Duke Silverus was surprised as well. He also didn't expect the royalty themselves to propose such arrangement. He didn't want to force Adira into anything but his daughter didn't seem as unwilling as when the Dalriada family presented a similar proposal. Your Highness, pish posh, don't sound so distant and just address me how you usually do, Silpha. The king waved his hands to dismiss the others and turned to his good friend. Um. Anastasius, are you really sure about this arrangement? I mean, my very cute and lovely daughter is indeed a good choice and you won't lose out in choosing her. Heck, my daughter's the best that you can find and, okay, okay, I don't need your constant reminder about how much you love your daughter. How dare you rub salt on my wound just cause you got yourself a cute daughter. The audacity. So what's your problem? Well, I don't want Adira to be caught up in your royal struggle for power. She doesn't need to belong in your crazy and bloody world. The father inside the duke spoke and protectively kept his precious daughter away from the chaotic life in a royal's vie for the throne. However, your daughter's the best choice, right? The king asked with a hidden evil smirk as he laid the trap in front of this idiotic parent who's usually very intelligent for his own good yet forgets everything when it concerned his lovely daughter. Being the proud parent that he is, the duke immediately exclaimed, of course, no one's better than my precious Adira. She's the best of the best. And there you have it. The king's grin broadened, feeling jubilant at this idiotic man for willingly falling into his trap. You've no choice but to accept the arrangement. I personally also like Adira as a daughter. Isn't it better? Hitting two birds with one stone. You earn a connection to the royal family, thus elevating your status than the Dalriada, and I get a beautiful daughter-in-law. How perfect. You bastard. You just want to steal my Adira. Silpha, feeling wronged, accused the cacanating king, reverting to how they were when they were but teenagers. And so, that was how Adira got engaged to this prince she haven't met. Although she's heard stories about him from Casey, the boy she unexpectedly befriended. Casey said that the prince was magnanimous and a genius at various fields. Though, Triton also said that the prince was a jerk. Hmm, why was Triton visiting so often anyway? I rejected the proposal, didn't I? She thought to herself while walking down the hallway to board her carriage that will take her to the palace where the ball was to be held. Tonight was the coming of age of various nobles who recently turned and turning 16 and, obviously, Adira's one of them. Now the custom states that nobles who are currently engaged should be accompanied by none other than their fiancé. But, her fiancé was nowhere to be seen. She didn't think too much about it since if push comes to shove, she'll just grab her stepbrother and force him to be her partner. This brother, Rame Dryafor Ear Silverus, was a child her father decided to adopt when her engagement to the prince was decided saying. Because my lovely little angel Adira's gonna be taken by some bastard son, someone needs to succeed the duke's position. And honestly, she had no qualms about it. She quite liked her new brother. He was calm, collected, sweet and kind. He was the perfect older brother. Save for the times he relentlessly scolded her for harming herself when she fell off her horse a lot of times, or those times she fell off their boat when they went to the lake. Oh. Or even those times she hurt her stomach from overeating and she wailed miserably. In other words, he was just like her father. Overprotective. Stop spacing out Adira. You'll fall off the stairs. Came his stern voice from behind her and her back straightened like a bow's tense string. Be our brother, good evening. She stuttered a bit as she turned to him nervously. She really couldn't handle his strict expression. 
She always want to cry when she sees it. He sighed when he saw the panic in her face and felt bad for her. He didn't want to make her wear that kind of expression when she's with him. He just can't help it that he feels extremely worried for her. He brought his hand up to her head and gently patted her while softly coaxing her, I'm sorry. Brother doesn't want you to fall to your death so why don't I help you down? And offered his arm. She visibly brightened at the gentleness of her brother and immediately clung to his arm like a spoiled little princess before smiling widely up to him. The latter could only sigh and smile at this precious little gem that was given to him. Ah, why does she have to be engaged to that jerk? He anguishedly thought to himself while helping Adira down the stairs and into the carriage. By the way, where's that J.E. I mean, the first prince? Shouldn't he be escorting you? Millimeter. I don't know. You know I've never met him before and I think I also won't be seeing him this time round. So with that said, will big brother please escort me instead? She acted cute to rope her brother into helping her. She knew very well how weak he was to her when she does this. Rami answered, without the slightest bit of hesitation and very automatically as if on reflex, of course. It'd even be his pleasure. But, never met him. Who was that whitehead she spoke regularly with then? Wasn't that the jerk? Rame's confusion slipped past Adira as she cheered. Now, she won't have to embarrass herself by attending the ball without her fiancé. Her brother was plenty enough. Despite him not growing up within the nobility, he didn't lose to those so-called higher nobles at all. His soft and silky straight ebony bobcut hair framed his delicate and handsome face so well he blew up in popularity the moment he was introduced to high society in his coming of age last year. It was known that he was an adopted child of the Silverus family yet this didn't dampen the fangirl's heated adoration for this bachelor that the Silverus household servants had trouble organizing the proposals sent to the castle every day. He was even placed on the same pedestal as the princes and other nobles as one of the most sought-after bachelors in the empire. And although the first prince was announced to have been engaged already, this didn't put a stopper on his surging popularity at all. Hmm. Weren't you and the first prince the same age? Adira suddenly asked. Yeah. Why? So you've seen him. What does he look like? Does he really look like a monster with sharp teeth and bad breath and horns? Triton said he was. Triton, he was that pest she rejected that still kept coming, right? He said that? Yes. But Casey told me he was a handsome prince, the most handsome even, and that I was darn lucky to be the one chosen for him amongst the horde of girls that was gunning. For him. Casey, who's this new jerk? Is he that old asterisk boy? However, I refuse to believe either of them. I will only believe what my dear brother says. She exclaimed and successfully inflated Rame's pride. He felt he just trampled all over them and was still the closest to her. I, he's a jack, was all he said, wearing a victorious smirk. He won't allow them to steal his precious Adira. But enough about that jerk. We're here so conduct yourself well. I will be by your side as well to pick up your lapses. He reassured her which earned him a sweet smile. My dear brother really is the best. Alighting off her carriage, she was about halfway up the stairs when the wind blew unexpectedly hard and caused her hair to obstruct her vision that she had to turn her head slightly to get it away. A neighing of the horse and a carriage, which was a little too inconspicuous, halted below them and felt her heart suddenly jump upon laying eyes on the crest. She forgot she was about the same age as her and was taken in by a baron's house three years ago. She unconsciously gripped her brother's arm too hard that caused the latter to turn to what she was staring at so intently and noticed a lady walk out of the carriage, accompanied by her adoptive father, her light pink hair fluttering in the wind and her looking up at them before smiling kindly. She's here. Notes. Asterisk old because Casimir's hair resembled an old person's white grayish hair. So Ramir calls him old in spite. Athanasius, oh. She's that baron's adoptive daughter, right? Ramir, noticing the conspicuous and very rare pink hair of the lady, asked before turning to his sister that seemed to grow roots on her spot. Adira? However, his little sister did not move nor respond. 
She just trained her eyes on the newcomer with uncanny wintry gaze. He lightly pressed his free hand on her and flinched slightly at the coldness of her skin under his touch. He wasn't sure if it was because of the cold weather outside and the fact that she wore such little clothing since her shoulders were too bare. And yes, that's already too little to me for my dear Adira, or something else. He, very gently, squeezed her to snap her back into focus and fortunately succeeded when he saw color slowly returning to her pale cheeks before she smiled at him, attempting to reassure him that she was fine. Are you cold? You look very pale. Rame's voice was coated with concern for his lovely sister's health. She was healthy, yes, but you can never be too sure. Don't call me overprotective. A whole of you can't even compare to half of my beautiful Adira. Shaking her head gently, Adira redirected her gaze to her front after answering, I'm fine, brother, and resumed to ascending up the stairs while still vaguely aware of the presence behind her. She may have forgotten that they were close in age, but she'll never forget how she wormed her way up her status and successfully snatched her man right under her nose. She'll never forget how the pain from her sword impaling her could never drown out the pain of his betrayal to her love and the pain of always being the odd one out of their awkward triangle. She was the fiancé, the wife, and the queen, yet she was pushed aside just like that from just a couple of sweet talk from a sweet, cute and beautiful lady like her. Come to think of it, why do I feel as if I've missed something very important? Adira thought to herself while she let Rame guide her to the hall where the event was held. She didn't notice the worried stare of her brother nor anything till their name was announced loudly to the participants of the ball. She finally snapped out of it, deciding to temporarily push it at the back of her mind, and quickly fixed her posture. With the help of Rame, her brother, he led her down the stairs under everyone's fixed gazes. They kept their stare on her like wild dogs eyeing a premium bone, waiting for her to make a miss any time. But, she wouldn't be a dearer if they let them have the gossip that they want. Instead, she floated down the stairs, to the center where the guests were gathered, so smoothly and elegantly, it was as if they were watching a deity descend to grace them mere mortals. After reaching them, she promptly curtsied and introduced herself with that cold yet beautiful small smile, Good evening. It is a pleasure to be of your acquaintance. I am Adira Ramiria Ear Silverus, firstborn daughter of the Duke Silverus, the ladies and the men, as well as the parents of the nobles who were also a participant of the unified ceremony for their coming of age, stared at the mesmerizing figure of this elegant child. While the Duke Silverus, Silpha, who stood by the king's side along with Duke Dalriada, Osiris, looked incredibly smug his ego inflating like a hot air balloon. My, the Lady Silverus is such a wonderful child. Osiris spoke first while watching Adira interact with the nobles that quickly flocked around her. She was dealing with them so perfectly it was almost unbelievable for a child to be perfectly cultured and mannered. Especially when it's Silver's child a rowdy and loud person. HMMP. Of course my daughter is wonderful. In fact, She's the most wonderful. She's just the greatest. The cream of the crop. The beautiful cherry on top. My baby angel Adira's the best. Igniting the blazing adoration of this father to his daughter, Osiris sighed. Seriously, the man was perfect save for when he turns idiotic for his daughter. At first he never understood what was so special about having a daughter. But now that he was looking at Adira, even he would want her as a daughter. Too bad you didn't accept a proposal to join our houses. He sighed and looked away, sulking and dejected. Well, of course. Adira's bound to be my daughter. So it's only right that they rejected your proposal. The king, who was still keeping his eyes at the lovely and beautiful child that robbed all the other ladies of the people's attention, laughed and smacked the back of Osiris as if attempting to comfort him while also flaunting how Adira was going to be his daughter-in-law. Your Majesty, that's mean. Feeling wronged, Osiris complained and rubbed his throbbing back. Then, Your Majesty, you are aware your son is the lucky jerk who's engaged to my beautiful daughter, yes, of course. Then may I ask, if it's not too rude, where the heck is that jerk? 
Dark shadows covered Silpha's supposed to be blinding smile as he inched closer to the king. If it was a normal setting, he'd have been sent to prison already for less majest. But they were childhood friends and everyone knew that. They would sometimes slip and act like that in front of everyone, like tonight. Oh, he's there. He was busy with something so he couldn't escort Adira from your house. I believe he's done. And as if on cue, the dance was finally starting. Adira wasn't nervous with the dance since she'd already perfected it even from her past life all for the sake of impressing Triton and being the perfect partner for him, desperate not to bring him embarrassment. What she was worried about was, her damn fiancé still not around. As she was worrying about that, while restlessly shifting on her place although it wasn't noticeable, a hand suddenly held hers and raised it to her chest level as if guiding her forward. Jolting, she retracted her hand immediately and knocked the other away during the process. How dare this person randomly hold my hand like that? Before turning to the owner of the hand she slapped away, only to find the surprised gaze of Casey. Eh? Casey? He's here. She knew Casey was a noble but she didn't know which house. But Casey was a year older than her so if he was to come of age, shouldn't that be last year? Casey? She called his name and a smile found its way back to his face. Hello, Adira. How are you? I'm... I'm fine. Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. I didn't know it was you. Adira quickly apologized and did a slight curtsy. No matter what Casey's nobility rank was, which was undoubtedly lower than hers, she had to have the decency to apologize for being rude despite being unaware. It's fine. I also didn't announce myself so it's my fault. He chuckled softly at the cute panicking yet polite Adira. Yeah, why'd you suddenly pop out like that? Now she was complaining and this immediate change in reaction oddly lit Casimir's mood. He was busy concocting new blends of tea out of chamomile that he made too many without noticing it. Hence, he was not able to escort Adira from her house and had to meet her at the hall itself. Oh no. I don't have time to play with you, Casey. I need to find my bastard fiancé. How dare he stand me up like this? On my coming of age even. This must be revenge. I swear I'm already dying to tear his hair out from the roots and curse him with baldness if I ever find him. Feeling every one of her complaints pierce through him mercilessly, Casey once again took her hand tightly this time so she can't swat him away again and led her to the center of the hall. The first and opening dance was meant to be performed by the prince and his fiancée. However, when the first prince came of age, Adira, as his fiancée, committed a huge gaffe and came down with a high fever. She wanted to attend no matter what since it was extremely inappropriate and she didn't want to embarrass the prince but her overprotective family decided against it. Around noon that day, a messenger from the palace came and said, The prince prays for your fast recovery, my lady. He also wanted to let you know not to worry about him and just rest well. How can I not worry when I am placing him in a difficult spot? Adira grumbled on the bed while pulling the sheets up to her face and curled in a pitiful fetal position. Rame also didn't want to attend his own event that day and wanted to stay beside her to nurse her but she pushed him to go with teary eyes. And how was he supposed to go against her when she's like that? No one can do that. Two days after that hot and exhausting night, Adira received a visitor, Casey. He said that he heard from his father, who was a good friend of her father how she was down with a fever. She reassured him that she was healthy and fine but really regretted how she wasn't able to attend the coming of age of her own fiancé. Ah, this sucks. I'm sure he hates me now. I should probably go and tell father to prepare for the annulment of my engagement with the prince. She mused and sighed before leaning her head back and melting down on the sofa, how very unlike a lady of her status. But she didn't care. Casey was one of the few people that knew this carefree side of her. Wait, why? Casey suddenly asked, almost sounding panicked albeit it, as usual, doesn't show on his ever-frozen face. Because he hates me. How do you know he hates you? Did he tell you? Well, no. But, who wouldn't hate someone that embarrassed them at their own event, right? If it were me, I will really break him like twigs and plant him in a pot. 
So he didn't tell you he hates you. Doesn't that mean that he doesn't hate you? You cannot just annul an engagement just like that anyway. Case's words made her pause and think. He had a point though. No matter how much the prince hated her for missing his event, surely it will take a bit of time to annul their engagement, right? Or maybe he's not annulling me so he can keep the other ladies at bay. She muttered again that drew an exasperated sigh from the boy. Ah, what am I gonna do with you? You really drive me crazy at every turn. Although he was thinking that, he also found time spent with her the most comfortable and fun. He relished every moment with her. Upon arriving at the center of the hall, Casey suddenly knelt down in front of the confused and panicking Adira. Oh my goodness. How could you pull me here, Casey? Casey, what are you doing? I'm the first prince's fiancé. You're putting yourself in unnecessary trouble. She whispered to him, all the while trying to pull her hand away from Casey's tight hold. He suddenly smirked and all the beautiful ladies in the hall felt the air leave their lungs as their gazes were fixed on this handsome creature, more handsome than all. The men there combined, his countenance brightening the whole place a few kilowatts higher. Bringing down his lips to her hand, Casey spoke. I, Casimi Athanasius Rosenvasilis, would like to request my dearest fiancé, Lady Adira Ramiria Ear Silveris, for a dance. Would you do me the honor? My lady, Athanasius, a name that means immortality, a name that can only be bestowed to the royals. He is. Case is the first prince, the crown prince, still frozen on her spot, after hearing such a bomb explode right in front of her. Adira felt her world spin as information she had forgotten rushed back to her after learning Case's full name. Casimi Athanasius Rosenvasilis, First prince of the Vasilis Empire, heir to the throne. The crown prince that died on his 17th year due to an assassination which paved the way for the Dalriada heir to take his place as the crown prince after the second prince died, also of assassination. A distant blood relative of the royals but a legit blue-blooded heir, nonetheless. Rumors circulated after the incident about how the assassinations of the princes were orchestrated by the Dalriada household to usurp the throne. Adira, who loved Triton as madly as a loyal dog, was enraged with the said rumor which catalyzed her tyranny. She shut the one who dared speak of such rumors the easy and the hard way. It was the catalyst to her ruined reputation which earned her the name of the Ash Demonis, a monster spawn from the king of the devils that crawled up to make their Lives miserable, which eventually became the Mad Queen. She didn't mind what names they called her as. What was important to her was Triton's reputation. All that mattered to her was to clear Triton's name of the malicious rumors they spread. No matter if hers was dragged to the mud and stepped on. She felt lightheaded and swayed back before feeling strong and reassuring arms snake around her waist, keeping her stable. However, what was more dangerous than falling was how this absolutely, divinely, immaculate attractive face was suddenly too close to her that she unconsciously placed a hand on his chest, a poor attempt at keeping him at bay. Are you okay? I'm sorry for surprising you like this. Ah, just like how we met. He's apologizing again after helping me out of my own mistake. I'm... I'm fine, your highness. She whispered and turned away. She couldn't believe that Casey was one of the few people who was above her in status. And yet, she dared act slovenly in front of him. How shameful, Adira. Upon remembering her unladylike gestures, a blush crept up to her face, dusting her cheeks prettily that it made her more exquisitely alluring and perfect. Stirring a man's desire unnecessarily. Maybe that's the reason why I hesitated to tell you. Kasumi whispered before gently taking Adira's hand while still keeping his eyes on her visage that secretly visited his dreams at night. Hearing his cool voice so close to her ears, she shivered slightly and slowly turned to look at him after listening to his words. Hesitated. Seeing the confusion on her face, he continued, I didn't want you to feel distant with me. I wanted you to see Kasumi and not the prince. I love how you call me Casey and how only you call me that. Guiding and leading her into the dance when the melody started, a small pleading smile graced his apathetic gorgeous face while continuing, so please, 
Don't start calling me your highness now. Just call me Casey like you always do. But your highness, that is inappropriate. She stubbornly rejected him while allowing herself to fall willingly into his pace, swaying and turning with his every move. Well, you've always been headstrong. Kasimi fell silent after he spoke and focused more on their dance, relishing this beautiful and romantic moment where nothing else mattered but the lady in his arms, following him at every turn, every step and every pause. Adira did the same but Case's words still lingered in her mind. She was too occupied with her thoughts that she missed a step and almost fell sidewards when Kasimi automatically, like an innate reflex, grabbed Adira's waist and lifted her up as he spun her around to save her once again. It was truly a magical and resplendent moment that they both looked as if they were drawn out from the paintings of the greatest artist and his greatest masterpiece. A few more turns and steps before the song ended and Kasumi bowed from his hips with graceful movements befitting a prince and Adira curtsied so low, displaying her respect to the man in front of her, the prince as well as her fiancé. Kasumi helped Adira up and offered his hand to her. The scene looked just like the moment they first met a young Kasumi helping a young Adira up and also offering his hand as the young lady only stared at him before. Adira smiled so radiantly all men were now drilling holes through her. As soon as she was up and standing beside Kasumi, she spoke in a soft whisper, but if you don't mind, can I still call you Casey when it's just us? She looked up to him to watch his reaction and damn was it perfect. A genuine miraculous happy smile, that very rarely presents on his face, bloomed majestically all women must have been struck with an arrow or two by now and of course. Our very own lovely Adira's no exception to that. The sheer power of that smile. God, I really have to be extra wary of my back from now on. She had a sudden thought as she stared at that dazzling smile. After the first dance was done, all the other nobles, with their respective partners, fiancés, brothers or cousins, took over the dance floor while Adira retreated to a corner and sat to rest her feet. From a corner of her gaze, she saw that striking pink-haired lady walk down the stairs with her yellow sunlight gown adding to her bright and adorable charm. She walked close to Kasumi, who personally went to get Adira some water himself, and greeted him with a low curtsy. And the latter, being the civil yet cold prince that he is, only nodded his head in acknowledgement before walking away and returning to Adira's side. Adira, who was watching their exchange, felt nervous. It wasn't because she was jealous or anything, but because she couldn't help but feel like so when she sees her. Also, there's still Case's assassination. What's wrong? Kasumi asked when he saw the anxious gaze of the maiden on him and raised a brow. No. Nothing. She avoided his gaze unconsciously as it drifted back towards the girl as bright and joyful as sunlight, while she was as dark as blood. Here, water. He simply said, without any inessential words, and handed her a glass of water which she casually replied with a thank you. Kasumi settled down beside her, wordlessly, but somehow his presence was reassuring enough and she smiled languidly. She's never been more relaxed tonight than now. By the way, Casey, Adira started when a thought suddenly dawned on her now that she knows his real identity. Kasumi turned to her with an easy and relaxed expression on his face as his mesmerizing platinum eyes asked her silently. I was not present in your coming of age, right? She spoke of it with a guilty expression on her pretty face that made Kasumi smile slightly before the former continued. What did you do with your dance? He hummed softly when he thought back to that time and answered after a few seconds, I didn't dance. You didn't dance? Is that even allowed? Well, my fiancé was sick in bed. I didn't even want to attend it and skip it so we could celebrate our coming of age together but I had to for various reasons, was what he wanted to say but summarized it all together in a simple reply, together. What? Together. Together what? Do you mean that you wanted to celebrate it with me but couldn't because of certain reasons? Is that it? Adira, playing the little mind reader for Kasumi's entertainment asked which earned her another smile. My God, if I have to play as a mind reader just to see that smile, I'd gladly play it a million times more. So that's why you knew that I was sick when you came to visit two days later when I got better.
Kasumi only nodded and kept his stare on her while she immersed herself in her own thoughts, rearranging the new informations in her head. Well, it was fun talking with her but lately, he noticed that it was even fun just simply watching her facial expressions change every now and then. Overwrite his touch. Good evening Lady Adira. If it's not too much trouble, may I have this dance? I should have rejected it. I shouldn't have hesitated and cared how he would look at other nobles' eyes if I rejected him. Adira grumbled to herself while feeling one particular piercing glacial stare amidst the warm and dreamy gazes of everyone else. Who wouldn't be mad at this setup? Her fiancé just stepped away to speak with an ambassador from the neighboring kingdom and a few minutes after, a bachelor suddenly came and swooped his fiancé away. To others, it may seem harmless. But that is not the case with Kasumi. He was very well aware of the hungry wolves that was eyeing his fiancé. The temperature dropped a few degrees while Adira did everything she could not to look at Case's way, else she'll see the Lord Devil rise from hell. Please, just end this song. Hurry up. Before Casey explodes. You idiot Adira. Even if he had already pulled you up before you could answer, you still should have said no. That's what you get for hesitating and dazing off. Idiot. Adira. She was snapped out of her inner turmoil of worries about Casey. She was so out of it she did not notice the face of this dreamy lord look at her with worry. Are you okay? Why, yes, Lord Dalriada. Forgive me if I have offended you in any way. She answered with a civil smile. Please don't look like that, Casey. I'm only being civil. Hands off your sword please. Is it because of him? Triton asked while sneaking a glance at the chilling death on the prince's face. A. Eh? Is it because of the prince that you rejected my proposal? He looked incredibly crestfallen as he asked Adira and this didn't slip past her. She was confused why Triton was acting like this. He never loved her anyway, so what does it matter if she chose the prince instead? Why does it matter? She replied and coincidentally the music finally stopped. She stood there waiting for him to answer her. She never understood why he always visited her even after she rejected his proposal. At first she thought that maybe he wanted to be friends and that was fine with her. It's better to be friends than be enemies. But also, there was that saying, keep your friends close but your enemy closer. So why not, right? She also thought that maybe his ego couldn't bear to be rejected but she didn't want to think that of Triton. All the years that he spent visiting her, and she receiving him, she thinks that he wasn't a stuck-up, annoying jerk, at least. So why? Why does it matter? Because I've, you're done, right? A cold, deathly chill ran up Adira's spine and sent her on immediate high alert as soon as she heard the voice. She turned around to find Kasumi standing behind her, still looking indifferent but definitely murderous even as he tried to hide it. Triton returned a glare towards Kasumi but quickly wiped it off his face. He quickly bowed and left a gentle kiss on Adira's hand before excusing himself. All done under Kasumi's nose. You dare challenge me, Dalriada, huh? Adira immediately spun around after Triton left and tried to pacify the solidifying iceberg standing behind her. C.A. Casey, come. He didn't let her finish and grabbed hold of her hands before pulling her out of the dance floor and back to their corner. On the way back to their spot, Kasumi grabbed a glass of liquor that was on a servant's tray. He let her sit down on the chair and knelt in front of her before pouring the liquor on her hands that Triton kissed. It was this, right? He rhetorically asked but didn't wait for Adira to answer and continued to empty the drink on her hands. C.A. Casey, what are you doing? Shocked with the nipping coldness of the liquor and his actions, she tried to free her hand from his hold but he kept a tight grip. Kasumi didn't answer and just stared at her drenched hand soundlessly. Casey, please, let go. Let me go wash my hand, please. The coldness that continued to glint dangerously on Kasumi's platinum eyes was starting to scare her. She didn't like Kasumi looking like this. She knew how he was cold to others, but it's an entirely different matter when it's directed at her. Casey. She tried to call him again to make him look at her. After Triton left and they returned to their spot in the corner of the hall, he hasn't once looked at her in the eyes. 
He finally made a move after staring at Hadira's hands for a minute and started licking the excess beverage still dripping on her porcelain-like smooth hands. C.A. Casey, your highness, stop! Adira exclaimed, not too loud for others to hear them but not too soft that it won't reach Casimir's ears either. Don't worry, I'm just disinfecting your hand. Might be the longest sentence he said after facing Triton. Casey look at me. Adira ordered the prince a very brave soul indeed, before using her free hand to gently cup his face and make him feel her. Finally looking up at her, he then noticed the bright red cheeks of Adira. She was so adorable, so charming a dainty little creature, who was panic-stricken with his little stunt after being riled by Triton. It's okay. There's nothing between Triton and me. Calm down please. What's with him then? Why do you look so close? Why do you have this complicated look whenever you see him? Why does he keep buzzing around you? Why? Unaware of Kasumi's list of unsaid questions, Adira paused and pursed her lips into a thin line as she also tried to think what was wrong with Triton. I really don't know. I also tried to ask him after the dance stopped but you shoot him away before he could even answer me. She grumbled a complaint. Because he was going to confess right then. If you heard what he wanted to say, what would you do? Kasumi softly whispered a question. Shoo them away as well. Adira, thinking that Casey was asking her what she would do if it was the other way around, answered seriously before smiling brightly at him which took the latter off guard. Do you know how nerve-wracking it is to be little Casey's fiancé? Ha ha. You do know how many girls are gunning for my spot, right? She giggled like soft silver bells and watching her like that was enough to slowly melt the frost that covered him. A lot are also pining for my spot, my dear. Kasumi thought and pulled out a handkerchief, wiping her hands, as he chuckled in reply to Adira's words. He placed a lasting kiss on her hands, still desperate to overwrite Triton's touch on her. Adira, inexperienced from being pampered and loved openly, could feel her face burn at Kasumi's actions then she hid her face with her hand and turned away. While the few nobles, that were not at all interested with the current dance, were more engrossed with their display instead. Reveling in their crown prince and crown princess's public display of affections, eating the served dog food asterisk willingly. But, of course, not everyone was happy with it. Notes. Asterisk dog food here is how Chinese authors describe PDAs of couples. Lately, I've been obsessed with Chinese romance novels so I kinda picked random stuffs up. I'll be sure to explain it in the notes if I do this again. Thanks. The latest chapter's been full of Kasumi and Adira's affairs, right? Ho ho tilde I especially like how Kasumi's the jealous and possessive type. It's cute but don't go too far, okay Casey? Kasumi, do not call me Casey, only Adira gets to call me that, you vermin. Author, sorry. Pain, pain fly away. A few weeks after Adira's heartthrobbing coming of age ceremony, she was sent to the capital to attend a few years of school as well as her bride and queen training. Although, she could breeze by the training and school since it was the second time already, she still went diligently. She assimilated with the crowd well and forged stable connections as well, something that Kasumi was very proud of as he watched over her. He was the head of the students' council, a training ground for him if you look at it the other way, and gathered a few trusted aides as well. Ones that were loyal to him and him only. But wouldn't that include Adira when I marry her? Maybe I should brief them about it later. He was sitting at the council's room with all his aides Roman, Leon, Alexander, and William sitting on the couch, minding each of their own businesses, when a knock briefly interrupted them. In a cold and domineering voice, Kasumi spoke, come in, and the door slowly creaked open. Good afternoon. Um. Your Highness. Adira's small voice filtered into the room with her figure cutely peeking inside. Yes. Kasumi asked that although his face was uncaring, his gentle and warm voice betrayed his countenance. The aides except Roman, who'd been by Kasumi's side since they were young, was shocked with this sudden change in season. From winter to spring real quick. Their gazes looked back and forth between Adira, who stood by the open door, and Kasumi who still sat regally on his chair. 
is this the infamous Lady Adira Silverus? Um, I just dropped by to speak to you about something. May I? She spoke carefully, as they were in the presence of other nobles. Though they were lower in rank but it wasn't far off. Most of them were either from a Marquis family or an Earl's. There were only two ducal families, after all. Go ahead. Kasimi gave his permission with gentle nod of his head, hinting her that it was fine with these gentlemen that kept their incredulous stare on her. Well, for the next week, my class is going on a field trip. Do you know this? Yes. So it's okay? Yes. Even with Lord Dalriada around? Yep, you heard that right. Triton was, unfortunately, assigned on the same class as me. Disastrous, right? Not only that. What made it more hapless was it wasn't only him. Even Iris was there. Asterisk Iris Amaryllis Calmia Latifolia, the adoptive daughter of the Baron Latifolia. This time, Casimir wasn't as fast at answering Adira as he was previously and paused. She could see him thinking about it and finally let out another yes. To say it surprised her might be an understatement. After all, she knew how much Casimir was bothered with Triton although she could never guess where it was stemming from. Did he finally come into terms with it? Really? asked Adira suspiciously. The Kasami that she knew wasn't as easy as this. There must be something else. And like all the answers he gave her, there was only another firm yes from him. Thinking that she cannot get any other more words from him aside from yes, she excused herself and went away while the gentlemen that silently watched them were left confused by their very dry exchange of words, mostly from the prince though. Didn't the rumors say they were as sweet as honey and chocolates combined? What happened? Your Highness, was that okay? Roman asked carefully. After that Dalriada's name was mentioned, the place suddenly just got a lot chillier. It doesn't matter. He dismissed Roman's queries and hinted at the others, who also wanted to ask not to proceed with theirs. My lady, preparations are already done. Would you be fine alone at your field trip? Lifer, who accompanied her to the capital and all the way to her dorm, asked worriedly. She was not used to not be by her mistress' side. And now, she was going away on a field trip all alone without her. Lifer, I'll be fine. Besides, I already told you that we are not allowed to bring servants, right? Yes, but... Trust me, Lifa. I can take care of myself. I'm stronger than I actually look. Adira assured her as she clasped Lifa's hands on hers. The latter could only sigh in submission and nodded her head. Although her mistress says that, she still cannot take away the worry deeply rooted in her system. She's always attracted trouble wherever she went and that was enough to make Lifa be constantly on her toes. Her class was about to set out in different carriages arranged according to nobility rank. When she was about to board the carriage assigned to her, she noticed another person was already in there. Weren't we separated by gender? Seeing as it was only me and Triton who were from ducal families, I should have been able to monopolize this carriage. Did the arrangement change? The curtains were down so she couldn't make out the face of the person. Sensing that she hesitated to board the post chaise, a hand reached out to her, probably wanting to assist her up. When she still didn't move, a cool voice suddenly spoke from inside, Don't worry, it's me. Raising a brow at this familiar voice, she tried calling the name of the person that first popped in her head, Casey. Yes. Feeling delighted, Adira quickly grabbed his offered hand and finally climbed up. She sat beside Kasimi before feeling annoyed at not seeing his face clearly because of the curtains and reached out to open it. Kasimi, shocked at her sudden approach, leaned away too abruptly that he knocked the side of his head on the wood so hard it produced a loud pop. Adira didn't expect his sudden jerky movement and stared at him, wide-eyed, holding his throbbing head and sporting a faint blush. She finally couldn't hold it in and burst out in laughter intensifying the blush on Casimir's otherwise empty face before he turned away from her. Oh my god, Casey. Ha ha. That was loud. Are you okay? She said in between her lively laughter before carefully feeling for the spot Casimir bumped his head. He remained silent and let Adira touch his head. He was unexpectedly enjoying it. 
Maybe hitting his head and embarrassing himself for a while was worth it. Is it still painful? She asked gently, eventually reeling in her mirth. Millimeter. He nodded while glancing at her warm and happy dark silver eyes. Come here. Adira told him and cupped his cheeks while gently pulling his head down lower than hers and started blowing on it with a childish chant, pain, pain fly away. Please don't hurt my baby. Feeling his stare on her, she blushed at the chant too childish for her image and quickly ranted an excuse. My mother always does that and it miraculously erases the pain. I don't know if it'll work for you but it always does for me. It works. Kasimi smiled softly at her. Ah. Oh. The danger of this smile is really off the charts. You're the most dangerous out of all them after all. Notes. Asterisk if you notice Iris names are all from flowers. Poisonous ones. I don't have to explain that further, right? Sure, you're not. After arriving on the compound owned by the campus, situated close to the great forest of Koth, everyone went to their assigned rooms to unpack their things, settle down and rest. They were given the rest of the day for themselves, fortunately. They had two to three people sharing the same room and Adira picked the shorter end of the stick. She shared hers with the last person she wanted to share the room with, Iris. Hello. Good afternoon, Lady Silveris. I am Iris Amaryllis Calmia Latifolia. A pleasure to meet you. She announced herself the moment she saw Adira sitting by the window, enjoying the tea life a packed for her, and curtsied. Hello. I'm Adira. A pleasure to meet you as well, was her curt reply. No, honestly, I don't want to ever be acquainted with you. Adira tried to smile but it came off awkward and cold. So she didn't let it linger and raised her cup up to partly hide her face from the other person. I am so lucky to be able to share the room with you, Lady Adira. I really look up to you. You're like a role model for every noble lady, though I am a fake one. She started chattering and sounded sad at the tail of her sentence. Wanting nothing to do with her at all, Adira remained silent. She didn't want to befriend her and she also didn't want to offend her. The nobility seems so sparkly and grand if you look at it from outside but when you're actually living in it, I realized it's harder to survive in this kind of society. Hey, Lady Adira, how do you do it? How can I be as elegant as you? She started to probe with glittering amber eyes and it took every bit of Adira's willpower not to leave the room. She really didn't want to stay anywhere near this girl. Every time she does, a dull pain from the shoulder that she stabbed from her previous life starts to annoy her. Lady Latifolia doesn't need to ask me. I'm sure you are well educated of the house of the higher society, right? Else, Baron Latifolia would not dare allow you to attend the coming-of-age banquet even if you have come of age. There was a brief change in Iris' expression before she quickly smothered it, albeit not escaping Adira's keen eyes, and smiled brightly like the rising sun. Of course, Lady Adira. Father was very strict on that, especially when it concerned manners. Ha ha. I almost don't get to visit places I regularly visit because of the lessons packed together in a day. Ah. You know, Lady Adira. One more thing, I'm sure you know that addressing someone of higher nobility with their name is considered as rude, right? She asked as softly and gently as she could. She didn't want to come off as haughty or tyrannical, after all. Ye yes. Iris replied after being interrupted with a reminder of the mistake on her manners, feeling humiliated. I can understand since you did not grow as a noble from childhood, but please, when speaking to someone else, try to mind how you address them. Not everyone is as lenient as me. This time, she smiled sweetly. Even if she doesn't like her at all. She also doesn't want to watch her get into trouble because of a mistake that she can help point out for her. After all, she was the role model of the noble ladies, right? Also, wouldn't that damage her own reputation when it is known that they are sharing a room yet the great lady Adira couldn't even correct her roommate's mistakes? I am certainly not baiting her, I swear. Secretly clenching the sides of her dress, Iris smiled brightly and nodded her head obediently. You're really not easy at all, huh, Adira? After seeing her nod at her words, 
Adira glanced outside her window when a white head entered her peripheral vision as he discussed something with the teacher in charge. She smiled to herself when she remembered their conversation just minutes before they arrived. So Casey, why are you with us? Don't the student council have jobs back at school? You're even a year ahead of us. I'm done. Came his short replies again. So you did your jobs ahead of time so you could accompany me? Millimeter. I didn't know cases really threatened with Triton. And here I thought you finally came into terms with it and you were really okay. Turns out you really had something else in mind, huh? Adira teased him and studied his reaction. She wanted to see him blush when he's shy again. Unluckily for her, Kasumi remained stoic and answered, I'm not. Yes, you're not. That's why you didn't arrange my carriage ahead of time, finished your job earlier and even went as far as going with me to the field trip. Sure, you're not. She laughed once again when she noticed the subtle changes in his expression, telling her all that she needed to know. She hit the bullseye. Then, I shall excuse myself, Lady Latifolia. I've got matters to attend. Adira spoke mysteriously and nodded slightly before walking past her. Iris, who was left in the room alone, gritted her teeth while she kept her fiery gaze on the closed door like Adira's figure still remained there. Just because you're the prince's fiancé. However, it won't be for long. She whispered. While on Adira's end, she walked out of the building her room was at and found Kasumi still talking with the teacher, seeming to exchange pleasantries with how the teacher was laughing and smiling at his every word. Adira sighed with a smile as she observed him. At least you should show a smile when complimenting someone, you know. She thought and was about to go a different route after seeing him busy when their eyes met. His gaze lingered on her for a moment and she waved her hand with a smile as a gesture of hello. Kasumi then promptly said a few words to the professor, bowed respectfully and walked towards her. Did I disturb you? Sorry about that. Poor Professor Hawkins, I robbed you from him, didn't I? No. What were you talking about anyway? He seemed very happy talking with a nice block like you. Sometimes, I really wonder how you convey your words to others without ever changing your expressions. At least, you should show a smile when discussing happy things, you know. Especially when you're happy. I guess I really am lucky to see a lot of his expressions, huh? She ranted at him while the latter only stared her contentedly. It didn't matter if she was scolding him a prince or complaining about random things about him. Listening to her voice calms and relaxes him. Her presence, alone, makes him happy. But I'm only happy when I'm with you. Oh my god. Can you please not speak long sentences only when you're trying to flirt? It makes you more dangerous. Adira, flabbergasted at his shameless flirting unconsciously or consciously done. She doesn't know, before she cleared her throat and looked the other way. A hey, anyway, tomorrow we're going to the forest Anne. He wasn't listening to her random raving anymore as he noticed the blush creeping all the way up to her ears and tittered quietly to himself. Cute. Notes. I updated two chapters cause I'm happy class has ended. Final exams were hell but I respawned now. Ho ho tilde. Thank you Tunajiju for the kind words and all readers for loving this story. You don't know how much it motivates me to write. Thank you. The apple of their eyes. Understand. These communication crystals that will be given to you are directly connected to our crystals. So if you find yourselves in danger, connect it to us. The professor ended his long speech about safety before students ventured into the forest. They formed groups of five among themselves and Adira, with her unlucky stars, got mixed with Triton as well as Iris and a girl classmate she remembered was Melissa Niveria, daughter of Baron Niveria. Also, needless to say, Kasumi, after pulling some strings behind everyone's back, belonged to Adira's group as well. Wherever she goes, he's there. Don't do anything reckless. Does everybody understand? After the professor's final reminder, Kasumi turned to Adira which caught her attention. What are you looking at me for? She asked with an aggrieved expression. Kasumi smirked at this and just shrugged his shoulders. Surely, even if he says it, she won't believe how much she attracts trouble it's almost unbelievable. I'm here anyway. He mused. 
Triton, who stood beside Adira just a few feet away, watched their interaction and felt annoyed with this white head that just pops wherever Adira is. I mean, why do you follow her wherever? Even to her field trip? Shouldn't you be doing your responsibilities as the student council's president back at the campus? Isn't this an abuse of your power? He thought to himself while keeping a glare to the back of that annoying pile of white hair. At first, he was incredibly surprised to see him alight from Adira's carriage and promptly held his hand to help her down. But now, he's just thoroughly annoyed at the thought that the chance to monopolize Adira during this field trip was suddenly dashed just like that by this irritating prince. Each group entered the forest at different established entrances and officially started their activity. Kasumi, who was not originally part of their class, tagged along and helped Adira's group. They were, by far, the most efficient and fastest group. Ah, there was cry from behind Adira that made everyone turn their heads and the moment she turned around, she saw Iris clinging to Kasumi. I'm... I'm sorry, please forgive me, your highness. I didn't notice the rock and tripped on it. She apologized bashfully, her cheeks dusted with red tint. Wow, how obvious can you be girl? Adira watched with an unbelieving and mocking gaze before she turned around again. Adira. Tritam called her name before he quickly corrected himself and said, I mean, Lady Silveris. Please watch your step. I can help you, if you don't mind. He smiled like the perfect gentleman that he is and offered his hand to help Adira step over a log. No. It's quite all right, Lord Dalriada. I can help myself. Adira politely rejected his offer, but he took it upon himself to take the initiative and held Adira's hands. It's fine to depend on others, me, sometimes. But I don't want to. Please stop doing things like this before you lose your hands. She groused in her head while feeling that undeniable chill from her back. Oh dear God. Please save our souls. Melissa, the only odd one out of their group, had been watching the two men, both of high status in looks and in reputation, each assisting a lady. She kind of pretty much figured out their setup after spending a few hours observing them. The prince and the lady Silveris was, without a doubt, an item. They were fiancés after all and it was widely known across the empire. Lord Dalriada, most probably has a thing for Lady Silveris and this Lady Latifolia obviously has a thing for the prince. You could pretty much guess that with how she acts around the prince always desperate to get his attention. She understood her though. No one in the entire empire can resist this prince's charms, you know. Now, the apple in the eyes of the empire's two top bachelors, Lady Silveris, is a little bit hard to figure out. Sure she's a lot closer to the crown prince but she's also friendly with Lord Dalriada, all thanks to the latter's constant advances. Is it just me? Or is it a little bit too chilly all of a sudden? They used their remaining time exploring the forest a bit, while not going too deep inside, after they finished their tasks. Adira, guarded by Kasumi all the time, literally like a shadow that followed her wherever she went, was waving vines out of the way when she felt something under her hand. Curious, she pulled the vines off, totally not caring about the small thorns on it, but the other cared. His visage distorted disapprovingly at the recklessness of this girl. What if that plant is poisonous? But, of course, he checked all the plants that surrounded them first while they roamed. Since he recognizes a lot of them, he made sure Adira didn't stray too close to anything dangerous or poisonous. So if she was near this vine, it meant it's relatively safe. He just didn't like seeing the small scratches on her skin and her not caring one bit. This girl. Wordlessly, he reached out and stopped her from ripping out more of the vines and held her hands. Casey, distracted from mercilessly riving out the vines, Adira looked up to his cold platinum eyes and immediately wondered why he was upset. Wow. Should I be happy how easily I can tell there's something wrong with him at a glance? Or should I be creeped out? Still not speaking anything to her, he removed his gloves off his hands and wore it on hers. The difference in the sizes of their hands was so adorable Adira couldn't help but smile. Are you upset with the scratches on my skin? Finally figuring out the reason for the change in his mood. She asked with a happy smile. 
There was a complicated look on his face as he watched her happy smile. He didn't know whether he should let her off because she's too adorable. Or should he be more upset since she didn't seem to regret anything at all? Thanks, Casey. I'm fine though but still, thank you. In the end, I'm very glad you came with me. Because if not for his efficiency, would we even be able to finish early and enjoy this much free time? He looked surprised with Adira's words and unconsciously patted her on the head. Seriously, please don't smile like that in front of other men. He silently pleaded in his heart and let her do whatever she wanted, while he watched over her contentedly. Well, this trick was something Adira learned from the years they spent together. Pacify him, act cute and voila, you get to do whatever you want. She learned that Casey was a lot like her brother and father in this sense. They were too weak with her cute antics. After she wore Cassini's gloves, she resumed to venting out her pent-up frustrations from having to deal with both Triton and Iris every day. Luckily, Cassini proposed that they explore individually but everyone must be within earshot so everyone will be able to act appropriately if something happens. This was like a silent warning to everyone else though, unbeknownst to the only oblivious Adira, not to interfere with their alone time. So they separated from the other three. After she successfully cleared the vines, she found this small tunnel-like hole, small enough to fit her, stretching deeper. This. Isn't this too familiar? She thought to herself and whipped her head around to study her surroundings. It looks just like it. The path she mistakenly stumbled into and found Heiser, but. I am not yet supposed to find Heiser at this point in time. If I remember it correctly, it should be a few months more. She pondered on it for a bit. Kasumi noticed the rustling had stopped and he checked what she was doing. She was there, a lady from a ducal family, down on all fours as she stared at something. His brows creased when he got curious as to what was so interesting in there that made her pause. It was a small hole that formed something like a tunnel. It was too small for anyone. But maybe, before he could even finish his thought, imagine his horror when she suddenly called in. Adira. He raised his voice but it was as if the lady couldn't hear him and she continued to call in. He rushed towards her but was too late. She's already deep into the hole, still crawling forwards. Adira. Got him knit. He cursed and tried to fit himself into the hole. But it was as if the hole was made solely for her and refused to accept anyone else. He jumped up to his feet and went back to get the other two girls. Maybe they can fit inside. But when he returned, with the perplexed girls in tow, the hole had mysteriously vanished. Kasumi was sure that it was the right place, he was never wrong especially when it's important, but the hole was not there anymore, as if it wasn't there in the first place. Damn it! Something specifically intended to lure Adira in, Rubia of the East, she continued to crawl forward, unaware of what was happening behind her, and finally came out into a clearing. It was absolutely breathtaking. The serenity, abundance of flowers and fruit-bearing trees and the glittering waterfalls all harmonized together into one perfect picture of a paradise. She glanced around. There were a few creatures that roamed around and, oddly, they were not afraid of her. More like, they were curious about how she was able to get in. It was the first human they ever laid their eyes on after so many years. Did I perhaps make a mistake? When I found Heisa, the place was burnt to the ground and it was nowhere as beautiful and as peaceful as this. It was absolutely horrific. She turned on her heel, deciding to crawl back out through the hole when it vanished so suddenly. Oh no. How do I go back? The animals heard her say and they turned to each other as if asking themselves if they should offer to help or not. There was a sudden rustling a movement from the corner of her gaze. Something that was unnaturally large that immediately grabbed her attention. It wasn't that she was scared of this big black scaly creature. What she was afraid of was disturbing its rest. Hi sir. She muttered when she first saw it but immediately knew it wasn't her beloved child when she saw its eyes. You're not him. Though you look lively and well, you're actually dying, aren't you? She asked the black dragon that was almost too identical to her own dragon. But this dragon's eyes weren't her Heisa's beautiful sapphire orbs but bloody ruby ones. 
They were majestic and beautiful. The dragon just stared at her and she thought that it was very rude of her to speak to this mighty creature without first introducing herself. Based on her memories of Hysa, dragons were very proud creatures. And they had every reason to be. Forgive me for being rude and not introducing myself first. I am called Adira Silveris, O oh mighty one. She curtsied low after speaking her introduction. The dragon seemed as if it was waiting for something more and remained motionless. It just kept on staring at her. Racking her brains for what to say, she blurted out, I really am truly sorry if I offended you in some way. I had a very dear partner that really resembled you so I mistook you for someone else. You, little one. How were you able to enter here? It finally spoke, though it was only through a telepathic link. The delight was very visible on her face as she smiled very brightly at finally hearing the dragon's voice. So smooth, mighty and powerful. I do not know as well. I only remembered that it looked familiar to me and I saw a hole that led me here but now it's gone and I don't know how to go back. Anyway, you're very beautiful, do you know that? Wow, these scales, they are as beautiful as Hysa's. And I thought Hysa was the most beautiful dragon. Completely straying off the matter at hand, Adira admired the beautiful dragon in front of her. It was so wonderful she almost wanted to take it back home with her. Without caring for formalities anymore, she looked up to her ruby eyes and asked as politely as she could, will you allow me to touch your scales? There was an incandescent light shining in her dollish dark grey eyes that the dragon couldn't refuse her and brought down her head in a relaxed manner to allow this little human to pet her in any way she liked. Adira, aware she was given permission, cheered in absolute glee and proceeded to her very important mission. She lightly ran her hands through her scales and reveled on its coolness. It wasn't the type that nipped at her skin but the type that cools her down after being under the summer heat. It was a different kind of comfort. Suddenly, she felt a contour different from the usual body of a healthy dragon. She could also feel a slight palpating beat from the mound. She gasped, are you? Are you pregnant? Yes. Oh my god. What about you? You're weak and dying right? Won't you die if you give birth? How will you safely deliver your child? Who will protect it? My child has chosen, little one. Chosen? How can it choose? It hasn't come out yet. Oh dear. What do I do? You don't need to worry about me. I will surely die after giving birth to this child. I just want to ask you a favor, little one. Anything. If it is within my power, I will do anything. Adira exclaimed without hesitation and looked at the dragon's eyes sincerely. The dragon could feel the heartfelt words of Adira's promise and could finally breathe in relief. Her child will be safe in her little hands. I, Rubia of the East, humbly ask you, Adira the human, to please take care of my child. You won't have any problems with the contract as this child has chosen you himself. Chosen. Me. Please, take care of him for me. After Adira gave her word, the dragon, Rubia, went into labor and later died as soon as she gave birth. She knew that whatever led Adira into her home, it was so someone can protect her baby after she left. The animals, who witnessed everything that transpired, all bowed their heads to their new ruler. Adira the human, won't you please grant our new king a name? She heard a voice in her head and didn't know which animal spoke to her. She just looked at the newborn dragon she cuddled in her arms. But, won't I be entering a contract if I give him a name? Is it really fine to rob this guy the right to choose his master? I, I won't give him a name yet. I want to wait a few more days before deciding to give him a name. She announced to all the animals and each agreed to her. It was what their new master wished anyway. So, who are they to say otherwise, right? However, Adira the human, who will protect us now? Queen Rubia has passed away and the barrier will most likely hold out for, at most, three days. That is not a cause for worry. I will maintain your barrier with my own mana. Adira smugly announced before pulling Case's gloves off her right hand and used the little dragon's talons to cut a wound on her hand and let her blood drip. 
A magic circle formed below her as she chanted a few spells that fortified the barrier for as long as she was alive and filled with mana. Everyone was grateful for her as they crowded around her and cheered her name. There was just something about this person that drew them in. They felt that as long as she was around, they will be safe. Resurrected the great demon lord. Adira returned normally after that and Kasumi was so relieved he crushed her in his embrace. A few students as well as the teachers, who were now gathered there, looked at the two of them and silently averted their eyes. They certainly did not need this dog food right now. Are you okay? He asked and Adira could hear the worry interlaced in them. Yes. I'm sorry for scaring you, Casey, but I need your help. I swear I will explain when we are alone but please help me hide this creature for now. She spoke in a low voice that only Kasumi could hear and turned slightly to the little black thing curled into a ball squished in between them. He stared at it then to Adira's dark grey pleading eyes and sighed in resignation. He can never go against her anyway. Now that Lady Adira has returned safe and sound, we should make haste and return to the compound before it gets dark. Really this guy, he only ever speaks long sentences when he's giving orders. Just like that was the common thought of all the people present there but knew better than to question the prince's words. Everyone was also aware of what happened to the ones that dared to make this black-hearted prince repeat what he said. Everyone filed out of the forest and went back to their respective rooms. Except, of course, Adira, who was dragged to Kasumi's quarters the moment they returned. Explain. Really? No are you hurt? Or where are you hurting? Or even were you scared by yourself? Nothing? She thought and stared at the man towering over her incredulously. She sighed and started narrating again from after she crawled out of the hole up to when she had to use her own mana to supply the forest creature's barrier after the dragon died. Thus, she gained access in and out the place. Kasumi, who now sat across her, shifted his gaze to the little black ball latched onto his Adira after listening to the whole story. Seriously, if this thing wasn't a baby, he'd have long ripped it off and tossed it out. But Adira would hate that. He could see the lady had already become attached to it. Are you planning to rear it? Adira thought for a while. Honestly, though it seemed illogical and completely baseless, this little dragon oddly reminded her of her Heiser. Still, that doesn't mean that she would go ahead and name it. She wanted to wait more. In a week, a lot of his features will be defined clearly, right? Maybe she'll have her answer then. Millimeter. She answered after a while. Now, let me see your hand. He suddenly strayed off their current issue and jumped onto this new one. She had thought she managed to casually and secretly smuggle that information into her accounting. He didn't say anything until now so she thought that he missed it. Turns out, it wasn't that simple to fool Kasumi. She obediently held out her clenched hand and hesitated to show him the wound. She got too carried away and made a larger gash than intended. Open it. Adira shut her eyes tight and left her life to fate. She'll just have to try everything she can to pacify this demon lord when he rises from hell. As soon as Kasumi saw the slit, he frowned along with that sudden drop in the temperature. The cold and dangerous glint in his eyes danced menacingly it was like Adira just successfully resurrected the great demon lord. Oh god. C.A. Casey. I.I.T.'s fine. Look. It has started to clot. It'll get better. Give it a week. Okay. Calm down, okay? She rushed trying to pacify him when he suddenly stood up and walked out of the room. Adira's nerves were very agitated as she shuffled on her seat endlessly, waiting for Kasumi to return and deliver her punishment. A few minutes after, he came back with a teacher in tow. It was the teacher that specialized in healing. What the? You can't abuse your power like this. How could you drag a teacher in here just for a small wound like this? She ranted in her head while she panicked and alternatively looked at the teacher and her fiancé trying to get her thoughts across him through her eyes. Pro Professor. I, I am fine. Casey, His Highness Prince Casimir's just being pie no, um. She suddenly trailed off and pursed her mouth into a thin line. It was fine if she spoke like that if it was only the two of them. 
But a teacher was also present and the way she's talking about the prince was both inappropriate and rude. While the teacher who remained silent had a thought, who said the prince was cold and uncaring, to personally come and pick me up to heal his little fiancé's wound. How sweet. Adira could only resign and held out her hand for it to be taken care of. She could only cry inside as she thought. I wonder if he purposely did this so I can't say otherwise. After everything was done and all, Kasumi led the teacher out and left Adira alone for a short while before returning, still very displeased and upset. Sorry, was all she could say and hang her head. The incision she made on her hand was nowhere to be seen now. Even the tiny cuts were gone too. Kasumi wasn't about to let her off so easily this time but he reconsidered after some while. She was just trying to help the creatures that were left with no one to protect them. Was he being too hard on her? Looking at her pitiful figure and the fact that it was still his fault for not being able to stop her in time, his heart mellowed out and he reached out to have her in his arms. It was now his turn to be comforted. He needed to reassure himself now that she was safe and sound. I'm really sorry, Casey. I should have taken care of myself better. I'm really sorry for worrying you like that. Millimeter. Are you still mad at me? Breaking off their hug momentarily to look at her sad little eyes, he brought his lips down to her head before softly answering her, no. Maybe I should keep her within my line of sight at all times from now on. Snuggling into his embrace, the remaining frost that solidified have finally melted as he felt his adorable fiancé settle comfortably in his arms. Just like a needy little cat. Everything was perfect. Adira was in his arms. She was safe. She was in his arms. He's finally calmed down. And she was in his arms. It was perfect until the little black bull woke up and whipped his tail, smacking it repeatedly on Kasumi's arms, clearly telling him to take his paws off his mother. Damn. Another one? Notes. Updating two chapter calls why not? I'm happy for all the kind words I received and all the votes. It's not much but I appreciate you all very much. I hope you are having fun reading this. Special mention to Kana underscore Haratim, Yahoo is my life, Crescent Step and Tuna Jiju for mass commenting. LOL I was shocked when I saw the notifs. Thank you my lovelies. Exo. Am I the father? After Kasumi was finally pacified under great efforts from Adira he walked her back to her room. They figured that the little dragon should remain in Kasumi's quarters to avoid anyone from finding it. Since Kasumi, alone, occupied the room, Adira was relieved. Isn't this just like being divorced parents and agreeing to let the child stay at your place for a while? Adira mused randomly as they walked back to her room. Kasumi felt strange after hearing her words. He was upset and happy at the same time. He stopped on his tracks and Adira noticed this. She also stopped and turned to him with a curious gaze. What's wrong? We won't divorce. Seriously, you're upset about that? It was just a joke, Casey. Don't take it too hard. It was just like an, hmm, analogy. She flustered. She just pacified him by desperately acting cute and harmless for how many hours? He cannot be upset again. Then, am I the father? What? Little Black's father. Um. He's not my or your son, okay. He's a dragon, okay. Please stop scaring me, Kasumi Athanasius Rosen Vasilis. So sure, Adira answered, unsure what Kasumi's on now. Afraid of upsetting him again, she agreed although a bit irresolute. Kasumi, fortunately, didn't argue with her tone and instead smiled happily. It was different from the kind of smiles she's been seeing so far. This one looked just like the happiness of a father thankful for his wife for giving him a child. Is he serious? Well, I'm here. Thank you for sending me back, Casey. She said after remaining silent and not daring to look at Kasumi's smile. He only nodded his head but wasn't walking away. He seemed to wait for her to go in. To hurry it up, so she can leave his piercing happy gaze, she hurriedly knocked on the door. A few knocks later, Iris, on her nightdress, came to open the door. She looked like Adira disturbed her sleep. Her hair was sticking into a mess of bed hair. The moment her eyes saw Adira, 
there was a hidden annoyance in them before greeting her. Adira only said a brief apology before once again turning to the man behind her. Thank you, your highness. Adira quickly changed her words and tone into that of an aloof lady, being under Iris' eyes, as she gave Kasimi her farewell and curtsied. Kasimi's gaze went past Adira briefly and saw that infamous lady who had that unique pink hair and immediately understood the change in her tone. He only nodded his head and finally turned on his heels to return to his own room. Iris, shell-shocked at the prince seeing her in her embarrassing look, opened and closed her mouth a few times, wanting to say something but couldn't while watching his back walk further and further away. They even met eyes. Does that mean that he's interested in me? I mean, even with Adira in front of me, he looked past her and didn't even reply to her after seeing me, right? Atilda what do you know? Even the great Lady Silverus can't match up to me in the prince's eyes. I told you, it won't be for long, right? I'm really sorry for disturbing your rest. I forgot my keys when we went to the forest this morning, you see? Adira apologized again. Even if she doesn't like her, it's rude to disturb a person's rest. Iris shook her head and smiled at Adira genuinely as she assured her that it was fine. It's fine, Lady Silveris. I don't mind it at all. But wouldn't it trouble you if the head madam discovers you're still out this late at night? She asked, seemingly very concerned and worried for Adira's matters. Of course, Adira knew that aside from her uncanny genuine smile, nothing that followed after that was authentic. While she didn't know what made her smile like that to her, she kind of had this feeling that it wasn't anything good. She couldn't be thinking of making trouble for me through the head madam, could she? To avoid her from thinking of going that way, Adira answered, of course no. I was with the prince for official business and his highness could vouch for that. I'm sure the head madam would understand. If you're thinking of using Casey against me, then I'll just use him against you as well. Adira thought and walked past her to retire in her bed. Pacifying the great demon lord was exhausting and they have an early activity tomorrow, so she can't waste another drop of energy just to deal with this woman. Morning activity went fast all thanks to Kasami and Tritan competing with each other blatantly while the girls did what they could do and they were given the rest of the day again. Kasami invited Adira back to his room since a certain wild animal was throwing a tantrum and refused to eat anything Kasami gave him. Upon smelling the familiar scent of his mother, the little dragon flew to his mother's arms the moment Adira opened the door. Hello, little one. Casey told me you didn't eat anything at all today. That's no good, you know. Little children should eat well so they'll grow strong. Adira cooed the little dragon like it really was her son and giggled when it snuggled in her arms. She fed it with the meat Kasami offered him a while ago and, different to his reaction with Kasami, he happily ate the food. That's my boy. Eat well and then grow well, okay. Kasimi, who sat across them, eyed the dragon displeasingly. A little one just snatched his fiancée from him and he can't do a thing about it. But it's all well and good since this way. He had every reason to invite Adira to his room. He gets to spend an extended period of time with Adira and that was enough to let this little black get away with snatching his fiancée's attention. What's his name? Adira briefly peeled her eyes away from the little creature in her hands and turned towards Kasimi. She turned back to the little black dragon and raised it up high. She studied his features and noticed a few changes. His once grey orbs were finally showing a startling sapphire shade and faded golden lines crawled on the sides of his body. Her eyes glittered and smiled with undeniable radiant happiness at finally figuring out the dragon's identity. It was indeed her son. Ha hi sir, hi sir, your name will be hi sir, my baby. She announced and hugged the little dragon in her arms, who was also happy with his name. It didn't matter what his name was as long as it was his mother who named him. Hi sir, ha, huh? Kasami whispered and watched the brilliant happiness on Adira's face. Infected with that happiness, he smiled as well. He walked close to them and squatted in front before petting hi sir's little head nestling so happily and snugly in his mother's arms. Hello, hi sir. I'm your father. Notes. Ha ha. Sorry for the Star Wars reference. Does anyone here like Star Wars? 
I am so honored and happy to hear your words. Thank you for the flood comments Kana underscore Haratine and Tuna Jiju. You're the best. Please continue to give love and support to our Adira Kasimi. Touch me not. The next few days were the same. The boys compete with each other and the girls do what they can. They finish earlier than the rest and they were allowed to enjoy their time after. However, on the fifth day, Adira came down with a fever. It was partly because she had a weak body prone to sickness and partly also because of Hysa and the barrier eating away her mana too much. Giving Hysa a name took away a lot of her reserves. It slipped out of her mind that she had been constantly maintaining a barrier so she had a limited spare. But, she didn't regret it. Naming Hysa made him grow a lot and since he looked well and healthy then it didn't matter if he took a whole lot. After naming him, his features were now more prominent than before and she was sure now that she did meet Hysa a little bit earlier than intended and even got the chance to briefly meet his mother. She was one beautiful dragon. At first, she wanted to at least attend the activity set for the day but Kasumi strictly told her not to. He was so firm with his decision he even made her rest on his quarters for the time being since it'd be better if the son accompanies the mother more like Gartha. Mother in his absence. That day, their work was the slowest. The teachers were so worried and confused that they called Melissa over. What's wrong with your team? Why is it too slow this time? A lot has finished their tasks already and yours just barely made it to half. I'm sorry professor. His Highness and Lord Dalriada seems to be down in the dumps today. Maybe because Lady Silveris isn't around. Lady Silveris? What's Lady Silveris got to do with any of this? Afraid they would misinterpret her words, Melissa quickly answered, No, no. It's not like what you think. Lady Silveris is not forcing them or anything. They've been competing for her attention lately since every time His Highness finishes early, she makes something for him like a cookie or something. Maybe Lord Dalriada also wanted some. It can't be. His Highness, Prince Kasimi, cannot be simply doing these things just for a cookie. Maybe he's onto something. The professor mused. But he's really doing it just for Lady Adira's cookies. Other than that, then it's for him to see her smile. Melissa thought and looked over to the sluggish boys. Kasimi's been doing Adira's share of the work and today's not any different. It's just that, he's worried about her and cannot focus on what he was doing. Triton, on the other hand, can't find the motivation to work. Adira wasn't around and so he cannot hear her laugh, her giggle or just simply hear her voice and watch her smile. There were even rare occasions where they'd even converse like simple friends. And that simply makes him happy beyond words. While Iris was being herself, wasting time sending signals to Kasumi who didn't even know what she was doing. His mind was entirely elsewhere all the time. After who knows how long, they finally finished and Kasumi, who was about to return to his quarters, passed by a meadow and suddenly heard a high-pitched giggle. He didn't want to turn but it was so creepy he feared it might disturb Adira if it came a bit closer or should it increase its volume. He figured he should drive whatever it was away. When he turned his head, he met a pair of amber eyes looking at him, with the flower wreath she just finished making resting on her head, before smiling shyly, just like a touch-me-not plant. She climbed up to her feet and curtsied elegantly and looked up to him with glittering amber orbs. Greetings, your highness. I didn't expect I would see you here. In truth, she'd been waiting at that spot for who knows how long just to stage this kind of setup. She knew that to get to his quarters, he needed to pass through there. And what better and more romantic plot to stage than incidentally meeting there, right? You shouldn't stay here, was Kasumi's cold voice and even then she still smiled happily and brightly. In her mind, it translated to this, it's cold out here. You shouldn't let yourself get cold. Um, thank you for worrying about me, your highness. Also, Thank you for always helping us out. Although it wasn't compulsory for you, you still lent a helping hand. Thank you so much. Millimeter. Oh um. Your Highness, I made some cookies. I was thinking of sharing it with Lady Silveris but I couldn't find her. Maybe she went out with Lord Dalriada. What is this woman talking about? 
Isn't Adira in my room? Did she not tell her? But please don't worry about it, your highness. I know that Lady Silveris and Lord Dalriada are just friends. Anyway, I'll give this to you. I hope you'll like it, your highness. She cried and then handed out the cookies she baked all night, trying again and again till she perfected it and picked the best out of the batch. Kasumi looked at the little pink pouch that contained the cookies and took it off her hands. Iris' face brightened up as soon as she felt the pouch floating off her hands and saw Kasumi checking them. She noticed him enjoying the cookies Adira made so tried to bake ones that looked like it but made a slight twist. Instead of it being just chocolates on the surface, she placed nuts on it with the chocolates. Thank you, Kasumi briefly said and turned around but not before saying. You should return now. She visibly blushed after hearing Kasumi and smiled bedazzlingly. She knew the prince cared for her. Adira's only feeling herself thinking the prince was into her. What the I thought it would be a challenge to pull the prince away from her. But it turns out she does not have a tight hold on him. Huh. Well, it's not my fault if he suddenly flies out of your grasps, okay. Iris thought as she watched the retreating back of Kasumi and turned to head back to her own room. She was very happy with the turn of events and she skipped all the way back. While on Kasumi's end, he opened the door to his room and found Adira still sleeping with Heisa in her arms, curled in his sleeping position. The moment the door creaked open, Heisa opened his eyes and looked at the newcomer before closing his eyes again. Not caring at all. So it's just him. I can tell you're thinking that, little Heisa. Kasumi smiled gently before walking closer and tried to feel Adira's temperature. She looked a lot better than this morning so she should be fine. Did she drink and eat properly, Heisa? He asked. Little Heisa looked up to him and nonchalantly nodded his head before sleeping back again. Did she drink her medicine? Again, little Heisa only nodded his head perfunctorily. Since my son guarded his mother properly. I have something for you. It's not as good as your mother's but it should be fine. Here. Kasumi happily played as Heisa's father. The latter could care less since all that mattered to him was his mother but when he heard Kasumi saying that he properly guarded his mother, he perked up and looked at Kasumi happily. He chuckled lightly before handing the sweets to Heisa and the latter gobbled it in less than 10 seconds. Was it good? He asked. Heisa only turned his head and curled back into his sleeping position as if not hearing anything. I guess only your mother's cookies can make you happy as well, huh? Notes. Thank you for the flood voting and, as usual, for the flood comments. It made me very happy first thing in the morning. You guys are the best. When she's my wife. Adira woke up in the middle of the night and saw Kasumi uncomfortably sleeping on the sofa and Heisa snuggling in her arms. She looked at the prince guiltily and adjusted the covers on him so that he was at least warm. She was feeling better after sleeping most of the day and recovered her drained mana. She was fine to go back to helping tomorrow. Adira woke up earlier than Kasumi and already prepared everything for him so as soon as he woke up, it was Adira's lively beaming sunshine smile that greeted him. Good morning Casey. Rise and shine, your highness. She teased and pulled him up. The latter just allowed her to do whatever she wanted. He missed this lively side of hers even if it was only a day. She pushed him inside the bathroom and she got busy preparing all sorts of stuff, like breakfast or his suit, just anything. She wanted to somehow repay him for helping and taking care of her when she got sick. When Kasumi finished, he walked out of the bathroom only in robes and Adira was more than blissful than she could voice out before she averted her eyes blushing all the way to her ears, and handed him his suit. I I made breakfast for you and he heisa. Um. You should. Um. Eat it after changing and um. Maybe I should go now and let you do your thing. She stuttered and abruptly took a step away from this dangerously gorgeous specimen before she loses it and pounces on him. Kasumi, on the other hand, greatly amused with the effect he elicited from Adira, grabbed her arm and spun her barreling back into his chest and sniggered. So forward, Lady Silverus. This is dangerous. His voice sounds so close in my ears. Breathe in, breathe out Adira Silverus. Control yourself. He smells so good. God help me. 
It was Casimir's turn to tease her and damn was it effective. She blushed the deepest shade of red that she debated on how to hide her tomato-like face. Does she dive into Casimir's chest? Or run away? Ding! Dive, I mean, run away it is. Adira pulled back so suddenly and fluidly before bolting out of Casimir's room like an athlete vying for championship. Leaving a chuckling, happy and very satisfied Casimir. Casimir turned to Heisa, who was giving him the stink eye, and shrugged his shoulders, seeming to understand what the little dragon was thinking about. He only gave the little one a look that said, What can I do? Your mother's too cute. Is this how it'll feel like when she becomes my wife? Interesting. Kasumi thought to himself before letting his eyes roam on the things Adira prepared for him and felt his heart melt at the homely feel Adira gave him. Heisa didn't like Kasumi placing his paws on his mother but he also cannot retort to what his looks meant. His mother, indeed, was too adorable. So he flew away while clenching in his mouth the meat Adira prepared for him and settled on the sheets that retained his mother's scent. It'll be another long day of him waiting for his mother to return home. Today, their team was back into their full vigor and everyone was very efficient. Save for Adira, who had the lightest work load out of everyone. Even lighter than the prince himself. And Iris, who was still being herself. Why was Adira's load light? Well, Triton and Kasumi took all of her work load and she was left with nothing to do. The professors, who cannot argue with Prince Kasumi pampering his fiancée and the Lord Dalriada for being helpful, let her do the attendance and keeping record so at least she had something to do and she won't die of boredom. I mean, who would even dare offend and go against the wishes of the two heirs that sat at the top of the hierarchy, right? Triton, who was taking a short break, casually strode to Adira and squatted on the grass beside her. How are you? Are you fine? I heard you had a fever yesterday and had to stay at the prince's quarters. Did he do anything to you? My, Lord Dalriada. His highness is a highly respectable man so he won't do things that are against the moral and political laws. As for my health, yes I have made a full recovery. I thank you for your concern. Adira politely answered him and defended Kasumi while she was at it. Can you at least call me Triton when it's just the two of us? He suddenly asked that surprised Adira so much she forgot her prepared speech to retort to him. He was looking at her with undeniable sincerity she never once saw in his eyes during her past life. She was in a daze when a high-pitched voice snapped her out successfully and grabbed her attention. She turned to it and found Iris skipping towards Kasumi and giggling like an addict hitting helium as well. She was saying random words and although it wasn't visible on the latter's face, he looked incredibly annoyed and cold. Say, Triton. His name finally rolled off her tongue and an absolutely happy smile graced his handsome face before answering her almost immediately. Yes, Adira. Have you spoken with Lady Latifolia at all lately or ever for that matter? She had been curious about this. The iris from her past life stuck onto Triton, the man that she was head over heels madly in love with, like a leech. Very much like how she was now sticking onto Kasumi, who she was currently involved with. No, I don't think so. I don't know her all that well and aside from casual greetings, I've never spoken to her at all. Why? Triton who was happy to hear Adira taking interest in his relationships with the ladies from other households, answered with all honesty. Hem. Even during this field trip, she hasn't spoken to you. Yes, that's weird. She murmured and it didn't slip Triton's magically enhanced hearing. He was incredibly joyful that they were finally holding a conversation without those stuffy formality and he got to spend a bit of time with her without that old boy. Sticking his nose in. It also seemed as though Adira was very concerned with his and Lady Latifolia's relationship that his head was already running at unimaginable speeds faster than when he was taking exams into analyzing what her words meant. Could she be interested in me but was just concerned with Lady Latifolia's relationship with me? She doesn't have anything to worry though. She's the only woman I have ever pursued like this. There really is nothing going on between Lady Latifolia and me, Adira. I swear. 
Adira looked at him and was wondering what was running through his head that made him suddenly pledge like that and decided to only brush it off with a smile. It seems as if, in both past and present lives, Iris just really had a personal answer with her that it didn't matter who she was linked to. If it was Triton, then she'll seduce Triton. If it's Casimir, then she'll seduce him. Ah, seriously. What is wrong with this woman's head? She continued to think to herself while watching Iris wriggle like a worm and coyly brushing against Casimir's arms. She really knows her ways, huh? Notes. Thanks to Anzu Anri for the comment and for the others who voted. Love you. Happy 1.3k readers. Love love love. Please continue giving lots of love to our Adira Casimir. A damsel in distress. While Iris was busy coquettishly advancing with the iceberg, aka Casimir, she saw in her peripheral view the warm atmosphere between Adira and Triton, who were sharing a conversation. To make Adira lose favor more, she immediately pulled a bothered look and turned to Casimir. Um, your highness, I was just wondering how your relationship with Lady Silverus is nowadays. I mean, I do not mean to pry or anything but lately. She seems to be a lot closer to Lord Dalriada. Of course, it could only be me but is there something between them? Are your relationship still smooth sailing? After hearing the lady's worries and seeing that vexed look on her face, he shifted his attention to Adira and Triton engaging in a light-hearted conversation and ugliness immediately bubbling up inside him. Annoyed with the man, who was using his break as an excuse to approach his wife Ehem, soon to be he stalked close to them. Adira, noticing that dark aura from the corner of her eyes, had a vague idea regarding what was being instilled inside this possessive and paranoid prince's brain again. Really, she will take advantage of literally anything, huh? Hello, Casey. Are you tired? Want me to take over? Adira beamed happily like she couldn't see the dark aura around the great demon lord. Casimir's mood just plummeted more and turned the atmosphere as chilly as winter when the other didn't even care nor try to pacify him or what. She just sat there like nothing was wrong. No. I don't want to interrupt. Glad you know you're interrupting something, your highness. Triton spoke with contempt and sarcasm. He glared at the prince that towered over him while he remained in his sitting position. He refused to back down despite their difference in status. Kasumi was already upset and being annoyed by this blonde bastard, who always tactlessly makes a move on his fiancé even under his nose, was making it worse. He swore he really wanted to slug him right then and there. If only he wasn't a prince and he wasn't in front of Adira. The latter could palpate the brewing storm and electrifying friction between these two powerhouses and aptly intervened before they blew up. She was afraid of them making a scene especially since they both were at the top of the hierarchy. C.A. Casey, calm down. I was just asking Triton a few things regarding my absence yesterday. Triton, Casimir repeated and Adira immediately regretted it. Now, Casimir was looking even more murderous without bothering to hide it anymore. How many barrels of vinegar asterisk did this man gobble? C.A. Casey. Instead of entertaining some insignificant person, why don't you go back to my room and take care of our son? Everyone present immediately stopped what they were doing and whipped their heads towards their awkward triangle. There were three things that made them completely freeze. First was the brewing fight and the drastic drop in temperature that chilled everyone to the deepest of their core and the Lady Silverus was bravely standing amidst of that. Hail Lady Silverus! Second was the prince that seldomly spoke sentences and kept his words at the barest minimum spoke a total of 20 words in one breath. Hail Lady Silverus. Third, and might be the thing that really made them freeze solid, was his highness words. The content in that sentence was basically just too stupefying, everyone was practically flawed with just one simple sentence. Bow down to the greatest Lady Silverus. What? Triton who was obviously one of the most stunned, was the first to slightly collect himself barely able to utter a simple word. C.A. Your Highness, what kind of joke are you spouting? Ha ha, you really have a great sense of humor, ha? Huh? I never expected that from you, Your Highness. 
Adira spoke louder than needed to clear everyone's probably insane ideas after hearing Kasumi's loud and clear announcement. She was desperately sending him some signals that hopefully he won't make things more difficult than it needs to be. Oh oh. It was. It was a joke. Everyone spoke in hushed whispers, still doubtful. It wasn't the prince's character to joke about something like that. In fact, it wasn't in his system to crack a joke at all. C.A. Casey, please take back what you said. Please think about what will happen to Heiser if they start investigating. I beg you. Adira pleaded, not for her reputation to be saved but for Heiser's existence to be kept a secret. She knew what kind of danger it will bring to Heiser should people know of his presence. She experienced it from her past life and she was willing to do anything just to prevent that from happening again. Even kneeling down on all fours right then and there. Her pride was nowhere as important as Heiser's safety. Please, if you really regard him as your son. Kasumi looked at Adira's pleading eyes and although he was still upset with how friendly she was with the Dalriada's heir, he cannot help but feel bad when he saw her panic-stricken mean. He was also slightly aware that he had gone too far with his enmity with the Dalriada heir and almost jeopardized his own son's safety. Reaching out to take her in his arms, he whispered an apology and patted her head. I'm sorry for taking a joke that far. He said in a louder and monotonous voice and everyone immediately had a look of understanding. Seriously, they can never guess whether their prince was joking or not with that emotionless face of him. However, there were a few who still had doubts in their hearts. They could clearly see Adira's panic when she heard what Kasumi said. Could it be? They did have a child. Triton, who sat close to them, thought and felt as though his heart constricted so much he could hardly breathe. While Adira, who was being comforted and pampered by Kasumi, saw how Iris' expression gradually turned ugly the more Kasumi coddled her. In a hunger for immediate vengeance, she hid a smirk before quickly replacing it with an inconsolable look and said in a loud voice, loud enough that it would reach the hateful woman's ears. Your Highness, I don't know what agitated you like that and even went as far as that, but should you really listen to such unreliable sources? As your fiancé, I am very hurt to know that you are doubting me, when I am clearly loyal to you, just because of some insignificant person's whispers. Sometimes, it leaves me to wonder how deep your love and faith is to me. Since we would be wed sooner or later, should you really trust someone else rather than me, your fiancé? After Adira's short speech and her minute talent show of tearing up, showcasing her damsel in distress act everyone that listened turned to the last lady the prince was, with. A simple speech from her, even without dropping a name, was able to immediately turn the situation around and implicated Iris in an instant. How could it not? The Adira in everyone's eyes was as innocent and lovely as a snow-white lily. How could this lady betray her fiancé as what the other said? Could it be? Yes, it should be. Isn't it obvious with how she sticks to the prince all the time? How shameless. How could she say that? Poor Lady Silverus. She was wronged like that. If it were me, of course I'd cry as well. People were now discussing amongst themselves but nothing was entering Casimir's ears. All he heard were Adira's words. He was stuck on her words. It pierced his heart painfully to hear that the woman he loved so much was having those thoughts. How could he have done such a thing? To think that he was personally hurting her. I'm sorry. Kasumi whispered and Adira looked up. Ah, this should be enough. As long as you know that you shouldn't trust her too easily then it's. I'm sorry, Adira. He spoke louder this time and people turned silent again. I'm very sorry. Please. Forgive me. I don't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry. Kasumi repeatedly said and his hold on Adira tightened even more. His pride was long forgotten by then as he repeatedly apologized to Adira. Yo your highness. IIT's fine already. As long as you will trust me, then it's fine. Adira flustered. She didn't expect this effect on Kasumi. She didn't know it hit him really, really hard. She only wanted to stage a little play to spite Iris. She didn't mean to make him feel bad. Everyone was shocked and were watching at them with pure amazement. The great black-hearted prince, the prince that didn't care for anything. 
the infamous cold, unmoving mountain of the empire, had apologized. All hail the omnipotent Lady Adira Romeria Ir Silveris, tamer of the pernicious and cold-blooded first prince. Really, too many shocking events unfurled in front of them and this was the most shocking so far. To finally see this prince, with a pride as high as the highest mountain peak, finally cave into the Lady Silveris. Never in their life did they expect to hear the sincerest sorry roll out of the prince's mouth. Notes. Asterisk gobbling drinking vinegar meant being jealous. Thank you for all the votes and for adding the story into your personal lists as well as following me. It is such an honor. You guys are the best. Love love. Little family trip. After that incident, Kasumi just got worse. Whenever it concerned Adira or even when her name is simply mentioned, he refuses to trust anything and asks Adira instead. Adira felt it was gradually becoming annoying but she cannot do anything about it at this point. She caused it herself, anyway, so she's got no one to blame but herself. Kasi Tilda she stretched his name as she melted on his sofa with Heisa in her arms, slowly taking up all the little space she has in her flimsy little arms. Kasumi invited her to his room under the pretense of taking care of the annoying animal who always asks for his mother. But really, he just wanted her where he could see her. Millimeter? He raised his head from the urgent papers Roman sent to him. Something about it was due that day. Can I please go to the falls with Heisa? No. Why Tilda Tilda? Heisa will be with me. I can't go. So? I know very well you can't go with you buried in those urgent papers. Please, let us go, okay? Kasumi finally let go of the papers and sighed. He was having a headache because of this woman. How was he supposed to make her understand that he wants her to always be close to him or vice versa? Just play with Heisa here. But Kasi Tilda I wanna go out. It's stuffy here and humid. Heisa's scales won't be pretty under these conditions. He needs to cool down by the falls. And it's boring. I bet that's the real reason. Fine. He sighed in consent and turned back to the papers. He only needed to go over two more and he'll be done. Adira, after hearing Kasumi's green light to her request, beamed and shot up from the sofa like a spring suddenly brimming with life and energy again. Really? Did you hear that Heiser? Case is agreed. We can go play outside. Adira excitedly raised Heisa up and reiterated their agenda, already ignoring Kasumi. After I finish these two documents, Kasumi finally added, after briefly looking up and admiring her excited face, and doused cold water on their happy parade. Adira grumbled but didn't argue anymore. She was afraid that the more she argued then chances of them taking their own little field trip to the falls would plummet. So she had no choice but to play with Heisa while they waited for Kasumi to finish. Heisa, look, isn't it beautiful? Adira exclaimed and let Heisa fly to let his wings get some exercise out in the wild. It wasn't healthy to keep him cooped up in a room when he's supposed to be ruling the skies with his mightiness. Casey, hurry up. Kasumi, who insisted on going with them, followed behind and checked the place. He also placed necessary barriers while they were there. To avoid Heiser from being spotted, avoid potential threats from getting near and also to avoid intruders on ruining their little family trip. Seriously, we're going back tomorrow to that stuffy capital and I haven't had my fill of the nature because you kept restricting me from going near the forest again. She grumbled. Kasumi just patted her head and placed a chocolate on her mouth, a bribe to sway her mood when she was about to start another string of complaints again. Millimeter. This is sweet. Where'd you get this? Adira asked and savored the irresistible sweetness melting in her tongue. I made it, was Kasumi's simple reply and fed her more. Heisa, who just got back from a short round of flight practice, duff for the sweet Kasumi was feeding Adira and gave his father the displeased look. Almost as if saying, how dare you take an inch when I just went and flew one round? Oh baby, you also want chocolates? Adira asked as she looked at Heisa angrily munching, which she is blind to on the sweet from Kasumi. He got it from his mother. Kasumi commented and turned his gaze on Adira's vibrant and cheeky expression. She was genuinely happy to have come here. 
I should have taken her here a whole lot more. She wouldn't have thought of those nonsense if I gave her more attention. Casey, what's wrong? Noticing the slight sadness and guilt in his platinum orbs, Adira asked him. After her little show of grievance, casimir has been pulling this look a lot more often. He didn't reply and just shook his head softly and fed her more chocolates instead. When Heisa kept stealing the chocolates he fed Adira, he just resolved to giving Adira the pouch to eat it herself. Else, the little, yet not so little anymore, dragon will keep eating it. Are you still bothered about what I said before? Adira carefully asked. Kasumi just got sadder and guiltier when he heard Adira ask. Almost like a heart-wrenching reminder to his blunder and how he personally hurt his beloved fiancé. She felt so bad looking at Kasumi's new expression that although she did achieve something, and that is his complete trust on her and her alone, it was also at the cost of his conscience and this sadness. Adira walked closer to Kasumi and held his hand. He looked up to her clement ash grey smiling eyes and she fed him one of the sweets he made for her. Yummy, right? Case has been so good to me so I don't see a reason for him to be bothered so much by those words. You trust me, right? Then that's enough for me. She looked divinely beautiful as she said those words that Kasumi could feel the loud pitter-pat in his chest. There were not enough words to describe how arresting she was then that he could only hope to show what he felt through his actions as he pulled her in his arms. All his life, there was only one woman who had his unconditional trust and devotion and that was her, his lady Adira Ramiria Ear Silverus. He never gave this much of his heart to anyone, even his family. Nothing ever moved him till the rhyme accumulated over time and he couldn't feel for anything or anyone anymore. He only moved according to orders, just like a puppet, until he met her. From the moment he met her, to when he proposed to his father to be engaged to her, to when he purposely hid his status to get closer to her, to when he willingly and happily took on the role of being Heisa's father, everything was to tie her fate to him. He never thought that he would find someone he will love this much that it sent him both to heaven and hell. But, it was all worth it. Everything was worth for just a glimpse of her happy smile. You have all of my trust. He answered after a while after being pulled out of his thoughts by Heiser physically pulling on wherever he could pull, his arms, his legs, or even his suit. Adira beamed happily and Kasumi felt blissful for all these moments he gets to spend with her, and now with the addition of their son, Heiser. So I want to see little Case's Casanova smile again, okay. Adira said and Kasumi obliged without further ado and smiled his happiest, softest and warmest smile. A smile that simply showed his deep adoration for the lady in front of him. And while we're at it, I have a question. She changed issues after being healed and satisfied with that smile and her look turned serious. Kasumi Athanasius Rosen Vasilis, will you trust me with your life? Notes. Hi. This is a brief light moment for healing and happiness in their little family. Also, thanks to Movi for the flood comments. I had a lot of fun reading them, my dear. Thank you. Hope you all have fun. Already given you my life. Will you trust me with your life? Kasumi was silent after her question and there was nothing on his face. Adira couldn't tell what he was thinking about when he's like that. No. It sounds weird like that. I mean, it's not a trust me with your life wedding kind or what but the kind where you entrust your safety to me or something. She ranted while making weird gestures, flustering about how to make it sound more convincing and more understandable. Am I in danger? I mean, more than you? Not per se but I'm just asking. If that time comes, will you entrust your life to me? Kasumi was still silent about this question that she didn't know what to do anymore. What was making him silent? What is barring him from answering her? What's his gripe? On a desperate measure to have full control of that moment, his assassination, Adira hurriedly added, if you entrust your life to me, I'll entrust mine to you. That way it'll be fair. Don't you think so? She tried to make it sound more light-hearted just to get his consent. She needed to get his word on it no matter what, if she wants to save him. Because when that time comes, she'll do anything just to save him. Not even Kasumi, himself, can stop her. 
After watching the seriousness on her ashen eyes, Kasumi slowly nodded his head, careful not to let it show on his face how eager he was to exchange his life's rights with hers. It was more than fair. It was everything he could ask for. Even if it wasn't only in the case of danger, he was very willing to lay his life onto her hands. The only reason why he didn't answer her the first time was, shouldn't it be obvious already? She's already got this much hold on me and she's still asking about it. From the moment I asked to be engaged to her, I've already given her my life. Adira finally let out a small sigh of relief. Now, with this, she'll have to monopolize him before the assassination attempt happens. Because she never cared for any man from her past life, due to her obsession and undying devotion to Triton. She never got to know the Empire's first prince, Prince Kasumi Athanasius. It was only when news of his assassination circulated amongst the Empire and his funeral, which higher nobles was required to attend, did she know of his existence. But even then, she didn't care. So she's got this dilemma right in front of her. She never knew who was behind the assassination nor who did it. Was it someone with unparalleled strength and skills to be able to best the Empire's first prince known to be a prodigy? Or was it someone who was close to him and betrayed him? The Hunter Trap route was unimaginable since based on this Kasumi that she knew. He doesn't know much on romance or flirting aside from when he does it to her, nor does he care about it. So it all boils down to, who did it? Who was strong enough to kill Kasumi? Adira was having this serious and dark thoughts in her mind that she didn't notice Kasumi's sharp gaze plastered on her. He loved to admire different expressions on her face but this particular one she was using right now, oddly didn't seem all that interesting to him and so he lightly poked at the scrunched skin in between her eyebrows. Adira snapped out of her thoughts and turned to Kasumi. She remembered that they were still in the middle of their outing so what she did was rude. I'm sorry, I just had some thoughts bothering me but it's all fine now. As long as I have both you and Heisa, then everything will definitely be fine. She said as she tried to reassure Kasumi, but came out as if the one she was trying to comfort was herself. It'll be fine, Kasumi said and placed a warm kiss on her forehead making Adira relax almost instantly. Yes, there was no use worrying about it for now. They were already traveling back to the capital the same way they traveled to their campsite. It was already late in the afternoon and Adira's carriage was the last one to depart. Well, because they can't load Heisa with everyone still there. The coachman was sent on a short errand as they were loading Heisa so he didn't see him. Heisa was sleeping on Adira's lap while Adira was swaying back and forth after falling asleep. Kasumi, the only one who remained awake pulled Adira and let her rest on his shoulders. They were just like a typical couple with their little pet they treat as their child. Yet, they were the most beautiful typical couple you could find. When Adira opened her eyes, it was already dark outside and their carriage had stopped. Heisa was still on her lap, asleep, and she was on Kasumi's shoulders. She slowly sat up straight and her stirring woke up Kasumi who slept leaning on her. They had already arrived outside the Silverus mansion for some time now and though the servants had unloaded Adira's luggages, Kasumi told them to leave for a while and let Adira have her rest. He didn't want to wake both her and Heisa since they slept so peacefully and soundly. And after observing and just watching them sleep for a while, he didn't notice he, himself, had fallen asleep. I'm sorry, I slept most of the way. It must have been hard on you. Adira apologized meekly, embarrassed about sleeping on Kasumi's shoulders. It's okay. It was Kasumi who made her sleep on his shoulders, after all, so it was definitely okay. Besides, he loved it anyway. I'm... I'm gonna go now. Thank you for sending us back first and please take care on your journey back. She said with a bow and moved, causing Heisa to wake up and yawn. Kasumi felt reluctant to let her leave. She was just a couple of steps away when they were back at the campsite but now, they'll be separated for miles again. He reflexively caught her hand and made her stop. Adira turned to her hand before turning to his platinum orbs that weren't too visible as he was partly hidden within the shadows. What is it, Casey? Hurry back to school. 
They were given a few days off and were allowed to return home which was why Kasumi opted to send her back to the Silverus Castle. However, Kasumi needed to return to school immediately. He needed to liberate Roman from his additional works after all. Adira smiled softly and nodded her head. However, even after she answered him, Kasumi still wasn't letting go of her hand. Is there something else? Kasumi wasn't sure what to do to make sure she'll hurry back to school or at least miss him when he's not around. He was thoroughly enraptured in her ethereal radiance under the moonlight's beam that filtered inside the post chaise as if all it wanted was to illuminate this goddess. Unable to think about the suitable thing to do, he did one thing he had been itching to do since they were at the falls earlier. He pulled Adira close and pecked her on her cheeks immediately sending the maiden into overheat as she lightly touched the spot Kasumi's cold lips left a kiss. Miss me. Adira didn't know how she was able to return to her room that night as her mind floated elsewhere with no destination but Kasumi's visage. The way he looked as he pulled back from his kiss oh so gently and the way his cold platinum eyes glittered warmly and beautifully even placing the moonshine to shame. After, she was very alarmed that she might just pounce on him one of these days. Notes. Hello, I've got a little news to share. I just registered she becomes a passive villainess, not. Into the what is 2019. I don't really know how this thing goes but let's just try our luck, eh? Anyway, on to the next topic. A warm thanks to Am I Lovely's Tuna Jiju and Movi for not letting me down and Flood commenting again. I really love to read your comments so keep commenting and, for those who haven't, drop a comment now guys. Thank you for sharing the rawness of your thoughts and emotions to me. It's one of the major reasons why I continue to write. I love you guys. Thank you also to those who mass votes on the story. I love you guys too. Happy 2.2k readers and 107 votes to us. May we continue to rise more. Please continue to support. Our Adira Kasumi. Love love. This prince. The next day, although still floating and constantly thinking about Kasumi's alluring and devilishly handsome face that night, Adira properly asked for permission to visit their thief's central plaza. Silfa, who just saw his daughter again from the night he accompanied her to the campus, was crying buckets of tears as he complained to Andrea, Adira's mother. Look at her. She just came back and she doesn't even miss her daddy anymore. Andrea, I can't live like this anymore. My, my. Silfa, darling, Adira's just going for a walk and she'll be back in a jiffy. Isn't that right, dearest? Adira's smile twitched uncontrollably as she watched her father wail and complain like a miserable brat and immediately answered, Of course, father, mother. I'm just going to check some stuffs out and I'll be back by lunch. See? Now why don't you go do your work before His Majesty adds another pile to your ever-increasing tower of work? Andrea said and turned to Silfa's very own version of the Twin Towers. Silfa's mood plummeted even more and suddenly shifted to annoyance and running the cirque, cursing and scolding the king for pushing so much work into his hands. I wonder if Casey also pushes some of his work to someone else. Your Highness. Finally. Please take care of these stuff. I'm already dying over here. Roman whined and melted on Casimir's table at the council's office as soon as he saw Casimir step through the door. Good work, Roman. You can take a three-day leave. Thank you. Roman, after hearing Casimir's words, almost went down on his knees to praise him or whatever god or goddess blessed this person's black heart to ever speak those words. He even gave him a break. For three days. That was plenty enough to recover his vigor. And even said thank you. When does he do that? Aside from his falseness at celebrations or meetings. Yes. Thank you, your highness. I shall depart immediately. He sprung up from his seat and saluted with so much verve. His image a second ago almost seemed like an illusion, and quickly disappeared. He was slightly afraid the prince might change his mind. But contrary to his belief. It wasn't gonna happen. Kasumi, after all, was very happy and satisfied with the week he got to monopolize so much of Adira's time. Although Heiser pretty much sabotaged a lot of it, he was still happy to enjoy Adira's mere presence. 
Kasumi sat on his chair and thought back to the night he gave Adira a kiss on her cheek and remembered how red she was after he did it. A smile was creeping up to his face as he lightly touched his lips, trying to relive the moment he kissed her soft and warm cheeks a stark contrast to the coldness of his lips. He was already energized for the day and was refueled. He already can't wait to when Adira hurries back to school. Adira walked around the plaza. She was wearing commoner's clothes to avoid standing out and as if that wasn't enough. She even wore a hood on her head that cascaded all the way down to her heels. It was just like the first time she snuck outside the Silverous Castle. Walking past the familiar bakery, she stopped. This time, she made sure she brought money with her. Lifting her head, she saw Peter tending on the front as usual while Hyacinth cooked at the back. Um, ooh ah, out of the way. It was too late for Adira to step out of the way and so collided hard with a speeding man as they both fell to the ground. Ouch! Adira grunted and glared at the man who bumped into a frail lady like her. Hey, what? What the heck man asterisk? Why didn't you step aside, huh? Even when I told you to. But you didn't. This is a scam, right? You're doing it on purpose to scam money from me. Well let me tell you. You can't fool this mighty me. The man loudly slandered her and even pointed at her shamelessly. What an arrogant idiot. How dare you? What the? How was it my fault? It was your fault for running around so recklessly like you own the goddamn place. Well let me tell you, you good for nothing mighty sir. I'm not afraid of you. Adira exclaimed and climbed up to her feet. It was lucky she chose to wear boyish clothes today and so she was raring to go. I'll teach you to respect your elder's brat. The man also stood up and easily towered Adira. Looking at it, he was just a little bit shorter than Kasumi. So Adira, naturally, wasn't afraid. I'll teach you who to respect, mighty arrogant sir. After exchanging insults and banters, the man lunged forward and swung his fist towards Adira's face. The latter, seeing all his movements clearly, as if watching it in slow motion, easily dodged to her side and delivered a counter-attack a kick to his abdomen. The man stumbled a few steps backward. The kick packed a lot of strength for someone as small and wimper looking as this little hooded boy. He theorized right then that he wasn't a simple frail looking boy. He's got to be an expert at fighting. Launching a few more attacks only to be counter-attacked almost immediately, the man fell on the ground, beaten black and blue. So? I hope you learn to respect people despite them looking weak and frail, no. Especially if they are weak and frail. Strength doesn't give you the right to bully them. This prince doesn't bully people. You're the one who was bullying me. He exclaimed and pointed an accusing finger at Adira. What the? He really is looking for trouble, huh? How the heck is someone like you a prince? A prince doesn't accuse people indiscriminately have a shrewd arrogant personality like yours and most importantly, they don't wear clothes like this. Adira stalked closer to him with every word and every part of it was placing pressure on the man who remained on the ground backing up with every step Adira took closer. The way Adira spoke about what a prince was sounded like she knows one that made the man confused. How could a commoner like him know a prince, right? I tease because I just returned from studying abroad from the neighboring kingdom and I wanted to explore a bit before returning to the capital. I'm warning you. Touch me and I'll have them be he. He wasn't able to finish his threat when a growling sound came from him and he flushed red. A prince. When does a prince go hungry? Oh, your highness, almighty one, are you hungry? Did your servants not give you food? Adira sarcastically said and tried to pick on this arrogant jerk's nerves more. She wasn't about to let him off the hook yet. Sh shut up. I, I just forgot to bring money with me. He exclaimed, his voice rising a few volumes higher due to the embarrassment. Oh, is that so, your highness? Adira was still baiting the arrogant jerk when Peter, who noticed that their brawl had finally ceased, stepped out and tried to pacify the both of them. Good sirs. Why don't you talk it over some coffee and cakes? Peter sweat dropped as he watched the lanky and frail boy beat up a lean and obviously stronger looking man. Adira, still hidden under the hood, 
turned to Peter and visibly relaxed her stance before looking back to the man still on the ground. She thrust out her hand to help him up in respect for Peter and to avoid causing unnecessary trouble in front of his shop. She was, after all, here to talk with them. W.H. What's that for? I'll treat you to a meal. As Peace offering an apology to this good sir for causing ruckus in front of his store. Come on. Adira replied and still kept her hand out. The man refused her though and stood up by himself. However, he didn't refuse the free meal. He really did forget to bring in his person some money which was why he was currently in this predicament hungry and humiliated. They both walked inside and the crowd of onlookers finally dissipated and went about their own businesses. Back inside, Adira and the man settled in one of the numerous tables inside as Peter tended to them. There weren't that much people yet since it was already after lunch so Peter had time to sit in with them and help negotiate their peace talk. Peter, how is Hire lately? The asterisk asterisk boy suddenly asked him. He looked taken aback before he had a curious and guarded look. Adira chuckled lightly and slowly changed her voice back to her original light and sweet voice. Hello, Peter. It has been a while. She said and took her hood off, letting her hair tied in a ponytail cascade down to her back. Little one, where have you been all these years? Do you know how worried we were when you suddenly vanished that day? Hiya, hiya, come here, hurry. Hyacinth, who was called over hurriedly, ran after hearing her husband's distressed voice. What is oh my god? Little dear, where were you? Where have you been all these years? Do you know how worried we were when you suddenly vanished that day? Was Hyacinth's similar question. Really, they think two alike. Adira sweat dropped as her smile twitched at watching the couple's intense worry. She always felt bad at leaving them so suddenly that day, but she never got the chance to visit them again after that. So now that she had this rare chance, she wanted to make the most out of it and explain as well as apologize properly. I'm really sorry for leaving unannounced. I had urgent matters to deal with at that time and I never got the chance to return after. She started and slightly turned to the man, who had been staring at her with mouth wide agape and eyes as wide as saucers, as what she was about to tell them was a little too confidential to be said in front of others. What's that look for? She asked and raised a brow. The man only coughed as light tinges of blush coated his cheeks before turning away and murmuring, You. You're a girl? Do I look like one? Millimeter. Then I am one. Why are you asking the obvious? Adira exasperatedly sighed. Notes. Asterisk he thought Adira was a boy because of her clothes. Asterisk asterisk is still Adira. OMG. Thank you so much for everyone who voted. It is such a treat to see first thing in the morning. It makes me very happy. Thank you as usual to Move I and Tuna Jiju for your words. Makes me happy every time. Good luck on your studies Tuna dear. Love love. Happy 3.2k reads and 146 votes to us. We're slowly getting there. Lots of love to you guys. A night to protect you. Little one, you know how to fight. Peter, who remembered the brawl in front of their store earlier, asked Adira in doubt. She was such a frail and weak-looking girl, who would seem to break at the slightest force exerted, and yet, she was actually that good with fighting. Adira bashfully scratched her cheeks. Truth be told, ever since she woke up from her death at the previous life, she figured she needed to build her strength and skill set so she had been smuggling a trainer into their castle to teach her how to fight. It was also due to that decision of hers which led her to disguise as a boy sometimes since girls were viewed as weaker and not suitable to be taught how to fight only, need to be taught how to sit still and look pretty. The lesson stopped when she reached 12 years old and almost perfected all the moves already. A rare prodigy or a remnant from the pains of her past life, we may never know. From then on, she was training herself in secret every chance she got. So far, she got by undetected. I only know how to dodge and throw a few kicks. Who the heck only knows how to dodge and throw a few kicks? The man who experienced everything firsthand whined, feeling very wronged and humiliated by this woman, a seemingly fragile girl of all people. Adira casted him a sharp glance and he immediately shut his mouth up. 
His instincts were telling him not to cross this woman if he wanted to live. Anyway, I wanted to explain what happened that day so I came here. You're not that busy right? She let her eyes roam around the store that changed drastically over the years. From a simple bakery, it had evolved into something that resembled a cafe where coffees, teas, and all sorts of cakes were sold. Of course. Shall we talk inside? Hyacinth offered and stepped aside to let Adira pass. She nodded her head and stood up, leaving the man to himself and enjoy his meal alone. Seeing that Adira was leaving with the couple who owned the store, he thrust out his hand and grabbed Adira's arm. What? Adira, with an annoyed look, turned to the man. Are you leaving me here? Why? Can't this big prince fend for himself? Or is this big prince afraid of being lonely? The blush that finally subsided, once again rose to his face as he sputtered out a retort, WH who said about being lonely, go for all I care, and with that, he let Adira's arm go and they went inside. Adira explained her identity and how she was the person the knights were looking for that day, basically. She recounted how she created a big mess that disturbed the whole Silverist dukedom nine years ago. So I'm very sorry if I vanished without a word back then. No, my lady, please. You don't need to use those stuffy formalities with me. I'm still that little girl you fed that morning. I'm still that simple little Adira. Hyacinth and Peter looked at each other before letting go and engulfed her in a tight embrace. They had missed her so much. They didn't know what happened to her after that day and it haunted them so much. As they were relishing in that warm moment, the door pushed open and in came a nine-year-old boy. Dad? Mom? They broke their hug at the sound of the boy's voice and they all turned to him. He had Hyacinth's raven glossy hair and dark deep onyx orbs paired with Peter's smile and tall build. Even at his age, he came up to Adira's chin. In other words, he was a tall and beautiful boy. He will surely be a lady's charmer when he grows up. This is? He asked after they didn't answer him and just stared. Oh, this is Adira. Adira, this is our son, Owen. We had him a year after that incident so he's nine this year. Hyacinth kindly introduced them. Hello, Owen. My name's Adira. A pleasure to meet you. Adira smiled sweetly at the child and offered a hand to shake. Owen was taken off guard with this big sister's beauty that he hesitated to hand out his hand but grabbed the opportunity anyway. There was rarely anyone as beautiful as this big sister in their city. H.I. I am Owen. Son of Peter and Hyacinth. O owner of the Argento Cafe. He stiffly introduced himself and shook Adira's soft and warm hands. Adira giggled at Owen's cuteness and briefly wondered if she ever had a little brother. Would it be as cute as Owen? Can I stay for dinner? Adira asked Peter and Hyacinth. Before they could even answer though, Owen was already exclaiming, of course, you're very welcome to stay for dinner, even forever, big sister. The parents both looked at their son before turning to each other, already knowing what was going on without even saying the words. Their son was infatuated with the Lady Adira. Man, that's one tough wall to climb, my son. Peter lamented and shook his head with a sigh. But... He couldn't blame his son entirely though. Adira was indeed charming, lovable and very beautiful. Everything about her was dazzling, both inside and out. Any man that lays their eyes on her would definitely fall prey to her beauty. No one can escape it. Thank you, Owen. That makes me very happy. Adira smiled and patted the little boy's head to which he dodged after a few seconds of blanking out from her pretty smile. Do don't he treat me like a kid? Big sister, I'm only a few years behind but I'm not a kid, and I will definitely marry you someday, big sister. He complained which made him even more cute to Adira's eyes. The way he stood and puffed his chest proudly and very manly was just too cute for her to take his words seriously. Then Owen has to grow strong to protect big sister, right? Although aware that Adira wasn't taking him seriously and still treating him like a child, he still promised and pledged to her, of course, I will grow up fast and become a knight that will protect you, I look forward to that then, Hyacinth and Peter listened to the two converse and it felt like they were a pair of very close siblings, 
a dependable big sister that pampers her little brother and a little brother that adores his big sister too much. If Adira became my child, our family will always be like this. After speaking with them, Adira walked out to help tend the store before dinner and found the man still seating on the table where she left him. Hey, you're still here. You're done? Oh, well yeah. What are you still doing here? I needed to make sure you'll pay for my meal. The man exclaimed and stood up to at least get to Adira's eye level although he was much taller. Adira only rolled her eyes and dryly said, really? He gritted his teeth and clenched his fists as if struggling to say something before he finally swallowed down his incredibly large pride and murmured, I wanted to know your name. What? I can't hear you. What was it? It wasn't that Adira was purposely pissing him off but. Millimeter, you could also say that. His arrogance was simply too much for her that she couldn't let it go yet. I said, I wanted to. No. Your. Name. He cried, enunciating every word so that it was clear to the lady and to avoid himself from having to repeat it again. What? Why would you want to know my name? Could it be Adira trailed off and took a half step back? The man's heart was drumming so loudly inside his chest as he anticipated what the lady has to say when she continued. You want revenge and track me down? Is that it? Seriously woman? No. Why would I do that? Do I look like someone who would do that? He asked, offended at her thoughts of him, when he was met with her look that said, Yep. What the all this for a simple name woman? He whined and stomped out the store. Adira, not wanting Peter and Hyacinth's store to get a bad review because of her conduct, sighed and shouted to his angry retreating back. Adira, your highness. My name is Adira. The man stopped on his tracks and turned to the girl who stood by the store entrance with a hand to her waist, looking so high and mighty but it oddly suited her so damn well. And Stefan. It was a pleasure to meet you, Adira. I'll see you soon. He, now, had a new favorite place he would visit often. Notes. Hello. Oh my god. I was very surprised by the amount of notifications I had this morning. Thank you so much. For the many votes that you gave this story, thanks to Kana underscore Haratine, Tuna Jiju, and Charsam5 for the comments that I always get to enjoy every morning. Love love. Crocodile tears. While Adira was back in her hometown catching up with the others, Kasumi was back in school catching up with work. It was too long a break and so work piled up, but he never regretted a second of it. This work was well worth it. What happened to his highness? Leon, who sat on the sofa also buried in his own work, sneaked a glance to Kasumi. He was as indifferent as usual but the wintry atmosphere that usually coated his entire presence was missing. Now, if you actually look at him, he was as amiable as possible. Probably the Lady Adira again. Alexander shrugged his shoulders as if it was as obvious as the sun shining outside. Don't you think it's really amazing how this Lady Adira can affect His Highness so much? I mean, how can a woman make this mountain move on her will? William, who overheard what they were whispering, chimed in with a laugh. He really can't imagine what Adira did to wrap the first prince so tightly around her finger. Roman might know. He's been by His Highness' side since they were young. They practically grew up together. Leon said and they all turned to Roman silently doing his own pile of paperworks as the council's vice. PST. Hey Roman. William softly called him. Roman looked up from the papers and gave William an inquisitive stare. We have something we'd like to ask. Thinking that it was council stuff that they wanted to ask him about, he placed the papers down and gave them all of his attention and asked, What is it? You and his highness have been together since you were children, right? Leon started and waited for Roman to nod before William added, How did Lady Adira capture that snow mountain? Roman paused, unprepared for that question and unsure what to say. True, he was there when they visited the Silverous Thief and accidentally discovered the lady hurrying back to the castle after she caused such a huge mess that made the Duke mobilize the Silver Knights. But if he had to say what the lady did to capture the black-hearted prince, all he could tell them is, nothing. The lady did nothing. Leon, William and apparently Alexander, 
who was slightly interested and had been waiting for Roman's answer, all looked at him addled. That was such a vague answer. Leon, what do you mean nothing? William, how can it be nothing? Surely, she did something. While Alexander was just speechless. No, really. She didn't do anything. If I remember it correctly, when we first saw her, she was just staring at his highness. Roman told them as he recounted what happened that day and narrated it to them. It was puzzling them more. The more they heard what happened, the more they were confused. How can it be? William muttered under his breath and struck a thinking pose. How can it be what? They all heard a deep and cold voice behind them and they all sat straight like straight pins. Your Highness. William panicked and turned to Casimi, who was standing behind them with papers in his hands. What what's wrong? What is it? They are wondering what the Lady Adira did that you are so invested in her, your highness. Alexander immediately sold them out and, of course, made sure he wasn't caught in it. You have a lot of time, Will. Casimir simply said and passed him the papers with a sticky note on top of it with written instruction. In short, it was more work. William had black lines over his head and turned to Alex with a cheated and aggrieved look. He was about to just silently return to his work when Casimir added, but if you must know, she did nothing. As simple as that. And he left them more confused than when Roman told them. They were still deep in their own thoughts about it when a knock reverberated in their silent room. Everyone looked up, already expecting the person to pop in that door, when what graced them wasn't ash grey locks but salmon pink ones. Um. Excuse me. Iris timidly and cutely spoke. Everyone had a question mark above them and wondered why this student was here. Maybe a grievance complaint? Or an emergency? After all, it wasn't that easy to just drop by the council's room without prior arrangement or agenda. Yes. Leon, who was closest to the door, politely and affably answered her with a smile. Um, I have something to say to his highness. Is it a good time? She asked in her sweetest voice. The others thought of her as nice and cute as well as pretty and they all turned to the person asked to see what he would do. Casimir only nodded his head and she stepped in while closing the door behind her. After, she proceeded into a low curtsy and finally spoke. Your Highness, I came here to ask for forgiveness. I really didn't mean anything with my words, much more cause a fight between you and the young lord. I didn't know that the Lady Silveris would take my words as such and hurt her. I really didn't mean it, Your Highness. I am very much hurt with all the gossip surrounding me because of Lady Silveris words. But I do not blame her, Your Highness. The Lady Silveris was hurt as well so I cannot blame her. I only hope Your Highness will forgive this humble me for causing trouble for the three of you. She spoke in rapid succession and kept her head low. There were tears streaming down her dollish face now and all of them pitied the girl. Except Kasimi. No one can ever move his heart the way Adira does. No matter who cries in front of him, he cannot feel anything but emptiness. But it's a different story when it's Adira's tears. He doesn't know what he'll do if that happens. Millimeter. Was his curt reply and he returned to the pile of papers in his desk. He couldn't be bothered by some unknown woman's tears. If she didn't mention that time he, himself, made his beloved cry, he wouldn't have remembered her at all. Even now, he doesn't even know her name. Roman, who saw his cold insouciance, hurriedly tried to pick after Casimir's lack of words to say to anyone that isn't Adira and said, It's fine, my lady. I'm sure it was just a misunderstanding on everyone's part. Lady Adira clearly didn't mean to cause trouble for you. And about the rumors, we will do something about it so rest assured. Iris, her face finally regaining some color, thanked Roman and Casimir over and over again while smiling brightly although with dried tears before excusing herself and went out of the council's office. Well, a few tears should do it. She whispered, wiping the stains from her crocodile tears, before walking away and whistling a happy tune to herself. What did the Lady Adira say that triggered so much hatred to be directed towards that lady? Leon looked away from the closed door and turned to the only person who could answer them. But as usual, Casimir turned a deaf ear to their questions. Surely, 
That infamous Lady Adira couldn't be as careless as incriminating someone because of her words, right? William mused. Who was she anyway? Alexander also chimed in. Although the other lady's words didn't really implicate Adira's name as the culprit that started the rumors but the way she said it, she was practically saying she incited it. She's Lady Latifolia, Baron Latifolia's adopted daughter. She's Lady Adira's classmate. It can't be that Lady Adira did it on purpose, right? She knows the weight of her words after all. William expressed his thoughts and even as he said it, he, himself, can't even believe what he was saying. So they all set it aside and just formulated a plan to take care of the rumors. While the man involved in all the skirmish and rumors, paused in his work briefly while he tapped his pen in a stable rhythm. His thoughts were on the woman who still hasn't returned to school after three days and wondered what she was doing. Notes. Thank you very much for the votes guys. Oh. You make me very happy. And what makes me happier is to read your comments. So thank you to Muvai, Tuna Jiju, Kana underscore Haratine, Charsum5, Sky underscore Lin and Sushi. Thank you so much for providing me comments to read. I really love reading your reactions. Happy 4.3k reads to us. Going back to see father. For the next two days, while unaware of the brewing trouble Iris been sewing back at the campus. Adira spends her time helping out in Peter and Hyacinth's store much to Owen's happiness and delight as well as Stefan's. After all, visiting the store was the easiest way to find her. Your Highness, what are you doing here again? Adira asked as she delivered to him what he ordered and placed them properly in front of him. Even when this man constantly annoys her, she knows and was raised with proper etiquette. So it will greatly shame her name should she flare on this annoying guy. She had gradually gotten used to calling him with her sarcastic insult which later on became her nickname to him. What? I'm here to eat. What the heck are you asking me that for? He shrugged and grabbed the cutlery before slowly digging in. Adira could only sigh and asked, do you not have school? I told you I just came back from the neighboring kingdom as an exchange student. I've been studying there for a year. I, at least, deserve a break, don't I? He whined like a spoiled brat. Yeah, yeah. Adira shrugged his complaints off and only listened to the important points. So he's an exchange student. Either he's really smart or he's someone high up in rank. He couldn't really possibly be a prince, right? I haven't seen the second prince but I heard he was my age. I also heard he was a sophisticated sunny prince who was a stark contrast to the cold and black-hearted first prince. Adira thought as she kept eyeing the man with raven hair but with silvery tint at the edges like a mix and bluish green eyes. If he conducted himself better, then she might just believe his lies about being a prince. Sigh, I wonder how Case is faring at school right now. Well, tomorrow's the last day for this short-lived break so I really need to return by then. Sighing after staring at him, Stefan felt he was just judged by Adira and whined to her. No matter what you're thinking, I am a hundred times better than that. My, defensive aren't we, your highness? Well anyway, I won't have to see you from tomorrow onwards so I guess I should say goodbye even if you annoy me the most. What? Why? Are you going away? He asked, almost sounding sad as he nibbled on his fork looking like an abandoned dog that oddly made him quite cute. What the heck? Well, contrary to some people who lounge around and forcing his so-called break, I have to return to school. I've got final exams coming up. Adira thought and glanced at the happy-go-lucky man and sighed again as he indirectly reminded her of that grawling thing. Yes, the school year's about to end, huh? Time flies by so fast. School? Where do you go to school? At the capital. There's only one campus there. I'm sure you know which one right? You. Are you a noble? The man looked shocked when he heard Adira proclaim that she goes to that noble's only school at the capital. If she was, then he could ask his father to arrange an engagement with her. Of course, I am. You really must have spent a time at some neighboring kingdom if you haven't heard of me, huh? Adira muttered before finally leaving him and attending to the costumers that just came in, oblivious to the growing smile on Stefan's face. How perfect is this? 
He thought unhappily, but slowly, ate his cake. He decided right then and there that he will return home tomorrow and ask his father to send a proposal to her family. No noble family will reject a royal's proposal. Adira finally returned to the campus after dealing with her father's wines and tears and snots. She brought Heisa with her and Lifa back to the campus. At first Lifa was so shocked with Heisa's presence, when she went to wake Adira up and ended up discovering the reptile sleeping on Adira's arms, that she fainted. Literally. After that brief fainting and some explanation plus reassurance, Lifa finally calmed down and quite quickly accepted Heisa. Now, she dotes on Heisa so much. Oh. I can be his aunt or his godmother, can't I? She joyfully asked Adira while she fed the dragon who was resting his head on her mistress' lap. Sure, sure, whatever you guys want. Fill up all the spaces left in Heisa's family tree. Adira replied, not caring to argue or say otherwise anymore. She really cannot stop them anyway. So sure, become part of Heisa's family tree all you want. You guys? Oh, I suppose the father's position is already taken up. Lifa teased with a smirk she tried hiding behind her hand and snickered when Adira blushed with a slightly annoyed look. Well, Lifa need not any more confirmation after seeing her mistress face. His highness really did take up the spot. Does his grandparents know? Lifa, completely into this family play, asked. Probably asking about the Duke and Duchess. No. The only ones who know of his existence are me you and his highness. Adira informed Lifa and caressed Heisa's head happily nibbling on the snacks Lifa was giving him and snuggled in his mother's hold. He had grown considerably bigger than a few days ago at the cost of much of Adira's mana but it was fine. Now, she can't carry him as easily anymore so he walks if she doesn't allow him to fly beside her. If the mistress dotes on Heisa this much, how much more the father, right? Adira turned to the grinning lifer and then turned to Heisa before asking, Do you miss your father? We're going back to see him. Are you happy? At Adira's words, the little animal opened its clear sapphire eyes and seemed to scoff at the idea before nuzzling his head against her in a needy way. My, I think this father and son combi are competing for the mother's attention. Lifa muttered under her breath as the smile on her face twitched at the spoiled act of the little dragon obviously trying to sway his mother's thoughts back to him. Millimeter? Did you say something Lifa? Adira asked as she thought she heard her say something about Heisa. Nothing, my lady. I just thought that little Heisa really loves his mother a lot. She smiled at Lifa's words before hugging Heisa's neck and answered, of course. I love my baby a lot too. Well, aren't you lucky Heisa? Lifa said and eyed the triumphant and happy expression on this seemingly docile dragon's face. After how many hours of sitting on the carriage, Adira stepped down her carriage and made sure there wasn't anyone within the vicinity of her dorm house before letting Heisa down and walked inside the dorm house designated for her. She let Lifa help Heisa settle down and unload their luggage while she made a short trip to announce to Kasami that she had returned. It wasn't that she wanted to see him. Really? She happily walked down the halls vaguely aware of the stairs on her since she was used to it and she learned to just roll with it and knock lightly on the door. Cassie Tilda. Um, she stopped prematurely and her beaming happy voice died down when she noticed that out of place pink hair in the arms of that particular silver haired handsome man, Adira? He called her name and she didn't miss the happiness overflowing in them. But what was this scene she was seeing? Why is Iris in his arms? Um. Am I interrupting something? Notes. OMG. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot for the horde of votes you gave. As well as, of course, for your comments. There's Kana underscore Haratim, Tuna Jiju, and Sushi who doesn't forget to leave me something to look forward to reading every day. Thank you for the encouraging words. Thank you to save underscore me underscore save underscore you for the love. And everyone who loved the story. I love you all. I am very happy. My swords. Your back. As if oblivious to the woman's existence in his arms. Kasumi's face brightened up in a happy smile. 
He very casually set the lady aside before strolling closer to the woman, who stood by the door, still shocked at seeing him with another woman. Um, yeah, just now. By the way, you haven't answered me. Am I disturbing you too? If so, I can always come back later. Adira, thinking that they might have been discussing something and then Iris accidentally trips towards Kasumi hence their awkward position, tries to make way and give them time to finish their talk. No. We're done. Kasumi told her before turning to Iris and nodded his head. Iris curtsied before walking out but not before stealing a look towards Kasumi and blushing with hidden meaning and looking towards Adira guiltily. This woman. You really test me. You're back. Kasumi then took Adira in his arms, very tightly, and inhaled her calming sweet scent. Like strawberries and milk. It was Adira's scent. He really missed her. He couldn't even recount how many times his mind wandered off to her and how many times he wanted to just stop his work and fetch her himself. She was taking too long. I took Heiser with me. Do you want to see him? Adira asked. She also wanted to let Kasumi know that his favorite dragon was with her. Millimeter, later. You first. He simply said and kept Adira locked in his arms, his work long forgotten on the table. He needed to recharge his Adira reserves. Oh yeah, what was Lady Latifolia doing in here? Something about gossips and rumors. Gossips? About? You and her. Adira stopped to think about possible rumors that would involve the both of them, when she tried so damn hard to avoid the particular woman, and thought back to the day Kasumi and Triton riled each other so well they were inches away from blowing up. I see. I must have ruined our reputation. Ha. Huh? I'm sorry, Casey. Your name will be dragged with mine as well. I don't mind. I trust you. Kasumi, genuinely not caring what happens to his reputation as long as he's together with Adira, placed a kiss on the girl's head. While on Iris' end, she walked out after making sure Adira saw the way she subtly looked at Kasumi. The prince was a hard stone to crack so the only way to hit him was to use his one and only weakness. By sowing seeds of doubt in Adira's heart little by little, those seeds will soon grow and create a wedge in between the couple. But of course, it doesn't just end there. Lady Latifolia, please wait up. She heard a voice call from behind her and she stopped to turn. It was the prince's aide, Leon Riona. Lord Riona. She greeted and curtsied before hanging her head and wearing a defeated expression on her face. What's wrong? Did His Highness not saying anything again? You shouldn't let that get to you. Although he's not saying anything, he's definitely doing something about those gossips. You don't have to worry, okay? Leon ranted, trying to console the depressed lady on the verge of tears again. This is not about that, my lord. It's really nothing. You don't have to worry about it. It's just that the lady, oh, um, nothing. Please forget about it. Iris slipped and immediately pursed her lips into a thin line to prevent herself from blurting out more unnecessary things. Did the Lady Adira tell you something again? No, my lord. The Lady Silverus didn't say anything. It's just that. It's okay to speak to me, Lady Latifolia. I know it's hard to go up against someone like Lady Adira but I swear. It's fine to tell me. Leon tried to assure Iris that whatever was bothering her, it was okay to tell him all about it. And that was all the cue that she needed. It's just that the Lady Silverus saw His Highness and me in an awkward situation. But I swear, there was nothing going on. But the Lady sent me out through His Highness and even looked at me strangely. I didn't even get to talk properly with His Highness. Oh how her words were thread so perfectly to craftily lay blame on Adira and tear her reputation slowly till she is discredited to the nobles. What? Even if she is the prince's fiancé, she doesn't have any right to do that to you at all. Just because she's higher up in rank than the prince's fiancé, she thinks she can bully another student like that. Ah oh yes, raise your voice more. Please, my lord. Control your voice. It'll bring trouble to the lady if people hear you say that. Justice will not come to those who keep their silence, Lady Latifolia. Let everyone know how the Lady Silverus is bullying you. 
The few students who happened to pass by them and those who were close in proximity that they could practically hear what Leon's loud voice was speaking started to talk and whisper amongst themselves. The Lady Silverus did what? That lovely and kind Lady Silverus bullied another student. Really? My, you really cannot judge a book by its cover. Who would have thought that the model figure of every noble lady turned out to be as crude and as vile as her? The seeds have been properly planted and Adira's aloofness and usual indifference will serve as the water that will feed these rumors to grow bigger. Come on, spread it more. Let it fester. Let it take root properly. Become my swords, you foolish nobles. Iris thought deep in her while struggling to keep her sad and panicked look intact and not break, as well as the smirk threatening to display on her dollish face. Father, I'm back. A man burst in through the heavy double doors of his father's study all lively and excited. A call pen swished past him and slightly grazed his cheeks that made him freeze on his spot and stand as straight and as tense as a bowstring. So you still know how to come home, you bastard. Just where have you been to that you got delayed for a week, huh? His father flared and slammed his palms on his desk, very unlike his usual calm demeanor. I, I found the woman I want to marry. His second son suddenly blurted out of fear and he didn't know whether to get angrier because of his nonsense or just give up since this guy will always do whatever he wants anyway. Anastasia slumped on his chair and sighed in defeat before saying, so, who's the girl who finally grounded this fly to you? I don't know her family name but I know her name, he exclaimed, regaining his prior excitement. Anastasius just looked at his son like he was some idiot spouting idiotic nonsense before his son added, Don't worry, it's easier to locate and identify her than you imagine. She's actually attending at the nobles only school here in the capital. Why don't you go and bring me back the name of her family then and we'll talk about this again. He suggested and waved his son away. He was feeling an impending headache from this second son of his. I will, without fail, father. Oh. I mean, your majesty. He corrected himself. No need to correct yourself. It's only us anyway. Oh and before you go, you said you know her name right? What's her name? Stefan was already out the door when his father stopped him briefly to ask about the girl's name and a bright grin spread across his face before giving the name. Adira. And she's as strong and lovely as her name. Well then, farewell father. I shall go and claim my bride now. And with that, Stefan vanished as quickly as he came, leaving his father all confused and thinking, Adira? Is it the same Adira Silverus? Or another Adira? Notes. Oh. I am very very happy today. I passed my year and I get to read your wonderful comments. Thank you, Move I Love, Natasha 1, Lanon Fishit, Homie 6723, Taruhiyu, Nocturne 840, Shadowtail 7. Much love to you all. I'm really enjoying your comments so much. Thank you as well for all the votes and my lovelies. Banzai. Open the gates of hell. Adira walked out and the gazes were still there. Some were fiery and burning while some were cold and nipping. She turned to each of the stairs she could feel prickling her skin and knew that Iris was doing something behind her back. Your Highness. Adira suddenly asked for his attention and clung to him in a needy and spoiled way. Why don't I give you some wood to burn? What is it? Kasimi, unmindful of the sudden change in Adira's movements cause he liked it, turned to her with an adoring and pampering gaze. It is so hot in here, maybe because it is summer, but it's so hot. I suddenly want something cold. She whined like how a spoiled princess of the silverous dukedom should be. Adira need not say else more as Kasimi immediately casted a cooling spell around the place and even materialized an ice gem that wasn't algid but just enough to cool her down. Better? He asked. So much better. She answered with a very lovely smile and that was enough for Kasimi. My, would you look at that? Yes, she really does abuse her position as the first prince's fiancé. How shameful. How dare she act so wantonly in front of his highness? Adira could hear their not-so-discreet whispering and hid a smirk. Spread it and may it reach your ringleader. 
Kasimi heard the whispers and took a threatening step forward accompanied with a very chilling gust of winter coldness making them wonder if he was still using a spell, or was that purely him before Adira snatched him back. Do you trust me? Kasimi nodded so readily to her serious question. With all my heart. Let me deal with this and everything will be fine. She said and pulled him back to walk towards their intended destination visit Heisa. I can't let them say those things about you. Never mind his reputation, no one shall dare tarnish Adira's name if they wanted to live peacefully in their society. Kasimi wanted to remind them of that. Just stay by my side and look as handsome as you always do. That'll be perfect. She added a wink and finally managed to pacify the great demon lord. After all, for people such as these, she didn't need to use a steel hammer to crush a peanut. Adira and Kasimi came back together and life greeted them. Oh, my lady, you have a guest waiting in the lounge. A guest? Who? Adira nodded and gestured for Kasimi to go ahead and visit Heisa first while she deals with her uninvited guest. Kasimi was halfway up the stairs when he heard Lifer's soft voice, clearly being careful not to let him hear. It's a man, my lady. He rigidly turned to them, his platinum eyes turning colder by the second and clenching the handrail in his hands tighter and tighter till the paw would crack in pain. The two girls need not turn their heads to see Kasimi's expression right now because they were sure to get nightmares from that alone, mainly Lifer though. The drastic drop in temperature was enough to tell them it wasn't pretty. WH what D do you mean, Lifer? Why is that person here? D do I know him? D did he say his name? N no, my la lady. He do just said that he wa wanted to surprise yo you. Oh god. His highness still heard that. How sharp is his hearing? Please, Allah, Buddha, Jesus, Zeus, whichever god can hear me, save our souls. La let's hurry up and drive that person away, okay? See come on. Adira hurriedly yet gently pushed Lifa away to accompany her to the lounge before the great demon lord does but unfortunately, she was too late. Kasimi had gone back down the steps and walked beside her. His whole presence telling them, I'm coming as well. So, shutting her mouth tight, Adira walked, tensed as hell towards the lounge where an indigo head with silver edges turned and beamed at her. Surprise! He cried with a big grin on his face and Adira's civil smile twitched uncontrollably. You? She screamed at him, foregoing her elegance, formality and posture when faced with this annoying man's face. Yes! Did I surprise you well? He grinned. What the heck dude? How did you follow me all the way here? She screamed more completely forgetting that they weren't alone as she succumbed to her irritation and shock. When this idea flashed through her head, she turned to Kasimi to pacify him when the frigid man also had this look of surprise before softly calling out a name. Stefan? Brother? Why are you here? Stefan beamed that flawed Adira. Be our brother. He really was a prince. What what? Adira softly muttered. I told you I was a prince. So that's why you talk as if you know a prince, you actually do know one. I didn't expect it to be my brother though. Stefan said and tapped his brother's shoulders who was still as stiff as a frozen iceberg. What are you doing here, brother? Kasimi turned his platinum eyes that held a chilly glare towards Stefan's bluish green ones. What are you doing here? How did you know Adira? Why are you so close to her? How dare you visit her dorm? What are you to her? Why are you here? Oh. Brother, this is our secret for now. Actually, I chose this fierce woman as my bride. I'm here to propose. Stefan whispered excitedly and with that, he successfully opened the gates of hell. In a split second, icicles suddenly sprouted from the thick coating of ice that crept on the walls and the floor and all else from Casimir's spell and stopped just centimeters away from Stefan's chin threatening so dangerously close to poking him through his skull. What did you say? Casey, stop. Adira's cry drowned out Casimir's cold and deathly voice who did not even let off his own brother from trying to pilfer his fiancée out of his grasps. Casey, Stefan repeated and watched Adira's figure wobbly try to balance herself through the ice to get to his fuming brother's side. Since when did his brother let others call him with his given name? 
even allow them to call him a nickname, Kasimi. Stop this. What's wrong with you? Why are you threatening your brother? Please, calm down, Casey. Talk to me, okay? You'll tell me, won't you? She tried to desperately appease the berserking great demon lord when he turned to her, that impregnable thick frost shining so dangerously in his platinum eyes. She knows it wasn't the right time or moment, but damn, how can someone still look this devilishly good even when seconds away from committing murder? This is outrageous. Where were you while I was away? I was back at home. You know that. You dropped me off there yourself, right? How did you come across him? I, I went back to the plaza to settle some unfinished business and I happened to um, run into him. But I swear I wasn't doing anything dangerous. How were you acquainted? We, we both got into a fight and um, I treated him to a meal as an apology to the shop owner who owned the store we fought in front of. Kasumi sighed and held his head. Seriously, the moment he takes his eyes off of her, she unconsciously ends up hooking another man into her clutches. How does she do that? Why do they keep increasing for God's sake? Kasumi retracted the icicle and thawed the ice but it didn't mean that Stefan was safe yet. The shadows of death on his eyes were still dancing threateningly, still feeling murderous even if he's already cancelled the spell. And he was still ready to shed red. Casey, are you fine now? Adira gently asked him and held his hand. He was as cold as ice. He was really, really mad for whatever reason it was. Your Highness. Adira called and both of the brothers turned to her. One was incredibly upset at having to hear her address him as such while the other was still scared out of his wits and his mind in a jumbled mess. Unable to wrap his head why his brother was suddenly so hostile towards him. After remembering that the both of them were princes, she cleared her throat before starting over. Your Highness, Prince Stefan, can I ask you to please withdraw for now? Casey I mean, His Highness, Prince Casimir's not in the best mood right now and I need to sort this out first. Wordlessly, Stefan nodded his head and followed the poor shaking lifer out the door, leaving the both of them alone. If anyone can fix the Lord of Darkness mood, then it'll be no one but Adira. Casey, can you talk to me? She still tried to coax the iceberg man and gently squeezed his hand to make him feel her. Without answering or speaking, Kasumi pulled her into his arms and tightly kept her plastered there inhaling her calming scent of strawberries and milk. Adira just let him be, ignoring the pain, and patted his back for comfort. She didn't know what triggered him so she didn't know what to do to pacify him. Should we just act cute for now? Um, Casey, I just thought of something. She didn't expect Kasumi to answer her so she was about to continue when she felt him breathe deep and sigh before humming in a question. Millimeter? I didn't know you would still look absolutely fetching even when you're incredibly mad. She shamelessly blurted out and looked up to see Kasumi's expression. Yep. He's shocked, all right? But at least, he's slowly calming down now. Ah. The sun has risen again. Good job, Adira. Good job. We survived again. Notes. Thank you so much to our new batches of commentators. I was so overwhelmed and happy to find new names. I greatly enjoy your comments as always. Thank you so much. Also to the votes that flooded in as well too. Thank you guys. Two needy animals. Adira made it through an ordeal caused by Kasumi alive and intact especially his poor brother who couldn't even get his defense up against him. She had thought that it'd be a lot of work to placate the great demon lord but all she did was remain inside his strong and warm embrace and he calmed down by himself. Heiser, who settled for his mother's lap, tried to pry his arms away but this time, Kasumi did not budge nor humor him at all. He silently kept still and buried his head on Adira's shoulders. Adira, at that time, felt like she was taking care of two needy animals, a growing clingy black dragon and a large silver wolf nuzzling against her, each demanding her attention. She sighed before she brought her hands up to pat Kasumi's head softly, pampering and coaxing him. She waited for him to tell her what happened to him but it seems he didn't have any thoughts of telling her anything and that was fine. She was just worried. 
but it was too silent and she didn't like the silence that was almost deafening so she racked her brains for something to say anything will do. Oh. The final exams will be starting next week, huh? Not that you need to study but, millimeter, I'm kind of worried. What are you worried about? You're among the top performers of your class. What's there to worry? Millimeter, I'm kinda aiming for the top and I'm worried about my math. I really don't understand any of it. So she can't reach the top because of that one subject. Let's do away with it then. Will you teach me? Adira asked, twisting her upper body slightly as he gave her enough room to do so, and gave him an expecting look. That works as well. Okay. And so, Kasumi's tutorial lessons every night started much to his heart's delight and also started monopolizing Adira's nights as well. He made sure he would finish his work early or if that wasn't possible for some certain nights, he brought it back with him. So on some nights both of them were doing their best and the other nights were spent adoring her. Finals finally came and Adira did her best for the usual subjects with great confidence until the day of judgment where Kasumi's tutorial and her efforts will show their results. She was so nervous that she asked Kasumi to accompany her to view the results. Kasumi, feeling the most confident for her, stroked her head and gave her words of encouragement. It'll be fine. Really? Just that? Adira looked sulky as she continued to move forward each step feeling heavier than the last as her legs felt like lead and her hands turning as cold as ice. Without warning, Kasumi, who noticed her clenching her fists till white, grabbed her hand and held it under his large and warm ones. You'll top it. Adira automatically nodded when she saw the clear and undisturbed pool in his eyes. She could clearly see the absolute confidence he had in her. So who was she to doubt herself when even her tutor wasn't? She relaxed almost instantly and finally arrived at the board where the students gathered and she took a deep breath. After the students parted for the both of them, Adira walked close and saw her name at the very top of the list in bold letters. She desperately wanted to scream and jump with joy, celebrate her success with Kasumi, but the gazes around them were making it hard. However, it didn't stop her from wrapping her arms around Kasumi and exclaiming in a joyous voice, I made it. Your Highness, I did it. Thank you so much. Yes, Kasumi replied with a proud and warm smile. Everyone that stared as their eyes snapped towards them had one common thing in their mind. This damn dog food. After finally escaping out the crowd that congratulated both of them, of course needless to say, Kasumi topped his year. They walked back to Adira's dorm house. On the way back, Kasumi had a sudden question and softly asked, why? Huh? Why what? Top spot. Oh. He must mean why I wanted to top the year, right? She suddenly giggled when she remembered the answer to his question and responded, this is going to sound really childish but, as your fiancé, I wanted my name up there with yours. Because, wouldn't it be embarrassing if your fiancé wasn't an achiever such as yourself? I'd like to spare you from that kind of humiliation. And I also kind of wanted to show the people that the crown princess wasn't stupid or something like that. She ranted but, oh dear, Kasumi already stopped listening after yours. He silently stared at her with a very surprised face. He really didn't expect that answer out of her. Should I smile at this part? Should I hug her? Am I allowed to? Ah, oh, I really want to kiss her. Why is she being so adorable? Kasumi was feeling very conflicted as he remained silent, contemplating his life's decision, and unfocused the rest of the way, missing the opportunity to claim her lips. A few weeks after, Adira, who was back at the Silverus Castle and lounging around, as well as occasionally sneaking out to train in a secluded area inside the castle, grounds received an invitation. Prince Kasumi Athanasius' birthday celebration. As soon as she read the content, a throbbing pain attacked her temples and she clenched her teeth, soundlessly enduring the pain as memories of this event came back to her. At this celebration, there was an evening ball. All the nobles were invited so, of course, Adira had to go and she took the opportunity to stand closer to her fiancé, Triton, not caring one bit of the prince that celebrated his name day. Iris, 
who wore an off-shoulder white gown with pink gradients toward the edges and crocheted lace that snaked across her chest and shoulders, arrived and stole all of Triton's attention. She looked as pure and innocent as an untouched fresh pile of snow, perfect and taintless. Adira felt very mortified and hurt and she scorned Iris. She publicly chastened her as she staged an accident where she spilled half of the wine in her glass to Iris' white gown. However, that only furthered the nobles and Triton's hatred for her. They only saw a monster in luxurious garments and ornaments pretending to be a noble. They shunned her and called her names behind her back. She was hailed as the most beautiful but they never loved her. No one truly loved her. All she had from them was fear. And, this time, she wasn't gonna allow it to happen a second time. She instructed Lypha to prepare all the necessary arrangements for the ball that was to commence in three days' time. It was time she got her revenge for that little brat scheme. Adira smiled to herself and Heisa rested his large head on her crossed legs begging her to pet him and she did. If you look at Adira's picture right then, she looked like your typical evil queen villainess stroking her peculiar pet while planning her next evil move. And wasn't that just perfect? Notes. Happy 11k reads and 637 votes to us. I'm so happy. Thank you to everyone. I love you guys a lot. Thank you for always voting and leaving me comments to enjoy. Thank you so much. I also discovered this story topped three of its tags. Past life, past memories, and villainous. Woohoo. Banzai. Thank you everyone. Let's keep it up. Love love. Fairest of them all, nobles poured into the palace to greet and celebrate the first prince. Chandeliers illuminated the ballroom buzzing with excited chatters as nobles forged connections or greeted old acquaintances. Casimir stood beside the king, his majesty King Anastasius, with his younger brother, his highness Prince Stefan Atanase, who was still honestly scared with his brother's manic outburst the last week. He looked down from the stage built specially for them royals. He was icier and more indifferent than ever while he trained his eyes on the large double doors inlaid with golden regal designs thrown wide open to receive the guests, still growing by the minute. Kasimi, can you please show a little smile or something and keep that cold aura of yours in check? Anastasius, who noticed the queasiness of the nobles who came up one by one to offer their greetings and Kasimi only responds with a brief hum whispered exasperatedly. Yes, father. Kasimi laconically answered with a slight bow and turned his gaze back to the door again. For goodness sake, she'll come. Do you really have to stare at the door all the time? I wouldn't if you had let me go. Kasimi casted a resentful glance towards his father before turning back to the door again. This lad. How far have you fallen actually? Your Majesty, King Anastasius, your Highnesses, Prince Kasimi and Prince Stefan, a man with a large beer belly and a mendacious face, came forward and greeted them with a wide grin. This humble baron wishes to congratulate his highness, Prince Kasimi, on his name day together with his daughter. He announced and gestured for a lady with coral pink hair to come forward. She wore an off-shoulder white ball gown with pink gradients toward the edges and an intricately designed lace covering a little bit of skin above the corset that hugged, her bosom tightly making them pop out but not too seductively, and a slitted butterfly sleeves with dangling little cherry blossom flowers, recreating the lovely warmth of spring with her slightly blushing cheeks elicited from being under numerous envious stares, her skirt fluffily puffing like a perfectly blooming flower a white lace with crocheted cherry blossom flower patterns covering it, as it went all the way down to the floor, hiding her rose gold diamond studded shoes. Her garb showcased so much of her innocence, pureness, and elegance that attracted so many gazes to her beautiful appearance. Her hair, tied in a half up doe pinned with a golden flower wreath-like hair ornament, cascaded down like waterfalls. She was so sweet, pure and lovely that it incited the men's desire to protect this delicate flower and shield it away from the impurities of their world. Many were already making their moves to approach her and she all entertained them with a bashful kind smile. She was the epitome of a pure saint-like beauty, the white lotus rising above the muddy water to effloresce with remarkable and unforgettable beauty.
she was then tacitly crowned by everyone as the fairest of them all tonight. A joyous and prosperous birthday to you, your highness, it is the Latifolia house's pleasure to present our gift, Millimeter. She didn't even get to finish her well-prepared speech she practiced for hours on end just to perfect it and not slip or stutter or anything that will embarrass the Latifolia household when Casimir absentmindedly nodded and hummed in acknowledgement. Anastasius, feeling sorry for the Lady Latifolia, sighed and leaned his head in his hands in obvious vexation. If he knew he'd self-destruct like this, then he would have gone ahead and allowed him to escort his fiancé to the palace. But it wasn't that easy. The Silverist territory was hours away on carriage and he, the birthday celebrant, needed to be present to accommodate the guests. Should I have ordered Adira to come here a day earlier so he'll stop acting like this? Alas, the realization was a day too late and his son was already self-immolating over here. Please excuse him. He's just sulking because someone's still missing. He'll be fine later. In the meantime, do enjoy yourselves in the party, please. Anastasius covered for him and turned to Stefan. Escort them, Stefan. Eh? Hey. Why he couldn't verbalize his complaint when his father gave him a firm look that there was no way out of it. Why did it have to be me? He's the celebrant, he should do it. Escorting the Latifolias back down where all the other nobles mingled, Stefan tried to be genteel and engaged in a few small talks with the Baron while Iris sneaked glances towards Casimir whose eyes never once left the door. Is he waiting for her? Why is it always her? She clenched her dress covertly and hung her head, not in respect but in an attempt to hide the ugly change in her expression. A few more minutes of Casimir's anxious waiting. Just when the amount of nobles that arrived finally dwindled, the doors that once closed suddenly opened again and revealed a beautiful set of family. The Duke and Duchess Silveris that were sparkling with life and pride and the adopted son that didn't shame their well-favored and dignified countenance. But above all, was the Lady Adira Silveris that went beyond her usual standard of beauty. A transcendental allure easing out of her drastic change in her normal appearance. Her hair was styled in huge and voluminous curls swept to the side and hung on her shoulder. Her fringes were brushed up with loose tendrils at either side of her small and delicate face. The dress she wore was an off-shoulder long gown that flaunted her snow-white porcelain-like skin as it hugged her voluptuous curves before it fanned out mid-thigh on, the same level where the front slit started and cascaded down. Allowing them to take a peek at her smooth legs and black shoes also touched with twinkling stars. In her back was a slightly long train also studded with a bit larger diamonds and crystals decorated sophisticatedly. It was akin to a still lake that mirrored the velvety evening sky littered with stars and every time she made a move, it would cause ripples upon ripples of tiny glitters from the small stones that caught and reflected the light. A black lacy frill crept along the hem, accentuating her well-endowed chests, and crept further to her back dipping to the small of her back in a V form and ending in a long thin ribbon with round golden bells attached at the end of it. She was making an enthralling sound of her own each time her body swayed with movement, just like the light tinkling of the bells when she laughs, drawing in everybody's attention towards her and greedily hogging all of it. Kind of like how Pied Piper drew in the children he took. What they once considered as the most beautiful that night, Lady Latifolia suddenly paled in comparison to this lady that graciously strutted in. She was definitely on a higher plane of beauty. Everyone was already wide-eyed with her entrance alone. What more when she suddenly smiled? Everyone's mouths were practically on the floor now and were risking their eyes from getting blinded with the sheer brightness of that beautiful smile. There were no words that fit to describe her beauty now. This is how it is done, Iris. Ramir proudly extended his hand towards his wonderful sister as soon as their father and mother descended down the staircase and gave their names to the stunned servant. That was supposed to announce their arrival. But it wasn't even necessary. No one in the entire empire exists who doesn't know the Silverus family. Ramir felt a sense of triumph over every other man that eyed his precious little sister cause he was the first to lay his eyes on this magnificent lady and the first to escort her. So he puffed out his chest in a boastful way as he flaunted his special place by her side. A place no one but him can ever occupy. 
Kasumi, who finally saw who he'd been waiting for, wanted to hurry to her side as soon as he saw her family enter but he froze on his spot unable to take a single step, nor tear his eyes away from her visage when she came out from behind her brother. To say that he was stunned would be quite an understatement. And when she smiled at him, God knows how he wanted to leap across countless heads in a split second just to hide her away from these wolves' predatory gazes. Only he had the right to see that smile. Only him. Wow. This girl really is something else. Anastasius, also blown away by Adira's ethereal doll up tonight, complimented his son's chosen bride and casually tapped his shoulders as if saying, well done choosing her. Excuse me, father. Finally, the unresponsive prince, for the first time that day, made a move on his own and walked in large strides to get to his fiancée even a second earlier, all the while thinking what can be done to avert the people's attention away from her. However, no idea came to mind. He didn't know if his mind wasn't working properly like it should be. Or is there really just nothing that can overwhelm her presence? Finally meeting her below the long white with burgundy carpeted staircase, Ramu, after a good 15 seconds of just glaring at Kasumi fiercely, reluctantly let go of Adira and handed her over to Kasumi. His eyes never left her even for a short while. She was the only thing glowing so brightly and beautifully in his vision. Her makeup was done very delicately. It wasn't heavy and it highlighted every charming features of her face. It was done that it looked very natural on her face. Do I look that different? She finally spoke with slight amusement in her voice and snapped him out from checking her out. But, he only nodded gently before jolting slightly and shook his head. Not because of his usual lack for words but because he couldn't find the words to say how different she was. Do I look fine? She held a worried look and picked a lock of her ash-gray hair as she twirled it around nervously. Breathtaking. Notes. This chapter was a challenge to write because I'm not that good with describing their dresses. Sad, but it was fun. Anyway, the design was done by my best friend and it's gorgeous. I don't know if I did her design enough justice. So comment your thoughts. I really had fun writing this part. Thank you for all who dropped a comment last chapter. Shadow Tale 7, Homie 6723, Cyan Sean, Wheelart, Gerla Blackheart, and Arya Ratchigan. Thank you too to those who posted us some lovely messages on my wall, voted on every chapter and everyone else that loves this. Thank you always. Let's keep it up guys. Banzai. My friend drew the art this time and it's amazing. Considering how she did this on her phone without a pen or stylus or anything. Heck. I can't even draw the eyes. So lots of thanks to my best friend. A father's gratitude. Kasumi was about to slip out of his white jacket when Adira raised a brow at him and asked, What are you doing? To cover you. Is he? Oh, Casey. You're cute at times, huh? I don't need that. She said and fixed his jacket for him back to how it used to be. She would even dare say she did it perfectly. He looked good as new. There. You're the most handsome now. She exclaimed patting his chest and glanced up to him, smiling cheekily. Am I not handsome without the jacket? Of course not. She didn't hesitate to answer and, abruptly, the temperature dropped. She nonchalantly shrugged her shoulders and reached out her hand to tuck his stray silver lock back to its place and added, you'd be tantalizing, you know. And how is a girl as frail as me going to fend off the countless ladies waiting to pounce on you? Damn, tonight's dog food also is on a whole another level, huh? The nobles that kept their eyes on this couple's otherworldly looks and specs, not only cried tears of blood, they also coughed some out while their ears bled. Kasumi led Adira around as he greeted the different heads of their respective houses of various ranks. He somehow felt more warm and accepting than just a minute ago. Adira didn't mind being dragged around as it was also advantageous for her. That way, She'll be exposed to these family heads and she'll be able to forge necessary connections and foundations among the heirs that actually rose to power. Of course, only the ones that will actually benefit the country. And one of them was right in front of her. Your Highness. The man bowed deeply in respect to Kasumi and didn't return to his prior posture till Kasumi said so. 
He silently gestured for him to be at ease before turning to Adira. Adira, William Blackwood. As simple as that. That was all the introduction he can give to one of his few trusted aides. William puffed his cheeks in mock irritation before mischievously smirking and grabbed Adira's hand while he knelt in front of her and planted a ghostly kiss, of course. He still valued his life than to go beyond this possessive prince's bottom line too much on Adira's soft hands. William Blackwood, first son of Marquis Blackwood, at your service, my lady. He introduced himself again with a wink before picking himself up and started to chatter. Wow, I really cannot imagine how you can converse with the prince who's as stiff and cold as an ice. You really have my respect for that. Oblivious to the dropping temperature and Casimir's tightly clenched fists, keeping himself from strangling this chatterbox to silence as well as Adira's fearful smile. For him, William continued to diss the prince. Not taking it anymore, Casimir was about to thrust his hand to William's neck when Adira's voice managed to stop him on time. Not at all. His highness as passionate as everyone else and he's actually very warm, probably the warmest person that I know. Except, maybe, when he's upset. She grinned at Kasumi, who softly smiled at her words, his heart elating with pride and happiness. That's definitely a lie. Adira's smile froze and she wanted to face palm at this magpie. Please stop. I'm already trying to save you. Just please, for five seconds, shut your mouth. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry at his thickness but fortunately Kasumi was too distracted to hear his comment. So Adira took this opportunity to pull him away from William before the idiot says something that'll cost him a very heavy price. Well, it was nice meeting you, Lord Blackwood. His Highness still needs to greet others so if you will please excuse us. She politely curtsied and pulled Kasumi onto her next target. And so, they spent the next hour doing nothing but greetings and small talks before Kasumi finally led Adira towards the stage to be formally introduced to the king, his father. Climbing the few plight of stairs, Kasumi properly escorted Adira so that she doesn't trip or anything. What a fussy escort this man is. Greetings to you, your majesty and his highness, Prince Stefan. I am Adira Ramiria Ir Silveris, first-born daughter of Duke Silveris. It is a pleasure to finally meet you face to face like this. What a beautiful child, indeed. Anastasius mused before gesturing for Adira to approach him. She casted a questioning glance to Kasumi first and studied his reaction. And, as expected, he didn't like it. Well, what am I supposed to do, Casey? He's the king. Bah, don't mind him. Come closer, daughter. The king spoke in a casual tone as he waved for Kasumi to be ignored, when he noticed Adira silently asking him for permission. Adira stiffened and turned her wide eyes to the king who very easily and fluidly called her his daughter. Wow. How confident are you, your majesty? No. Actually, this family really loves to claim things on the get-go, huh? Kasumi, who was originally feeling bitter at his father for pulling Adira away from him, suddenly felt better after hearing what he called her. He unexpectedly had a change in his opinion before willingly helping Adira closer to his father. How easy. You. Go back to entertaining the guest. The king ordered and shooed Kasumi away. Stefan, who kept his surprised and searing gaze on Adira's figure for some time now, jolted when Adira's eyes accidentally met his. The way they also changed along with her overall air, was so damn alluring he could feel himself overheating under that brief stare. He could feel a blush coming and, in an attempt to escape, stood up and slung an arm over Casimir's shoulders. He rhetorically asked his father for permission but didn't turn back nor wait for him to answer as he dragged Casimir away. The Adira that he chose turned out to be his elder brother's fiancé. He didn't doubt the fact that she was able to move this ice mountain though. With how eye-catching, beautiful. Charming Anne, can you stop thinking about my fiancé so obviously? Hearing Casimir's cold voice from beside him, chills ran down his back as he stiffened and stood straight like pins. Just that voice was enough to relive the nightmare of that day and he forgot it briefly because of that damn feisty woman. WH who's thinking A about WH who? Do don't he scare me like that, brother? K 
Cassini's gaze was untrusting as ever but decided not to pursue it. He cannot help it. If everyone's eyes were practically glued on his fiancée because of her beauty, then even his brother won't be safe from it. But, he also cannot ignore how this idiot tried to claim his bride. He's not sure if he already gave up but it'd probably be better not to let his guard down. While Adira, who was left alone in the presence of the king, was nervously fidgeting. She was confident, yes, but there's a different kind of pressure when you're facing the king, who is also your fiancé's father, all right. Yo your majesty. She managed to croak when the king didn't speak and only watched her. You really are charming and beautiful. You're also very sweet looking which makes men want to protect you. But, you're simply not all that, right? There's power in you. A power that will lead this kingdom into a brighter future than I can ever do or be this very kingdom's destruction. Kasumi wanted you. I don't know how you did it, but you made him move for the first time in his life. You made him choose for himself. And as a father, I am very grateful for that, young lady. The king suddenly bent down his body with slight difficulty due to his growing age. Adira panicked at this. How can the king, who was at the very top of the food chain, bow his head at someone as meek as her? Someone way below him. Yo your majesty, please raise your head. I just want to express to you my heartfelt gratitude, sweet child. No, your majesty. I don't deserve your gratitude. His highness is a proper human being. Of course he will move on his own. Actually it should be I who needs to give you her gratitude. His highness has been very very good to me. He's saved me from things I didn't know I could ever escape from. He's given me so much that I don't know if I deserve it. He's the sweetest, kindest and warmest person I've met. Although he has a temper, he's perfect to protect this kingdom and rule it with grace and kindness. I'm sure that under his rule, we will reach that brighter future that you envisioned. But, I'm not too sure if I should be up there with him. She ended in a sad note as she recalled how the people turned their backs to her. She remembered their screams and plea to have her be hanged or beheaded. Their cries and wails when she burned them all down rang so loud in her ears. She had ruled the kingdom once and that didn't end well for both parties. She didn't know she had been trembling if not for the king grabbing her hands and smiling at her for comfort. He was just like her father. You will be great, my dear. I'm sure. You don't understand, your majesty. I will end up killing these people that you are protecting. I will burn them all. I have lived through that. Besides, that son of mine is only perfect when he's with you. Otherwise, he's just an intelligent and strong puppet. Adira cocked her head slightly when the king paused from speaking and turned to something from behind her. She didn't know what it was but she had this feeling that maybe he was looking at Kasumi. Oh. Dear me, I will not hold you back for long. I'm making you miss the party. Please, go and enjoy the rest of the evening. With all due pleasure, your majesty. They were back to their formality after a brief period of openness and vulnerability. Adira curtsied low before excusing herself. Adira went down the stairs and immediately looked for Kasumi. When she finally found him, he was talking with Baron Latifolia so she didn't interrupt and went away to rest her feet for a while. She had been standing for a while now. So she went into a corner to sit. Another one of Kasumi's aides, one of the men she always saw at the student council room, came close to her and knelt down in respect and planted a kiss on her hand that he held. Good evening, Lady Adira. I am Leon Riona. Adoptive son of Earl Riona. A pleasure to be at your service. Good evening to you as well, Lord Riona. Did His Highness send you here? Adira giggled at the thought that no matter what, Kasumi won't ever let her be alone. There was a short pause and Leon smiled while answering her with a short, yes. He really is a worrywart, isn't he? Notes. Thank you for the overwhelming support and love, am I lovelies? For the comments, votes and subscription. Thank you so much. Let's keep it up. Banzai. The one meant to lead. Adira remained on her spot while waiting for Kasumi. Leon wasn't saying much and she figured that maybe he just doesn't talk much. And then, the light and soft music changed into that of waltz. Ah, the nobles are dancing. 
Adira thought and figuring that Kasumi would be needing a partner, she got up. But what she saw was him already holding Iris at the center of the nobles that also came forward to dance. Leon saw Adira stopping and stared at something, and then he also saw it. Racking his brains for something that will somehow lift her spirits a bit, he took off and collected a variety of sweets from the buffet. Adira just stood there and watched them. It seems that no matter which life, she always got the shorter end of the stick. They do look good together. Perhaps. Iris is really the one meant to lead this kingdom to that brighter future, your majesty. She felt a light tap on her shoulder and gently turned to the plate of sweets shoved to her face, in a poor attempt to hide this awkward lord's embarrassment. Eat. Sweets will make you feel better, my lady. Seeing the amount of gooey chocolate dripping from the cake, the fiery irritation building up in her was extinguished just a tiny bit. Thank you, Lord Ryona. Although coarse and straightforward, Leon was sweet and considerate and that was enough for Adira. She took it off his hands and chose to focus on the sweet instead. A bit of the chocolate stained the corner of her lips and Leon pointed it out. Adira, a bit of a sweet tooth, couldn't stop herself from wiping it off and then licking it off her finger. Chocolate, after all, was her guilty pleasure. Tea, my lady, to wash all the sweetness away. Leon offered and Adira chuckled sweetly at his gesture. He was just like Lifer. Thank you, my lord. A few minutes after, of just sitting and occasionally seeing Kasumi and Iris dancing, Adira felt the building heat rising and making her dizzy. The kind of heat that was arousing her down there. She involuntarily bent down and clutched her rapidly beating chest and overheating body. My lady, Leon, who noticed the abnormality in Adira, reached out to help her. Before he could even touch her shoulders, she already swatted his hand away. I I'll. I will be. Fine, Lord Ryona. Please. Excuse me, she said with laboured breathing, as if she was having a hard time getting air into her lungs. She unsteadily got up and Leon extended his hand again, wanting to help her, but she just shot him a very dangerous glare with that very bewitching look in her face. With a flushed face and heavy panting, Adira moved forward and tried to escape from everyone. But oh no. Not the men that was just waiting for her to leave the Lord's Watch. Lady Silverus, I'm, Lady Silverus, may I ask, my lady, Lady Silverus. Their words were swirling into one big cacophonous sound that was grating on her nerves and making her dizzier. Please. Everyone. I, I am out of sorts. As of the moment so please, excuse me. She breathed out and all the men were enchanted with her beauty at close quarters as well as how she was so seductive with just a few words. While they were out of focus, Adira took the opportunity and slipped away from them as well. She needed to get away from everyone or anyone. This. This is that drug, right? An aphrodisiac. She stumbled forward and searched for something that will quench her thirst. She was dying from the scorching heat burning her insides. Something. Anything that will satiate my desires. Right. Casey. Casey can help. She continued to move forward shakily and briefly leaned into a pillar for support. She was burning hot and she needed something cold, or someone who will satisfy her darkest desire. Adira was very unstable the more the minute stretched further and when she tried to move forward, she bumped into someone and she just keeled over. Luckily, Triton who bumped into her, reflexively snaked his arms around her in an attempt to catch her from falling. Adira, help me. It's hot. Help. Call, call Casey please. She breathed and clung to the person that caught her. You're very hot. What happened? Triton felt alarmed. She was practically burning. Is she sick? Ah. It's Triton. So you're here. Oh, my dearest. Why her? Why did you choose her, my dear? Delirious from the heat and pain of the drug that was poisoning her senses, Adira ran her fingers on Triton's face as she asked him, forgetting that things were a little bit different now than in her past life where Iris was seducing him as she seemed to regress back to that time. What do you mean? Who did I choose? The greatest. 
Lady in this empire, right? The only girl. You ever loved. Iris Latifolia. What nonsense. I never once loved her Adira. I told you there's nothing between us. I didn't choose her. I chose you. I've always loved you. But you chose someone else. Triton, exasperated and tired of always hiding and thinking about society's rules, finally confessed to her. Revealing a very sad and pained expression on that beautiful face, she sorrowfully spoke. If only. You told me that before. You killed me. What the heck am I saying? Ah. This drug is clouding my mind. Adira pushed Triton away, without warning, and stared at him finally with focus on her ashen eyes and apologized. I'm sorry. I am merely speaking nonsense here, Lord Dalriada. Triton. Call me Triton. And I don't get the feeling that those were nonsense. Please, as. You can see I am not feeling well right. Now. And um, I must excuse myself. She hurried and sidestepped him. Beyond him, was the fountain at the center of the garden and it looked very welcoming for the burning Adira that she did not think twice when she entered it and soaked. Herself, Triton, who couldn't let what Adira said go, followed after her and found her sitting inside the fountain, dripping with cold water out in the cold night breeze only in a thin long gown. Shit. Are you planning to freeze yourself to death? Furious about seeing her treat herself like this, he stomped forward and grabbed her arm, trying to yank her out of the water. She turned to him with expecting eyes before it vanished and was replaced with fake pleasantry. I'm fine, Lord Dalriada. It eases the burning pain so it's all good. When she looked at him, she looked so devilishly titillating and enticing like she was a succubus that crawled out from hell to feast on him and he didn't mind. Triton's logical reasoning flew right out of his head and grabbed Adira in a tight embrace. Why can't it be me? Choose me, Adira. Please. Please be mine. He whispered in her ears while Adira just sat there. Her question from many years ago was finally answered tonight. She doesn't feel for Triton anymore. Now, all she wanted to see was Casimir's face. She wanted to be in his arms. Lord Dauria. She stopped when Triton gently pulled away from the embrace and his face drew near. He cannot be. Stop. Things happened too fast and she was too shocked with what Triton was about to do that she didn't see things properly but Triton was harshly ripped away from her and was already clashing swords with an enraged Casimir out for blood. Casey. She called him quietly and he unexpectedly still heard her. She was flushed for unknown reasons, he was sure it wasn't because of Triton since he saw and heard her reject him just before he ripped Triton away, and she looked incredibly tempting. No wonder Triton couldn't contain himself. But this only raised his fury a few notches higher. How dare you touch her? How dare you leave her? Did you know that while you were out there dancing with some other woman, that girl over there was ill? If you cannot keep only her in your life, then give Adira to me. So you can go flirt with the other ladies all you want without having to mind her. Of course, not that you minded her when you danced with Lady Latifolia. Kasumi froze for a second and turned back to the wet Adira, soaked to her bone against the cold night wind and might she add the chill he, himself, was emitting. Doesn't give you the right to touch what is mine. Casey. Please. Help me. Triton was about to retort to Casimir's words but they were interrupted with Adira's soft and weak plea for help before unsteadily climbing out of the fountain and careened into Casimir's arms reacting fast enough so he could catch her. Why are you still hot? Casey, someone. Someone drugged me. Cold water. Ice. You. Casimir finally had reason to remove his jacket and made Adira wear it. As if that was not enough. He even wrapped his cape around her like a cocoon. Now, nobody shall see a glimpse of her skin except her face. Why soak yourself? Casey, it's too hot. Help me. Save me from this heat. She breathed hotly into his ear since he was carrying and embracing her too close to him to provide her with warmth. Casimir always thought that even though he loved her so much, he was strong-willed enough to control and suppress his insatiable desires for her. 
but her being drugged like this was proving that to be difficult. His self-control was being put to the test. Shit. What do I do? He growled low. The beast inside of him, that he had kept in check for so long, was clawing to break free. Don't breathe into my ear like that. That's bad for my heart. Cold water. Ice. You. She whispered and her butterfly-like eyelashes fluttered to a close as her brows knitted in an obvious endurance of pain. Ice. Okay. Kasumi nodded solemnly and casted a spell on his cape, which was meant to warm her, to cool her down. He pledged to himself that he was gonna thank the person who drugged her like this first before he sends him her to hell. How dare they touch what belongs to him? Thank you, Casey. She said and snuggled into his embrace as soon as she started shivering. And all Kasumi could do then was wait. For the heat and pain to subside. Cause God knows he won't be able to contain himself if she comes onto him like that one more time. Millimeter, rest easy. I'm here. I know. Casey will always stay beside me. He's the only person that will never leave me. So I need to protect him. Kasumi was over here silently reciting the empire's laws or counting all the books he had in his personal library or even as trivial as naming all the flowers he could see in the garden just to distract himself, but his enticing and seductively tempting fiancé was over here as well, being her adorable self again but upgraded to the next level. He suddenly stabbed his sword on the ground and gripped the hilt as tightly as he could and surprised Adira with his sudden outburst of irritation. Um. I'm sorry, she squeaked. She didn't know if she said something that irritated him or what, but she apologized nonetheless. To him, this might be the hardest task yet. You. He suddenly turned his irritation towards the odd one out of this moment with clenched jaws and barked. Send my orders to the knights and to William and Roman. No one goes out tonight. I will kill whoever put Adira in this state. And magically, he was very articulate and wordy. Triton didn't like Kasumi ordering him around like that but when he heard that someone intentionally did this to Adira, he didn't mind anymore. Not only will he beat Kasumi into killing that person, he will make sure he'll rue the day he dared to hurt Adira. Casey, don't. I need to have a talk with that person. Don't kill, please. Hearing the lady speak her wishes, both Kasumi and Tritan considered it and retracted their thoughts of killing that mongrel. But she didn't say anything about torturing, right? Pivoting on his heel, Tritan went ahead with the order and walked back inside. He could somewhat rest easy that Kasumi won't do anything strange to Adira since he could visibly see how he was desperately controlling himself from taking advantage of her state and jump on her. He's the prince. He knows what's best. As soon as Triton relayed Kasumi's orders and informed the king, a commotion arose and there was unrest in the large ballroom. Knights were stationed at every entrances and exits as they kept everyone right inside. Kasumi came back, a dark cloud surrounding him and a frosty chill in the air with him, and stood above the stage. He addressed everyone icily and everyone knew, they were in for a world of pain. Lady Adira Ramiria Ear Silveris Everyone knows who she is, right? Everyone were already shaking in their boots, who among them would even have the courage to answer him while he's looking like that. He looked as if he could swallow them whole and drag them to hell or personally send them to the gallows himself. While no one answered, Kasumi didn't mind it and instead continued, yet, one of you dared to hurt her. After announcing that, he shifted his gaze to William, who was waiting for his cue, and nodded. That was the signal to start his mission. Search everyone. He already briefed the knights what to look for and if they were lucky, they should find that person carrying the drug with them. But after everyone was thoroughly searched, nothing turned up. Everyone was very scared for their lives because of the pestilent aura enveloping the prince that even though they felt intruded and wronged, they could not utter a single word of complaint. Your Highness, there was nothing. No one carried the drug with them. William reported but Kasumi already deduced as much. He wasn't sure if the culprit slipped out as soon as they did the deed or he did something and perfectly hid the drug elsewhere. But, that didn't mean that he will not find him. It seems the culprit was smarter than I originally thought. 
Kasumi once again stood up in front of everyone and talked. Since everyone here proved their innocence, let me apologize. He once again nodded to William and the servants promptly moved and offered champagne to each and every noble present. Although he did say he wanted to apologize, he most definitely did not look like it. So how were they supposed to rest easy and enjoy a drink? I hope everyone will take a sip from his majesty's personal favorite. This is fresh from his own collection, so I guarantee its taste. Damn, the more they listen to Kasumi the more the fear in their hearts grow. He was too wordy tonight and that never mean well. Is there poison in this champagne? Regardless, they still followed his words and took a sip. They were too tensed and scared that they could not taste the drink at all. It felt as if their tongues had gone numb. Please. Whoever hurt his woman. Please. We beg you. Just come out. They screamed in their hearts and cried rivers of tears. They were well aware that this charade will never end till he finds whoever harmed the silverous lady. Which idiot dared to harm the most sought after and protected lady? Not only did they make enemies out of a superpower family like the Silverus, they directly provoked the only man one should never provoke in their entire life. Lest it had be the last time the sun shall rise in their small, unimportant life. Kasumi watched them take a sip and made sure they really did drink. However, still, no one was showing any reaction. Hum, you hide too well. My apologies for scaring everyone. He smiled but when he did, he looked even more like the great demon lord rising out from hell to drag whoever angered him back down with him. Everyone wished he wouldn't smile when he's practically chilling them to death. He instructed the knights to step away from the doors after opening them wide. The nobles dared not avert their eyes away from this ticking time bomb and kept as still as they could. Everyone felt that even breathing loudly might spell their death. Everyone's free to go. Kasumi said and walked down the stairs to approach a noble and shook his hand with an apology. The noble was so scared he almost shut himself. Now, imagine how humiliated he would be if that actually happened. He's dead to high society. Kasumi personally escorted the said noble out the door and repeated the process to a few more nobles, personally seeing them out and shaking their hands. The nobles finally relaxed a bit as they filed out of the ballroom slowly. The king and the Silverus family were confused with Kasumi's actions but didn't say otherwise. They knew they could leave it to him although Rame and Silver was reluctant to accept that idea. It went down to a few more people now and even then, he did the same. Until he came across the one person with a peculiar scent on their self. Found you. Notes. Thank you so much for the overwhelming support and love guys. Thank you for your comments as well. I really have fun reading them as always. Of course, as well as the votes. Thank you so much. Hold your hand. Everyone were already out the doors and returning to each of their houses alive and with intact limbs. Before they allowed themselves to rest easy and sigh of relief. That was the scariest Kasumi had been for a while now. The more wordy he was, the more they felt his oppressive anger overwhelming them to the point they were drenched with sweat and tears and unconsciously trembling in fear. Although they didn't know who the culprit was after all, they were sure that black-hearted prince won't ever let this incident go. Since it specifically involved his woman, Kasumi went back to Adira's side. She was temporarily at the farthest end room of the east wing of the palace. And no, he didn't mean to arrange it like that so no one disturbs them okay yeah, he did arrange it like that. But partly because they had to secretly bring Heisa when Lifer came over. Heisa was throwing a bit of a tantrum, probably feeling his mother's discomfort or the disturbance in her mana. He even meant to just let her rest in his room but rules and circumstances would not allow that and he doesn't want to paint a bad impression on his soon-to-be parents. He remembered she wanted to meet that person to ask why he, she drugged her with an aphrodisiac. So he came to report to her. Knocking gently, he pushed the door open as soon as he heard her acknowledging voice and found her leaning against Heiser for coolness in front of the fireplace for a little bit of warmth. She had already changed into more comfortable clothes and let her hair fall in natural waves, looking so soft and homey, like a wife waiting for her husband to return home. And, upon seeing her weak figure, he decided to put it off for a while. How are you? 
millimeter better. Heiser's scales are very cold tonight and he's very perfect. Adira answered and snuggled closer to Heiser, which was to the latter's absolute happiness. They say I'm cold. He subtly inserted and sat close to her while keeping his icy platinum orbs on her. Adira giggled cutely and smiled brightly. Was she really getting better? Why is she a hell lot more beguiling? She slightly turned her body and opened her arms to receive him. She's been with Kasumi for a long time that she can guess what he wants more often than not. Brightening up at Adira's gesture, Kasumi slowly shuffled closer to take her in his arms gently. Of course, he must not look too eager. Millimeter case is warm not cold. Those people are lying. And Kasumi believed that. Whatever comes out of her pretty little mouth was his only truth. I can cast ice magic. He reminded her, though it wasn't needed, and Adira only shook her head. Kasumi's temperature was perfect for her. Or was it the person himself? Did you find the person? Adira cautiously asked. She knew that asking about this incident would upset the great demon lord. She could clearly see it when he stepped into her temporary room. But, she needs to know. She has this gut feeling that this incident wasn't all that it seems at the surface. And true to her expectations, the temperature in the room dropped a few degrees after she mentioned it. Kasumi was upset and his whole being was austere. Yes. Did you kill? Although she already knows the answer to that, she wanted to hear him say it. She wanted to hear him talk. No. Millimeter, Casey really is kind. Who's kind? I didn't kill him only because you asked not to. I want to hear that person's reason. She added in a small whisper. She wasn't all that advertent of her surroundings because she was more cautious of Kasumi's surroundings. She was more worried of his impending assassination that her own security totally flew over her head. Honestly, as idiotic it may sound, it didn't really occur to her that she'd also be a possible target. Of course, Casey is strong. So what better way to hurt this man than to harm his only weakness? She felt somewhat upset when she thought that. At first, she rigorously trained to perfection so she could protect herself. But now, she was being so pathetic and being a burden. She even had the audacity to boast about protecting Kasumi when she couldn't even protect her own self. How am I supposed to protect him if I'm this weak? I'm sorry, Casey. Adira suddenly apologized and Kasumi stopped playing with her long ash gray hair to look down at her sad little face. Why? I'm a burden to you, aren't I? It breaks his heart to see her like this unsure. Sad and doubtful of herself, he thought that maybe he really should have went and killed the person on sight. You're what makes me strong. He consoled her and gave her a comforting kiss on her head. If he could cut his heart out and offer it up to her or slice his brain open and show her what he thought of her, he would. He'd do anything to see her strong and confident smile again. Although it wasn't that bad to be needed like this, he'd still rather see her confidently stand up and face her challenges than mope like this and doubt herself. Casey makes me strong too, you know, because I know that you'll be there when I turn around, I can move forward without fear. She finally dozed off, breathing evenly and peacefully after being in Kasumi's warm hold for a while with Heisa's head resting on her lap. Kasumi transferred her to her bed so she was comfortable while Heisa's tail flicked and hooked the edge of the blanket to cover his mother. The former stroked her head a few more times before answering her slumbering figure in a soft whisper. You don't need to turn around. I'll be holding your hand every step of the way. I'll be with you even if you don't want me to. The next morning, Adira finally returned to normal and Kasumi felt proud for passing through the night safely albeit sleeplessly. Kasumi stayed over at her room to protect the weakened Adira, in case that person decided to finish his job, but wasn't confident in himself so opted to while his time at the beige Victorian couch a little ways away from Adira's bed. Heiser was resting his head on the bed, in the space beside Adira's slumbering figure getting too small for him and was told by his father to protect his mother against anyone that enters. Lifa, after being informed of what happened to Adira, was very worried about her mistress that even if she wanted to sleep she couldn't. So just like back then, when Adira fell into a long sleep after falling off the horse back when she was a kid, 
she stayed by her bedside and guarded her. Only difference this time was she's got two more accompanying her vigil. Kasumi and Adira were both summoned to the audience chamber later that day and was asked about the commotion Kasumi incited last night. They demanded a proper explanation. Adira, taking the sudden interrogation the wrong way, panicked and tried to protect Kasumi and shifted the blame to her. It is not his highness' fault, your majesty, father and mother. I asked His Highness to find the culprit which caused the commotion and created unnecessary fear and anxiety. If someone should be blamed, it is only I alone. Please don't blame His Highness, Prince Kasumi. Everyone was very shocked at Adira, most especially her parents. They had never seen this burning passion to protect someone in her all those years ago. And mind you, she never rose her voice like that as well. Kasumi glanced at her warmly and lovingly. So this is how it feels to be protected. Adira, they're not chastising me. Calm down. He told her gently, taking her hands into his large ones and used his other free hand to pat her head. That is right, daughter. Kasumi failed to properly explain to us yesterday because he suddenly took off after seeing all guests out. To which I could guess where. The king calmly comforted the panicking Adira with a hidden smirk and reveled in the blush that coated her cheeks when she realized that she just overreacted. However, Adira's father had a complaint. Who are you calling daughter? They're not even married yet and you're already calling my daughter yours. Father, we have a more serious issue at hand here. Notes. Hello. Thank you for all your lovely and funny comments. I had a great time reading them. Thank you also to those who voted relentlessly. Love YA. By the way, I saw someone with a Lucas image as their profile and I couldn't help but say you you'd. You're the beast. I miss my boy. And to the Hamilton dude. I am not throwing away my shot. Dang. Let's run away. Kasumi explained to their parents what transpired last night and what happened to Adira. Silfa was burning with fury and clutched his sword on the ready to stomp out of the room when he discovers who the bastard was and torture them to death. And, Andrea didn't care to stop her husband. She was even willing to assist him if need be. Kasumi obviously noticed the animosity enveloping the two elders and he does not plan to stop them from dealing with the person but he tried to convince them to leave. It to him. Partly because he wanted the first blood but mostly because that's what his bride wanted. It took a while before the elders decided to trust his words but they did. If anything, they'll just have to renegotiate after he brings in the culprit. The king, Anastasius, trusted Kasumi and left it in his hands. Also, it's his bride who was harmed and as a fellow man he knew no one can stop him from exacting his payback. You have my utmost gratitude, your majesty, father, F.A. Duke and Duchess Silverius. Kasumi bowed respectfully before they were excused and took Adira with him, much to the chagrin of the Duke Silverius. He wanted to spend time with Adira for a while before she has to leave for her home back at the Silverius Fief again, before they are separated for miles again. They were walking around the garden silently. Adira wasn't talking and was just hanging her head. He thought that maybe she was still depressed about the incident so he tried to cheer her up. Adira. He called and she muzzily turned to him before he slipped a flower on her ear that took her off guard. You look better with a smile. His gaze was full of worry, warmth and love that Adira, who was thinking about what to do to improve herself, froze for a few seconds before blushing at Kasumi's flirting skills suddenly kicking in. Goodness, Casey, what am I gonna do? She mumbled under her breath and, of course, Kasumi didn't let it slip his hearing. His senses were always dialed to the eleven when it's Adira. Smile. He answered, completely misinterpreting her affliction. Of course, your highness. She teased him and smirked before a wild idea popped in her head and she smiled oh so brilliantly whilst mischievously. Casey, let's run away. Okay. How can you answer that quickly without giving it much thought? With Adira's crazy idea. She made Kasumi change into more casual clothes and even made him try different disguises but his regality couldn't be hidden so they just did, without disguises. If anything, the townspeople will just have to see their prince going out on a date with his fiancée. No big deal. 
They went to town and had fun, supposed to be like normal couples but they were attracting too much attention. Wow, no matter where you put Casey, he rises above everyone else, huh? She spoke her thoughts aloud and stared at the gorgeous man standing beside her, in front of a fruit stand, and admired his beauty. I wonder if this beauty is taken. She mused and Casimir craned his head towards her, still being indifferent and without a care but, then suddenly smiled brassily. Sorry, I have a bride. No. Your mind so you can't take that bride. You can only choose me. Dump her right now. Right now. She whined coquettishly and silly and it should be shameful for a noble to do that but Casimir was going along with her. Please don't come here just to feed me unnecessary dog food. Ah. I want a bride as well. The storekeeper cried in his heart while watching these two amazingly eye-catching couple feeding him too much dog food it'll last him a week. While the both of them were being silly despite the large amount of eyes on them, a particular gaze bore holes into them and were already ripping them apart hundreds of times. She walked close to them and breathed deep before quickly wearing a worried gaze. Lady Silveris, you're all right. Oh. And your highness is here. Iris quickly curtsied before turning back to Adira once again worriedly asked her condition. I heard someone tried to hurt you last night. I'm so glad you're looking better now, Lady Silveris. I was very worried. We all were when his highness and I finished dancing and we couldn't find you. You just had to remind me of that, did you? Why thank you, Lady Latifolia. That is so sweet of you. I'm very sorry that you had to be my replacement for the dance though. His Majesty and I, we were very taken with our conversation that we forgot the time and the people around. I suppose my fiancé treated you with care? Adira politely spoke as she artfully emphasized some of the important points in her speech that'll give this lady a clue to which side she stands coyly clinging onto. Casimir's arms. Of course, Lady Silveris. His Highness was so kind and sweet that I had the best night of my life. Iris retorted as calmly as she could and flagrantly glanced towards Casimir. Is that so? My man is just too charming, isn't he? Sadly, this beauty's taken though. He even refused me. Adira said with a gloating expression and turned to wink at Casimir who felt an arrow strike through his chest. Who did you say it was again? My bride. Casimir readily replied and grabbed the lady's hand before planting a yearning kiss on them and smiled oh so captivatingly. You jest, your highness. Weren't you gonna dump her for this asterisk handsome me? Adira playfully struck his chest and batted her eyelashes at him, stabbing more arrows into his enraptured heart. Acting as if she forgot they had an audience, Adira jolted and turned to Iris again with an apologetic yet subtly mocking look elegantly covering her mouth as if she was shocked from her behavior. Oh dear, excuse me for my rudeness, Lady Latifolia. We're just naturally playful when it's just the two of us. Open your eyes wide, Iris. There's no place for you here. I will never allow you to take Casey from me. I won't let what happened from the past life happen again. I'm fighting for my rightful spot now. Not at all, Lady Silveris. I should be the one who begs your pardon, I didn't mean to intrude in your alone time. Well, if you'll excuse me. Father must be looking for me now. Good day, your highness, Lady Silveris. She said and curtsied before sauntering off. Adira could clearly see the annoyance she desperately hid to the point that she had to withdraw before she fails to keep it up. Failing to hide her victorious and haughty smile, Kasumi asked her, You don't like her? Which woman would like another girl who's seducing her man? Adira, looking very upset and irritated, glowered at Kasumi and crossed her arms across her chest like a very, very angry wife. And that oddly aroused something in Kasumi. Are you jealous? Kasumi, strangely joyous and pleased with Adira's fiery temper, asked with a wide smile. However, this smile only caused Adira's temper to flare up before a dangerous look glinted sharply in her ashen eyes as if it could burn Kasumi to cinders and answered, So what if I am? Notes. Asterisk no. They're not cross-dressing. Adira's being playful and purposely mixing things up. Hi.
Thank you for the emotional comments I receive every day and the votes that continue to pour in without fail. You, my dear readers, are the best. Let's keep this up and continue supporting our future king and queen. One way or another, Iris, who immediately went home after her brief interaction with the prince and the noble bitch, silently entered her room and thrashed all the things on top of her tea table in one fell swoop. That bitch. She soundlessly screamed and fumed while supporting herself on the table. She gritted her teeth before she accidentally saw her hideous reflection on the window. Everything should have been mine. Everything of hers is mine. It's mine. Screaming hysterically, she punched her reflection that cut her hand. Her chambermaid was so scared that she trembled while walking closer to her mistress as surreptitiously as possible to patch up her wounds silently. Still driven crazy with her intense bursts and irritation Adira triggered, she whisked the servant away and pushed her away. She was infuriated with how Adira obviously laid her claim and drew the line, slapping it hard onto her face. She's been passive until now. What the hell happened to her? And what the heck is that Dalriada doing? Doesn't he want her? Ah, she really makes me rankle. Iris slammed her fists on the table, already numb from her furor, that made the poor mistreated servant wince. This is only the beginning Adira. I will get revenge. One way or another, Prince Kasumi is mine. She vowed and watched the inimical grin of her reflection from the fissured window glass. She's mad. The servant helplessly thought as she watched her lady being consumed with her hatred for the Lady Silverus. What's your plan? Kasumi, happier as he'll ever be, asked his beautiful bride, who finally calmed down. Millimeter? I really don't know if you ask me. But I do know that I want to ask why he did that. She answered while scraping the last drops of chocolate ice cream from her parfait. Kasumi, seeing Adira's cravings, pushed towards her his untouched parfait. Why untouched? Well, you see, he was so over the moon with happiness he didn't really want his attention divided with eating and watching his wife. Adira beamed brightly when she saw Kasumi give her his share and immediately digged into her second batch after thanking him sweetly, sweeter than any parfait Kasumi, could possibly eat, relishing the satisfaction of her cravings. Why don't we just torture it out of him? No. You can't do that. Adira quickly shot down his suggestion and appeared to be thinking. It couldn't be that he was ordered to do so, right? If so, my rivals are finally making their moves to remove me, huh? Man, you know how hard it is to have lots of rivals. She shamelessly complained and was met with a look of disbelief from a pair of platinum eyes. As if saying, seriously, I have it harder than you'll ever do, my love. Unbelievable. Kasumi muttered under his breath and Adira sharply caught on this. It really is. I have to be constantly on my toes in case someone decides to forego formality and ranks and suddenly attack me. I'm only a frail girl who can't fight back. If Stefan could only hear Adira right now, he would have a severe coughing fit till he vomits blood and whine mournfully. How shameful are you, woman? Kasumi could only sigh in vexation. He decided to set aside his worry for his ever-growing number of rivals, who might possibly be all over the empire by now and focus more on the issue at hand. But that will come after he has his fill of observing her happy dessert time. It's a secret but he finally achieved his purpose of ignoring the latifolias lately. My lord. Iris curtsied when she came face to face with Leon and made sure she had on her piteous expression as well as her tears. Lady Latifolia, what happened? Um, nothing, my lord. She lied and sniffed pitifully, casually and conspicuously wiping her tears with her injured hand. My lady, what happened to your hand? Who hurt you? My lord, this is nothing. I, I, I broke a teacup and accidentally hurt myself. She lied, making it more obvious so that Leon would pry more. That's a lie. You can tell me Lady Latifolia. And we can tell His Highness Toge. She didn't let Leon finish and repudiated vehemently, no. You cannot tell this to his highness, my lord. You absolutely cannot tell him. It couldn't be. Is it Lady Adira? Leon asked, 
growing to hate his prince's fiancée the more he heard how she bullies this poor lady. And now, it has reached the point of injuring another noble. Iris, however, kept her mouth shut, looking guiltier and panicked by the second, as if she was scared of something. Iris' silence and reaction was all it took for Leon to conclude that Adira had something to do with her wound. He couldn't believe that the lady could do something as cruel as hurting another noble out of jealousy. You really cannot judge a book by its cover. What may be a great beauty outside could be as rotten inside. Leon spoke and held Iris' quivering shoulders from desperately trying to hold in her tears and comforted her as well as advised her. I need you to help me, Lady Latifolia. His Highness needs to know the Lady Adira's true nature before it is too late. You must tell him. But he won't believe me, Lord Ryona. He is too bewitched by the Lady Silverus to think properly. He will take her side without doubt. She sobbed and clung to Leon's shirt. You are the only, idiot, one who believes me, my lord. Please help me. He lifted his hands and gingerly patted the crying lady on her back. Even if he pitied her, they were an unmarried man and woman and being seen in this position could spell trouble to the lady herself. How could the prince be blind to all of this? Is he condoning his fiancée's behavior? He cannot be right? He's the crown prince. Surely he'll think for the greater good than his own fiancée's right. Leon's head was in a mess while still trying to coax the crying lady. It'll be all right, my lady. If the prince tries to cover for his fiancée's wrongdoings, then I will find another way to get your justice. Thank you so much, Lord Ryona. Thank you. A few tears and you cave in. How perfect. Happy wife, happy life. After Adira had her fill and Casimir had his of observing and just watching his happy little ball of sunshine gobbling up her dessert, they returned back to the palace. He warned Adira that the person they were going to meet could be the person that harbored ill will of her and she nodded in response. I mean, with Iris' constant attacks, another enemy isn't that much different. You'll be with me, right? So I have nothing to fear. Who would even dare antagonize you? I really would like to see one try. Kasumi was itching to lay claim on those pink little cherry lips but decided against it and reeled it in. There should be a right time and place for everything. It's also against the law. And most importantly, he doesn't know where he stands in Adira's life. Sure they were bethroated but that was because he wanted that. They became closer also because he wanted that. He became Heiss's father, yep, because he wanted that. He became involved in her life, a part of her every day, because that was what he wanted. But what does Adira want? All this time, he's been basically forcing his way in, purposely trying to make her jealous and trigger whatever emotion he could get from her, which took a really long time, by letting the Latifolia girl get as close as she got. But was it really Adira's own heart? Or did he force what he wanted too much and he was only fooling himself? Because it has been a while but Adira didn't seem to get along well with Iris. Is she mad because the girl was sticking close to me? Or is it the girl herself? Anything that involved Adira, Kasumi just can't seem to be confident in the answers he formulates nor read and understand this sprightly beautiful goddess. She was always the uncertainty or irregularity in his world of patterns and predetermined actions. She was an irregular ball of light shining down on his otherwise dull world. Adira. Oh. Your Highness, Lady Adira. You're together. Again. You know, Your Highness. Sometimes I wonder if you were a stalker from your past life. William, who happened to pass by and found the two of them, decided to walk closer and greeted them. Actually, he's still a prince, William. As usual, very oblivious to Casimir's chilling agitation. William voiced his thoughts and pulled a lame joke on Casimir that didn't elicit a laugh nor a smile but only an icy glare. Adira turned to him and greeted him back, as friendly as she could, with a slight bow. Good day, Lord Blackwood. What are you two doing? He asked. Well, um, we're here to interrogate someone. Adira, after briefly checking Casimir's current mood, answered honestly. This person was Casimir's aide and if he trusted him there's no reason she shouldn't. What do you want? Nothing really. I just happened to see you two and decided to greet you. Go away. 
Cassini icily chased him off and glared daggers at this thick-headed idiot. But why? Maybe I can be of help for this interrogation thing you're about to do. I know a lot of methods with varied paraphernalias. I'm a master in this field. You can use me and we'll extract whatever information you want in less than a minute. William vauntingly tried to sell out his skills, not to the prince but, to the Lady Adira. As thick as he is, he knew she called the shots. Thank you for that kind offer, my lord. Adira thanked William and smiled that both boys thought she was agreeing. One looked sullen and one was excited. But I don't want to alert the person as going in a group of three will arouse suspicion. It'll be fine with his highness and me. Everyone already knows we're practically inseparable anyway so it won't seem weird. Kasumi beamed happily, his countenance finally growing warmer. After hearing Adira reject William's help while the latter sulked on the side like a spoiled kid. He wanted to join in the fun. He wanted to talk to, um, help his superiors in any way he can. But in reality, he was just darn bored without anyone matching up to his skills aside from the busy prince and his right-hand man to play a few rounds. Oh. There's still that rock but we've always tied so it's no fun. Then, we shall take our leave, Lord Blackwood. Adira bowed slightly and hooked her hand on Casimir's arm to manoeuvre him forward. Oh. Lady Adira. William called to Adira and she briefly paused with an inquisitive gaze. Please call me William from now on. He finished with a smirk and a wink and Kasumi had a surging urge to gouge that eyeball out its socket so he won't dare do that to his wife again. Adira giggled at William's playfulness before her gaze turned serious, foxy and mysterious and answered him. Then you can call me Adira as well, William. William blushed really hard when met with beautiful and radiant ashen orbs in a Juno-esque woman such as the Lady Adira. Now, he fully understood why his prince was drowning in a pool of vinegar every single time to the point of going crazy. No man can escape the clutches of that mystic beauty that seems to see no bounds. In an attempt to hide his reddening blush, he averted his eyes and finally felt the sub-freezing iciness in the prince's threatening glare and gulped. Instantly turning as pale as sheets and refusing to look at him directly in his eyes. I'd rather not, Lady Adira. I'd like to keep my life for a while longer. Kasumi brought Adira into his office and had her take a seat at the couch and he sat beside her, automatically and naturally. Like that place always belonged to him. Adira, can you please not smile at others? He suddenly asked her with a displeased and frowning face that didn't make him any less handsome but made him devilishly dangerous. But wouldn't that make them hate me? I already have this villainous face as a problem to deal with and you're asking me not to smile at people. Well, how are they gonna like me as the crown princess then? Ranting against the few words from Kasumi, she planted a hand on her hips looking like a spoiled child demanding her sweets like a dominating queen. This is cheating. When she says it like that I can't say otherwise. Okay. Kasumi immediately surrendered. There's nothing to gain out of arguing with a woman anyway. So why bother? Just let her win. As they say, happy wife, happy life. Do you think he'll come? She suddenly asked, softly and worriedly. She never understood how she picked this person's nerve for him to plot against her like that. He wasn't like that from her previous life. He actually rose to power and became part of the empire's asset. So why? As she was mulling over this, a knock snapped her out and Kasumi answered, Come in. Your Highness, you summoned me? The man went down on his knees, as soon as he approached in a suitable distance, as a sign of respect to the two who stood way above him in rank while avoiding direct eye contact. Millimeter. I have a question for you. He looked up. Confused, not only because his prince said he summoned him because he had a question but also because with his voice came the abrupt drop in temperature as he looked as murderous as he did the other night. Pray tell, your highness. Your humble servant will do his utmost best to give you a satisfactory answer. Leon Riona, adoptive son of Earl Riona, a man under my protection as my aide, answer me. Why the hell did you drug Adira? Thanks for the treat. Your Highness, I didn't. I swear on my life I never placed anything in the lady's drink or meal. 
I don't like her but I most certainly would not do anything to harm a noble such as her, who is also the prince's fiancé. Leon cried and defended himself, denying anything Casimir was accusing him of. But your highness, should you really be believing whatever the Lady Adira tells you, aren't you even doubtful of her? How can she blame it all on me? Just because I kept her company in your absence, do you even know what she does to other nobles? She hurts them your highness. Lady Latifolia's injury is proof of that. Leon felt very cheated and aggrieved. He really believed that the prince was a more objective person, a prince who doesn't allow his emotions to sway his decisions. But he just proved him wrong. While Casimir felt rage surging deep inside him as he listened to Leon's baseless accusations that most probably all came from one person. The instigator who kept ruining Adira's reputation in the nobles' eyes and most probably even those ordinary citizens. Adira never blamed you, Leon. Also, about that Latifolia's injury, I can assure you that it wasn't Adira who harmed her. We've been together since we last saw that woman perfectly fine and spotless. So be careful who you accuse, Leon. Kasumi answered, planning to keep his words brief and concise but no. It seems he needs to spell it out for Leon who has been ensnared by some kind of serpent's whispers. Cause, how dare he doubt Adira and even slander her right under his nose. You dare court death. That night, I had concluded three possible scenarios. One was, someone, a noble among the guests, was carrying the drug. But after searching through everyone, the knights found nothing. Two, I thought if no one carried the drug, how else was it possible to smuggle the substance inside the palace without alerting the guards? It could only be if it was already grounded to powder form and coated in the lips. Third, since no one showed a reaction, it could be coated on the one place it could be easily transmitted to the intended target, the hands. Kasumi explained his thoughts that night when he looked for the culprit and prematurely ended the party right then and there. Leon's mouth was open and his eyes as wide as saucers, wanting to retort when everything clicked in place. Someone had used him. The real person behind this chaos actually dared use him, and he foolishly followed along the mastermind's plan. It all made sense now. When he went and greeted Adira, he held her hand to kiss it. Then the Lady Adira saw the prince and the Lady Latifolia dancing and thinking that she was upset. He gave her some sweets to distract her. Because even if he didn't like her, he didn't necessarily hate her then and wanted to somehow distract her a bit. And then, the lady had a chocolate stain on the corner of her lips and he kindly pointed it out for her. She wiped it off and licked her finger, which was possibly already coated with the aphrodisiac's powder. Leon suddenly felt all strength leave his body as his knees buckled and he fell on all fours, already realizing what happened. You idiot! How much of a fool can you be? To allow yourself to be used like that. Damn. Problem now was, he couldn't remember where he got the powder from. Looking at your reaction, I guess you really didn't mean to harm me. Huh. It's all good then. He heard Adira speak lightly and sighed in relief, as if she wasn't the one who was drugged or at the center of all this mess. Casimir and Leon both shot her a look pure bewilderment. Albeit Leon's had a smidge of doubt and Casimir's upset. What? As long as I know Lord Ryona didn't mean to harm me then it's fine. Adira answered and shrugged her shoulders. She had been too nervous thinking how she got on his bad side unknowingly when she's supposed to be gathering their loyalty for when she takes the throne with Casimir. Isn't it a happy thing that the person you trusted in the end didn't really betray you? That's what's important for me. Casimir couldn't say anything anymore if the person involved herself could forgive him this easily. He also couldn't refuse that brilliance in her ash-gray eyes so he could only sigh. He gestured towards Leon to stand up straight and the latter followed immediately. He still couldn't believe he was pardoned as easily as that without any kind of punishment so he was very edgy. Casimir stood up after Leon did and approached him. Thanks for the treat. I wanted to tell you that once I caught you. Casimir whispered. Careful that Adira wouldn't hear him before he drew his arms back and swung it so hard Leon flew all the way back to the wall. That was for drugging her. Stand up, Ryona. And Leon did as he was commanded. 
He can't even dare disobey him when he's icily raging like that. As soon as he wobbly got up to his feet again, another strong punch was driven to his abdomen and made him buckle followed by a severe coughing fit. That's for slandering her. Stand up. Leon once again, his coughing barely stopping, stood up shakily and another huge and fast swing came from the other side and hit him squarely on his face, making him fly off from the left over momentum, each punch faster and stronger than the last as he crashed against furnitures and other decorations. Casimir stalked intimidatingly towards him, his cold and nipping aura oppressing with each step before he was pulled up by his collar. And that's for doubting your future queen that's led you to personally having a hand in harming her. Regardless of whether you were used, consciously or unconsciously. I actually wanted you dead. You should be thankful she didn't want that. Else, you wouldn't even live as far as today. Don't you ever touch her again. Death was dancing in Casimir's platinum eyes as he whispered his words to Leon as softly as he could to avoid Adira from overhearing them. If anything he'd like to spare her from his cruel world. Leon groaned and painfully tried to move his jaw and his limbs, checking for any unknown injuries, besides those which he can see, because that was one hell of a beating. In just three moves, this cruel prince might have shaved a few years off his meager lifespan and reminded him why no one dares to cross him. And mind you, he had a lot of experience with beatings. Adira, who watched Kasumi pummel Leon almost senseless, Felt it was uncalled for but didn't argue nor try to stop him anyway. She figured that she needed to give it to him. He did suffer because of her, after all. Completely off track, she didn't know how he was able to withstand all of her seductions unconsciously or consciously done, but she felt defeated. Hmm. Should I upgrade my seducing skills as well? Leave. Kasumi icily snapped and turned to sit beside Adira again. Leon, who was still trying to assess his overall status, mumbled a, yes, your highness, excuse me, before limply leaving them alone. Kasimi, as soon as he sat down beside Adira, looked at her as she stood up almost immediately and sat further away from him at the opposite couch to be exact. Now, it's your turn, your highness. She started and a fiery rage burned in her smiling ashen eyes. This was the reason she refused William. So she could interrogate Kasumi as well. Although Kasumi was confused with her sudden hostility, he weirdly liked this look as well. She looked like she was roasting him a thousand times with that fervent rage. Now, explain. Explain? Yes. That night, you danced with Iris Latifolia instead of me. Pray tell why. Adira asked and even though she wore a smile, her atmosphere didn't seem light and gentle at all. It was scorching hot. As if his little ball of sunshine literally turned into the sun, the Baron Latifolia was informed of his daughter's rumors and was afraid that it might affect the lady's marriage prospects. He asked me to help fix her daughter's rumors of antagonizing both you and me. I wanted to call you but you were still talking with father and she had already led me to the center. I didn't want to embarrass her as much as I wanted to leave, as my actions might also implicate you. I don't want people to think further that you are a stuck-up and jealous fiancé who bullies nobles lower than your rank. I have an inkling as to who started that rumor and I will eventually capture that person. The thing I am most concerned about now is your reputation. I want people to love and accept you as their future queen because by God I swear, I won't take another woman, who isn't you, as my queen. There can only be you. There is only you, Adira. Damn. I shouldn't have asked him to explain. Did he not feel breathless from talking that much? Did he not feel sick or nauseous at all? Wow. Isn't that the longest ever? Adira breathed a sigh and smiled helplessly. She couldn't help but forgive him when he lays out his heart like that. She couldn't help but mellow out when she sees how much he's been thinking about her and her future with him. She's never been loved as much as this from her past life. So she didn't know what to do or how to respond properly. She was barely winging it. She was receiving too much that she feared that maybe it was all just a dream. That seven-minute thing before dying stretched too long to show her the life she's always wanted. There's nothing you can do about that, Casey. People will always hate what they hate. 
they will hate me for occupying the most envied position in the empire. From now on, more plots, whether as crude as this or something more, will be dished against me. However, as long as you trust me no matter what happens, I swear I won't allow them to snatch this away from me. There is only me who can stand here, the spot next to you. In the end, aren't I barreling towards my destruction end like this? Ah. I hope you know what you're doing Adira. Notes. Thank you so much for the love and support. Those and your words are what fuels me to write more. And your comments are a hell lot of fun to read. Thank you. How to shut her up. I assume you have an idea on who started all this, don't you? Kasimi, who was watching Adira fall into her own thoughts again, asked. The latter looked up to him but didn't really say anything. She knew that Kasimi would believe her and she never doubted that. What she was concerned about was, how does she prove it? I do but I don't know how to prove it. I'm sure that by now that person would have destroyed the evidence. I would do that if it were me. She answered him and casually leaned back on the couch back rest, feeling drained from all the thinking and scheming and emotional turmoil she was experiencing. I need to go see Heiser. I'm going away for a while. She suddenly spoke and bolted up. Kasimi, although confused with the sudden fluctuations in her mood, followed after her and they returned to her temporary room where the growing dragon was lazing about. The moment he heard the clacking of heels approaching and smelled his mother's strawberry scent, he packed up and was already lying in wait in front of the door so that it was him his mother sees first as soon as she opens the door. And indeed he was. Adira doved to have Heiser in her arms and snuggled against him. Even back from her past life, whenever she got tired, stressed or confused, she always ran to Heisa and rode him to the skies to escape the place for a short while. Heisa, take me away. She whispered and her son didn't even hesitate before bolting out the balcony and flying out of the room with Adira still clinging as tightly as she could. Kasimi and Lifer were taken off guard and the former couldn't stop Heiser in time as the dragon took Adira with him and flew high up to the sky. Yet, it doesn't mean he was going to allow even his own son nab his wife and so he dashed out of the room and grabbed whichever horse and followed the dragon barely, visible in the sky. Adira missed the exhilarating feeling of being up in the skies where the wind blows freely and nothing was chaining her down. She let go of Heiser's neck before doing that stunt she used to love that scares the dragon out of his wits and let herself fall back. Heiser was large enough to carry her already so she knew it was going to be fine. More than anyone, aside from her family, it was Kasimi and Heiser who held her complete and unadulterated trust. Although escaping like this might warrant a punishment from the man after, it was great to be out in the skies again. Heiser dove in a heap of panic when his mother fell out from his back. He felt as if a few years was shaved off from his lifespan because of his mother's antics, and roared in a nagging way, when he heard the lively laughter from her. My mother is too mischievous. Heiser, you've still got heat resistance right? Adira asked while hugging Heiser's neck to shut him up from his roaring or also nagging. The dragon only craned his head slightly to gaze at her ashen orbs with his bright sapphire eyes and Adira already could tell his answer. Then, I'm letting go for a bit, okay? I don't know how long I can keep it in check. I haven't used it since I started school. I should be allowed to let go as much as I want today, right? Or else, she might just chow herself. Adira, without waiting for Heiser, sat up straight on his back. It was a lot harder to do so since she was wearing a dress and dresses flap a lot against the wind. Back when she does this exercise from her past life, she always used more comfortable and less obstructing clothes. After finally finding her balance, she released an incinerating heat from within her as she burned so brightly just like the brilliance of the legendary phoenix. The townspeople below abruptly felt the sudden outburst of heat and were sweating profusely. Some were complaining how fickle the weather has gotten and some were passing it off as the summer demon. But today's heat really feels almost searing. I'm already wearing a long-sleeved shirt but I can still feel the heat seeping through them and burning me. Yeah, I'm afraid I might keel over from this heat even. Ah. Water. So thirsty. So hot. Ah. Boy, this heat really drives people crazy. Huh. 
Various effects were evoked from the people and even the lake and all forms of body of water were visibly evaporating too fast. Some of the vegetation were wilting while some had burnt marks. Isn't this heat too abnormal? Yeah, this might probably be the hottest day in all the summer season. While Adira who was letting loose up above them finally felt more relaxed and more clear-headed before snaking her arms around Heise's neck feeling the burning hotness. His scales retained and asked him to land somewhere inconspicuous. Like the forest just a little bit away from the castle. Thank you, baby. Now I know what to do next. She said and placed a quick kiss on Heise's forehead which earned her a happy and soft howl from him. They were spending mother and son quality time when the neighing of the horse and heavy pounding of hooves came closer to their spot. Adira was alert and was quickly on defense mode even if the sound told her it was only one person. One finger on her son and she'll burn this person to a crisp. When the horse and rider finally came into view, she saw a very, very mad Kasumi. The same expression he wore when he flared at Triton back at the camping site. Um, what do you think you were doing? He sounded calm but he didn't look calm. She could even almost hear the rumbling of the brewing blizzard threatening to swallow her whole. I couldn't think well. I needed to escape for a while. I'm sorry. But please don't blame Heisa. I ordered him so please, don't punish or take Heisa away from me. Do you not trust me? I do. I trust you with every bit of my soul. But you went and danced with that iris. I admit I forgive you but I'm still mad. I'm burning with jealousy, okay? Happy now? If I didn't go I might have hurt people. I might have hurt you. And I, she wasn't able to finish before Kasumi shut her up. Literally. You can probably tell how, right? Notes. Thank you my dearies. Thank you for the vote and the comments, to which I still enjoy reading a lot, and your support for our king and queen, Kasumi and Adira. Let's keep this up all right. Banzai. Monitor him. Are you still jealous? Who told you it was okay to kiss me? Adira bashfully dove into his embrace to hide her embarrassment and blushing cheeks, done very poorly might I add. Been wanting to do that for very long. Kasumi confessed and engulfed the lady tightly in his arms. Her petite little form fit so perfectly right inside his embrace. Everything, no matter how messy things may seem right now, seemed perfect, at least that moment felt perfect. After a few minutes of just relaxing inside his arms, which was now one of her refuges, Adira started to lightly hammer her fists in his chest. She could still feel her cheeks burning hot and she couldn't bear to face him like that. Kasumi just chuckled at her being irresistibly adorable and Adira continued to pound him relentlessly. What what's so funny about this? You perverted prince. Lying handsome jerk. Possessive, icy, demonic. Diss me more and you'll see. Kasumi threatened her and she immediately zipped her mouth shut, of course, much to our prince's dismay. He turned solemn and caressed her head lovingly before whispering, It's only you, Adira. Remember that. He reassured her once again and placed a kiss on her head. Oh well, he'll just have to wait till she gets used with kisses. They have all the time, after all, so there's no hurry. Ah. I almost forgot. Casey, I want Leon on my security detail. She spoke and it was Casimir's turn to be shocked and stopped. What the hell is this woman thinking? He thought and immediately a frown covered his face. He cannot allow this request. Ever. Not just long ago, the man harmed her and now she wants him as a bodyguard. Wait. Hear me out first. I need him close to me so I can monitor him. Haven't you heard of a phrase keep your friends close and your enemies closer? So I need to know what he does, who he talks to, and where he goes. You'll allow me that, right? You'll give me one of your aides, right? Choose someone else. Please Cassie Tilda. No. Cassie Tilda. Please Tilda. No. Your Highness. My King. Kasumi stopped and turned to her, desperately trying to stop himself from agreeing to her unreasonable request even if she bats her eyes adorably like that or even if she looks up to him with cute upturned eyes almost like a whiny cat. He must stand tall. He must stand his ground. You even stole a kiss from me. Okay. 
Adira beamed and cheered jocosely upon hearing Kasumi's answer and danced a little happy dance. Damn this woman. But I'll also give Alexander to you. Alexander? Why not William? I'm well acquainted with him and he seems very trustworthy. She asked with a confused tilt of her head. However, Kasumi kept his lips sealed. Yes, William was trustworthy and will definitely keep Adira safe but he's a threat in another sense. Okay. If you want to give this Alexander person, then it's your call. Adira chose to compromise with a panicked look upon seeing Kasumi's expression gradually turning wintry. She was afraid he might retract his earlier compromise. She really needs to get Leon's trust and loyalty so she'll have someone who keeps tabs on Iris' moves. Cause, she's as sure as hell it was Iris' scheme this time again. Really, you just refuse to give up, huh? Ah. And another thing. At Adira's sudden addition, Kasumi steeled himself and braced for another unreasonable request from her when what came out of her mouth stunned him for a good few seconds. Will you also give me the future king? She added with a wink and merrily went back to the direction of the castle and left the stunned Kasumi. Heisa following after her and snickering at his stunned father as if saying, You amateur. Mother's more effective than you. She was blatantly and shamelessly flirting back with him from now on, deciding that she might need to upgrade her seduction skills as well. My lady, Leon and Alexander reports for their duty. His Highness has assigned us on your security detail. Although, Leon was still skeptical about Adira's purpose, cause he knows Kasumi wasn't as stupid as placing someone like him who once harmed his fiancé as her. Knight for putting him in his new post but he liked to think that it was a chance to redeem himself. Hello. Good morning. I made some cookies with Lifa, please take one. She beamed brilliantly as soon as she heard Leon speak and saw them kneeling by her side. The both of them turned to look at each other Alexander and the rest were not informed of Leon's offense against Adira and Kasumi so, to them, nothing really changed. They were asking themselves wordlessly if they should or should not. Please? I'd like to take some for his highness but I'm not too sure if I did okay on this batch. She said and smiled sheepishly while wiping her white hands from the powder of the dough on her blue apron. This lady isn't your typical lady at all. Which lady, a duke's daughter even, would dirty their hands like this and wear a blue apron? Weren't they supposed to like pink? The lady doesn't like pink, huh? Alexander spoke and answered his lady's request and partook in the cookies she baked. And he must say, she did a very good job. It was exquisitely delicious. Oh. Yes. I particularly hate pink. Too girly for my tastes. She smiled. Leon, who watched Alex enjoying the cookies, also took one and reluctantly ate it. Well, she was a good chef. She made such delicious cookies and was even worried with it. She would even shame the pastry shops in the capital with these cookies she made. It's very delicious, my lady. Leon managed to voice out his thoughts before he lost his focus with the ambrosial taste of the cookies. Don't worry. His Highness will like it without doubt, my lady. You've basically kept a tight leash on that guy. No matter what, he'll always agree to you. Alexander added and took a few more, subtly glancing at Adira for permission while Leon was already addicted with the cookies and was practically begging for more. He can't help it. Adira does make addictive snacks and sweets. And no, they don't contain those harmful substances. Adira smiled and handed everything for them to finish. Since she was very confident with her pastry, she already set some aside for Heisa and Kasumi of course. Not that those two ever complained on anything she made. Heck, she could serve them burnt cupcakes or whatnot and they will still happily eat all of it. She only said those things so they would feel compelled to taste and eat the cookies she specifically made for them. Lifa was aware of this but didn't say anything with her mistress' blatant lie. After all, it wasn't the first time she did this lying so naturally in their faces. Lifer watched the men take their time savoring the snacks her mistress made for them and then thought, is she bribing them through their stomach to be loyal to her? Wow. My lady, you really are something, huh? Lifer thought and turned an incredulous look towards Adira, who also watched the men stuff their cheeks with the snacks, 
as the smile on her face twitched. Adira, who noticed her do this, smiled mischievously with a wink that told her, the best way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? I'll be taking your pawn for myself, Iris. Alexander Vorai. Adira's days, more or less, were still her same old routine. She had already returned back to the Silver Fief with her parents and got frequent visits from Kasimi. Alexander and Leon accompanied her back to the Silverus castle and stayed under the first prince's orders, sanctioned by the king himself. Well, that's one supportive father he's got there. Alexander thought while accompanying Adira around the garden. She was walking aimlessly through the maze, or so he thought, but they actually came out on another exit hidden perfectly well that if one didn't know about it, they'd likely just pass by it. However, Adira purposely led him and allowed him to have knowledge on this secret. My lady, there was an exit here. Yes, it's my secret. Now I have a question for you, Alex. Of course, Adira, being as friendly, beautiful and adorable that she is, immediately got Alexander's loyalty and was already on first name basis. There's not much surprise there, actually. Well, no one really escapes, you know. Yes. What is it, my lady? Between you and his highness, who's stronger? She asked while whisking the curtain made of vines to allow passage and exited the maze, Alexander following suit. Of course, it is the crown prince, my lady. Then, after him, who's strongest? That would be Roman, Lady Adira. Oh? That secretary's actually strong. Yet, he's so weak-hearted. Then after Roman. Well, it's still a contest between me and William. Perfect then. Adira suddenly beamed and they finally exited the short tunnel as it opened into a large training area. You'll be sparring with me. Two hours into their training, it was total annihilation. On Adira's part, there was finally someone stronger than her and he was the third strongest after Kasimi. Adira had changed into boys' clothes and Alexander looked at her very awkwardly. Not because it didn't suit her, but precisely because it suited her so damn well he was actually tempted to question her about her real gender orientation. Lady Adira, take a break first. He kindly offered to her when she saw her breathing heavily and supported her upper body with her knees. She raised her hands up and gestured that she was fine. After she finally catched her breath and chugged a whole bottle of water, she raggedly spoke. Let's go again. Alexander, who couldn't refuse, took his stance and waited for her to lunge forward and attack him. All the while, he had only been defending against her attacks and deflecting some when he's able. But there were also times that he felt an odd sensation as if a humongous pitch black monster was lying in wait, watching, studying and calculating his every move with its big ash-like eyes that could burn him any minute. It was those times that he unwittingly counterattacked and threw his lady over his shoulder or push her with more strength than necessary or even almost breaking her arm. As he twisted it towards her back, he felt his heart rapidly beat as beads of sweat rolled down from his temples. While he was waiting, Adira was simulating lots of combinations she could use and soft spots she could exploit. She also took into account Alexander's subtle habits like he always, without fail starts a kick with his right foot. However that was all it was, simulations. All that's left now is how to smoothly perform those simulations and at least get a hit in. She lunged forward and Alexander braced himself for Adira's opening move a big swing from the left. But she didn't, instead she ducked to his right and swung her foot in an attempt to sweep him off. Alexander, reacted fast enough and leapt to avoid her and jumped away to place distance between them but Adira chased him. She sent punches after punches, kicks after kicks but every single one of them was blocked by Alexander. When she caught his head and was about to drive her knee to his face, Alexander immediately placed a defense up but nothing came when she fluidly climbed up on his shoulders wrapping her legs around his neck, pulled his head back to expose his throat and was about to place a claw on it. Alexander, greatly alarmed at her fast growth rate and how she picked things up too fast, caught her hand and wasn't able to think properly when he pulled her down too hard and threw her off. 
Adira landed on the ground too painfully that the impact took her breath away and she coughed as she groaned. Dear Lord, I am so sorry, my lady. I didn't mean to harshly pull you like that. Oh, the Lord of Darkness will surely swallow me whole. He sputtered in a ball of panic while hurriedly helping Adira up and was about to rush her back to the castle when she hit his chest to attract his attention. I'm fine, she managed to say in between her coughs. But my lady, send me back and his highness will know. And if he knows, you will surely lose your neck. Do you want that? She tried scaring him. I know my lady, but I also cannot ignore the injury I caused on you. I'd rather die than let you suffer. Oh dear, another loyal idiot indeed. I like that but not now really. I'm trying to save you so please. Cooperate. No. I'm really fine. Now let me down. That is an order. She commanded him and used as much dominance as she had in her and successfully made him obey finally gently letting her down and made sure she was stable on her feet. Wow. I didn't know I was intimidating enough. Alex, I really appreciate that you care about me and are loyal to me, but what I need is proper training. Although I can pick random stuffs from some of your movements, it's not enough. Show me more. Train me more. Okay. But my lady, what for do you need to learn how to fight? His highness will protect you. You need not fear for your safety. And who protects him? What? I'm asking you. If his highness protects me then, who will protect him? Who protects the strongest? I am not risking my life, by willingly walking down towards my destruction path, just so he'll protect me. Women also has things she has to protect, and I am most certainly not hiding behind him. I will fight alongside him. I won't leave him alone, be it heaven or hell. Determination shone in her brilliant ashen eyes, burning with her unwavering resolve and glowing with her confidence in Casimir that he will do the same with her, and Alexander couldn't look away. He saw how he was reflected so clearly in her beautiful ash-like orbs and felt himself get stuck in them. They were burning and shining so radiantly with the brilliance of a phoenix's fire it was as if they contained countless galaxies of stars. He knelt down and lowered his head as well as holding a fist over his chest as he pledged. I, Alexander Vorai, only heir of the Marquis Vorai, pledge my undying loyalty to the Lady Adira Ramiria Ear Silveris, future queen of the Vasilis Empire. I will do my utmost best to help you reach your goal, mistress. I will impart to you every knowledge, technique, skills, or whatever I have to you. I am at your disposal from now on, my queen. Um. Casey, I think I just poached one of your trusted aides' unblemished loyalty. He just asterisk climbed over my wall. That's okay, right? Notes. Asterisk climb over the wall means changing sides. LOL. I am very sorry for these weird phrases I pick from the Chinese novels that I read. Thank you for your support and love everyone. I'll update as much as I can so stay tuned. Banzai? Just a tour guide.